Right, well, hello everybody. Thank you all for your questions, and thank you to those of you who gave suggestions on what I can do with the channel. I will uh, consider that and see if I can enact some of those ideas. But the questions, um, I should say, by the way, it's about nine o'clock in the morning here, and I did not sleep last night at all. Uh, just couldn't get to sleep. Usually I wouldn't be up at nine o'clock in the morning, but you know, I was, I was in bed, I went to bed, laying in bed, couldn't get to sleep, and I just thought, screw this, I'm gonna get up, I'll record the video, and then see if I can sleep afterwards. Also, it's really cold uh, in here. I'm tr trying to save money on the heating, uh, but uh, I don't know, I might, I might just choose comfort now over financial security later, because it's freezing. Anyway, um, let's go through the questions. So, um, we begin with 9.6 times 4.376. What is the role of philosophy under a stance empiricist framework? If philosophical questions should be investigated scientifically, what makes philosophy different from science? Well, I think that stance empiricism, at least as I understand it, is not committed to any particular claim about the role of philosophy. Um, so certainly I don't think that stance empiricism uh, is the view that philosophical questions should be investigated scientifically. Um, you know, so, so okay, uh, like what, what, what is the empiricist stance? What does it amount to? Well, I take it that the empiricist stance involves, first of all, a commitment to the idea that the, the process of empirical science is seen as a kind of paradigm of rational Query, right now, that doesn't mean that every question is a scientific question. That philosophic, that like all philosophy has to be investigated scientifically or anything like that. All it, you know, what it, what it means is like, um, you know, we we look at like the way that science works, the process of science, and um, like that's our kind of exemplar, right, of what it is to engage in like rational thinking. Um, I mean, there's different ways of like outlining the details on this. I'm being vague because the whole point of stance empiricism is to you know accommodate lots of different specific views. But you know, hopefully that sort of like you can you can take something as like an exemplar while still thinking that there are still other things in that domain. You know, I mean, I might think of like an apple as an exemplar fruit, but there are other fruits, right? So. Um, yeah, so, you know, f first of all, the empiricist stance is, stance empiricism sort of takes science as, in some sense, as being an exemplar, right? Um, secondly, it's going to allow, at least in principle, disagreement on any uh, empirical or factual hypothesis. So when we look at science and we take it as an exemplar, we focus specifically on the process of science, the way that science um, kind of takes hypotheses subjects them to empirical testing and so in principle you know you're you, you always might end up giving up a hypothesis right any scientific hypothesis could be given up um you don't hold anything dogmatically you, fi you you figure out a way of making it testable so that you can you know draw predictions make observations and then maybe give up the hypothesis of course some hypotheses are very 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 well established um you know it's maybe kind of hard to think about how they might be given up but in principle like that's always going to be possible um, and then crucially uh, so I guess this is where sort of more substantive philosophy comes in the empiricist stance involves a rejection of what we might call explanation by postulation uh, so explanation by postulation occurs when philosophers try to explain a particular discourse or a particular practice by postulating entities beyond experience of which that discourse provides true descriptions okay so you know like moral realists for example will look at moral discourse our practice of making moral judgments our practices of like praise and blame and you know <clears throat> claims about what people ought and ought not to do and so on and they will view that as like i mean ultimately like what what grounds that practice what justifies it is that um we at least can in principle make true claims of the realm of moral facts um, and so that leaves sort of 
I mean, it, if you're if you're taking this kind of framework, that's going to leave actually quite a lot of things for philosophers to do um, that aren't just going to reduce to science. So first of all, um, you're going to want to say something about what exactly is wrong with explanation by postulation, and that's not obviously going to just be a scientific argument. In the case of moral realism, if I ask what's wrong with postulating moral properties or what's wrong with interpreting moral moral discourse as providing true descriptions of moral properties, well, you know, science may be relevant to that, but um, you're not going to get an answer from that to that just from science itself. Um, the other thing that uh, Stantz empiricists will want to do is provide an alternative account of the discourse. Uh, so we want to show how the discourse can be understood without uh, engaging in explanation by postulation. And there are lots of different options here. So again, to take morality as an example, you might be like an abolitionist error theorist who just says, you know, all moral claims are false and we should just do away with moral discourse, right? Like uh, moral claims are analogous to claims about witches or phlogiston, right? We just no longer talk about witches and phlogiston. Uh, so we've just removed witch discourse from at least everyday life, right? So we should do the same with morality. That's that's a pretty extreme claim. There are lots of other positions available. You know, some people might be fictionalists. So yeah, moral claims are all false, but uh, they still have a lot of utility. So we should treat them as useful fictions. Or you might be a non-cognitivist. You might think that actually moral claims should be interpreted as expressing uh, non-cognitive attitudes rather than beliefs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now that again, that alternative account, science may be relevant to that. Um, one of the reasons why it might be relevant is that if we're trying to give an account of, di of, the, of a discourse, we need to think about the meanings of the discourse. And meaning is uh, the a subject matter for linguistics, which is, you know, kind of science. So, you know, science is relevant, but it's not like, again, you know, this, uh, this kind of goes beyond what science can tell you. Science can't tell you whether you ought to, like, what if we agree that, like, uh, let's say there are no non-natural moral properties. Well, science can't tell you whether you ought to, you know, reinterpret moral discourse so that moral concepts refer to natural properties or whether we like ought to take moral claims as being just false or whether we ought to, uh, you know, what it's like, how ought we to respond, um, you know, to the facts? Science isn't going to tell you that. Um, and so that's where <clears throat> philosophy can come in. Um, so I think that stance empiricism is just not committed to the claim that philosophical questions um, like just reduce to, to science or anything like that. And yeah, I mean, science is going to be relevant, but there's there's more to it. Um, OK, so ah says uh, Senpai, why don't you notice me? I don't know if that's a meme or whatever. If you've trying to be if you have a been attempting to get in contact with me. I apologise. I do try to respond to emails and so on, but I'm not. I'm not actually the best at that, to be honest. So, uh, sorry. Maybe just try sending another email. Ah! Ghosts um, says many people personally find a world without mind independent value devastating. For me, I probably feel this way the most when I think about how in such a world there would be no reason, regardless of what my wants are, to help others rather than torture them. My question is this, how rational, or at least understandable if at all, do you find such feelings of devastation in reaction to moral anti-realism? What would you say to people who have such a reaction? Yeah, I don't really understand this. I've never seen realism as being in, even intuitively appealing. Um, so maybe, uh, you know, uh, maybe, maybe an analogy would help to uh, express the way that I see this, right? So consider questions about like the meaning of life or the purpose of life. Some people might ask themselves, you know, what is my purpose? What am I here for? And some people will <coughs> uh, postulate the existence of a God. Um, and if you have a God, then you can say, well, God specifies what our purpose is. You know, God has a plan for us. Um, and so if you're a theist, then it's like, hey, I have I have some you know really robust substantive sense in which my life has a purpose. It has a plan. It has a meaning. Right. And if you're not a theist, 
you're not going to be able to like have that purpose or meaning. You know, you, you will be without direction. Your life will be meaningless. Um, but, you know, I think that uh, I think there's a kind of bad faith here. Right. Bad faith in the sort of existentialist sense, because even if you postulate a God, uh, you are still free uh, to follow or reject whatever God's plan or God's purpose for you is. Um, you still have to make a choice. Now, of course, this is maybe a little bit like it's not necessarily that obvious, actually, because in some religions, the choice is kind of coerced. Uh, it's like you either follow God's plan or you go to hell. Um, so, you know, put aside those sorts of views, right? Suppose that, you know, there's like a loving, om omnipotent, omniscient creator, but there's no heaven or hell, there's no reward or punishment in the afterlife. Everybody just goes to the same place, or maybe there is no place, but, uh, you know, whatever. The point is, is like everybody's going to get the same. So there's no, there's no reward or punishment, but um, there's still this, you know, loving, omnipotent, omniscient creator who has a plan for us, who has a purpose. So now the question is, do we accept that purpose? Do we accept that plan? And um, the point is that's up to us, right? It's always up to us. The choice remains on our shoulders. Um, and in fact, what's actually going on when people talk about God as providing a purpose for their life, what's actually going on in my view is that religious people are kind of objectifying their own sense of purpose, right? Like they, they have a subjective personal sense of purpose or meaning and they're kind of projecting it out into the world they're projecting it onto this external entity in order to sort of relieve themselves of responsibility for it uh, they are relieving themselves of the responsibility for setting the direction of their own life or at least that's what they're trying to do um, you know they they are putting themselves in a picture of the world where their purpose is set by an external force not by themselves but that's bad faith um, I think <laughs> Maybe I'm not using the term bad faith there correctly because I don't really understand existentialism. But, you know, I think that that's kind of what the existentialists were getting at, um, because you're always free to choose your own purpose and you cannot transfer the responsibility to someone else. Now, the point of all of this is I think the same kind of thing is going on with moral realists. They are objectifying their own stances. They are objectifying their own personal values, projecting those values out in the world to relieve themselves of responsibility. Um, but you can't do that. It's always going to be up to you. you. You make a commitment to a particular stance. The facts cannot compel you to adopt any particular stance. Um, honestly, I see moral realism as a, 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 a small myopic view of humanity's place in the world and our relation to others. I don't think moral anti-realism is devastating at all. Um, I think that it's <laughs> like, I think it's, it's, it's a very sort of affirming view. Um, if moral realism were true it would make make no difference to anything um, and certainly we can't you know transfer the responsibility of our like commitments to particular stances onto the external world um, it is it is always on our shoulders um, and the it, it seems to me that moral realists are engaging in a kind of bad faith um, in doing that so <clears throat> I I mean, I present this not as not exactly as an argument against moral realism, but perhaps as a different perspective, which maybe um, maybe gives us some reason to think that actually anti-realism is um, something to be happy about. Uh, it's like a conclusion that is is not just the right conclusion, but is actually a, a good conclusion. Uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe that was all a load of bollocks, but that's that's my reaction to that. Um, a C. Do you have any knowledge in philosophy of statistics or anything related to that discipline? Uh, not really. Uh, and if so, what kind of interpretation of do you, do you have of probability? Um, well, I just so with probability, I have thought about this a little bit. I don't, as I say, know much about philosophy of statistics, but I have encountered in different interpretations of probability. It seems to me that um, that there's a whole load of so many of the different interpretations seem to me to be perfectly legitimate right like so if we're talking about degrees of belief well people do have degrees of belief I mean there are like clearly I mean I can have different degrees of belief in propositions and then I can you know think about how to have 
right, how to think through those degrees of belief, how to assign them consistently, how to update them and so on. That's fine. And then there's also, you know, facts of the matter about um, possibility spaces. Like if I have a die, you know, six sides on the die, six places it can fall. Um, there's facts of the matter about like uh, relative frequencies. That's all fine. Th then the question is just, I suppose, one of conceptual analysis. What do we mean when we say probability? Um, I don't see why that's a particularly important question. Uh, the term can be used in lots of different ways. Now, I should say there are some interpretations of probability that seem very problematic to me. I mean, objective propensity accounts um, involve, uh, I guess, sort of metaphysical commitments that I have problems with. Um, but I don't think that I would sort of endorse any particular interpretation of probability as like the correct account of the meaning of the term probability. I think the term probability um, can be precisified in lots of different ways and these many of these different ways are perfectly legitimate. Although I suppose that like most of the time when we talk about like if we're assigning <laughs> yeah I mean I suppose most of in most contexts where people talk about probability I would probably interpret it as in, in terms of like subjective degrees of belief. Um, but you know I, I don't know I mean again like there's it, there's clearly facts of the matter about the frequencies of certain outcomes. So, you know, yeah. Um, uh, do you see yourself getting married in the future or is marriage completely out of the question? Uh, <laughs> let's not get ahead of ourselves here. I haven't even managed to get a date, right? I mean, dude, I'm like, I, 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 th I don't even know why we would be considering this question. I mean, I have gotten, I got nothing, right? So, Anyway, I don't really care. I'm, I have no opinion on, on marriage, um, really. Perhaps take this as asking about the philosophy of marriage or just see it in a philosophical light. Yeah, I, I don't know, man. I, I don't have a woman. I'm not really sure. AC, I suppose, is not clear. But I don't know. I don't have any thoughts on marriage. I don't care about it. It's, it's not something I ever think about. Um, Ale Mag, did you consider studying something else before studying philosophy? And if so, why did you end up choosing philosophy? This is hard because I don't really remember my own past very well. Um, I think that I never considered anything else. I think, I know that I came to philosophy kind of late. I didn't really know what to do when, when it came time to decide what to do at university. Uh, I wasn't really sure, right? So like I, I, I did, you know, the school, and then I, I did A-levels, and then I had to choose what to do when I was continuing my education. I, I wasn't, I didn't have like a really deep love of philosophy early in life, but I did sometimes think about philosophy. I did encounter philosophy. Um, and I suppose that, I suppose I, I mean, I must have had some interest in political philosophy because I know that I, when I was like 14 to 16, um, I was a libertarian in the sort of US sense. But I was probably like an anarcho-capitalist. Um, so I definitely had an interest in philosophy, in, in political philosophy at the time. I, I know as well at that age, I remember I, I used to think about questions about like the mind and stuff. So I did have an interest, but it wasn't like a really deep obsession. Um, it wasn't as though I, I felt really committed to, um, to doing philosophy. Uh, I think it was just, I couldn't think of anything else that I particularly wanted to do. Um, it was more just a process of elimination. Like, okay, philosophy seems like it's, you know, of, of all the options, okay, I've got good reasons not to do the other ones that I can think of. Um, and I, I can't think of a good reason not to do philosophy, so I'll do that. And of course I ended up falling in love with it. So, um, so yeah, I, I didn't really consider studying something else. Um, and I ended up choosing it because yeah, I've thought through options and I, I think I just couldn't think of a reason not to do it. Um, Alex Parks, is a philosophy degree worth it? Well, it's worth it if you want to do philosophy, if you love philosophy for its own sake, if philosophy just brings you joy or satisfaction, or maybe it doesn't bring you joy and satisfaction, maybe it's just not as shit as everything else. If you feel that way, then why the hell not? Why not do it? Well, 
One reason not to do it is maybe because you might be thinking in the long term about your careers, career options. I mean, philosophy may not be the best for that. Um, I don't know, man. I can't really answer this question because I, I can't weigh up those choices for other people. I can't really even tell you what the, um, you know, what the risks and, and benefits are exactly. Like, I, I, I don't know. It probably depends very much on your particular circumstances and the sort of country that you're living in and the options available and all of that. You know, there isn't a, a way of giving a general answer to this. But I think that it's probably worth uh, structuring one's life in such a way that, you know, you're doing things that you like. So if you like philosophy, then why not do it? Uh, OK. Um, Aniket Sharma asks, what are your views, if any, on logic? Do you think that it one can or two should be pursued in depth for its intrinsic merit? Um, or instead, you'd argue that it's merely a tool for philosophers to defend slash propagate slash strengthen their respective philosophical stance. Um, it is, it's it's good to pursue for its own sake. Um, but you continue. I'm currently an undergraduate in philosophy, and I want to pursue logic for my masters and hopefully a PhD sometimes in the future. But I often find that undergrads are dissuaded from pursuing pure logic and advised to study it in tandem to something else. I'm anxious and overwhelmed regarding the right choice, right course of action here, and also the sheer complexity of the literature on logic. And I'm reaching out to you seeking guidance. Well, I think I'm not really the person to tell you about this. I can't give people guidance in these sorts of things. Um, I just am not in a position to do that. Um, so I'm sorry, but I really can't say. I mean, if you have been told, uh, if you have been advised by people that pursuing pure logic is for one reason or another a bad idea and you should do it in tandem with something else, I would take that quite seriously. I mean, I imagine that whoever's telling you that, I don't know where who is telling you that, right? But if it's like, lecturers are telling you that you probably want to listen to them they probably know a bit more about you know what would what you would need in order to pursue a phd um or a master's um i mean i don't really know like look i mean logic is is its own field right i can't see why there would necessarily be a problem with somebody just studying logic but again i i just don't i don't know i i think that you know, you, you want to ask people who are like more active in, in the field and in your particular uh, country. Um, so I'm afraid I'm going to have to move on without really giving any helpful advice. I apologize about that. Um, Antoine Karnak, do you think there is any relevant difference between the methods of mathematics and philosophy? The idea being that these two subjects both derive knowledge only using reasoning, yet this knowledge is Yet the knowledge gained from mathematics seems to be very different from the knowledge gained in philosophy. Um, it seems, uh, well, first of all, I, I'm, I think I would dispute that uh, philosophy derives knowledge only using reasoning. I mean, I think philosophers can totally appeal to um, like empirical uh, data of one sort or another. Um, indeed, you know, I mean, so I, I suppose it depends on what sort of account we give of things like introspection and intuition and so on. Um, it's not entirely obvious that those shouldn't count as in some sense experiential um but anyway uh, like even even if we think okay right philosophy just derives knowledge using reasoning right even if we accept that um there's like lots of different kinds of reasoning i mean so in the case of mathematics i guess what we're doing is like working out the consequences of certain axiomatic systems whereas in philosophy I mean, maybe we're doing that in some sense, right? But we're also, you know, we're using things like conceptual analysis and thought experiments. Um, and we're appealing to uh, intuitions about the applications of concepts. And we're, you know, we're maybe engaging in like engineering of concepts. So, um, you know, when we think about a term like knowledge, right? Well, that word is used in all sorts of different ways in everyday speech, right? There's loads of different situations in which somebody might claim to know something. One of the things we want to do in philosophy is, okay, what are these different ways? And maybe it turns out that that term is, like many natural language terms, going to be used in sort of vague and messy and incoherent ways. So philosophers are going to try to 
either like get at the like underlying conceptual facts um, or they're just going to try to like precisify the concept you know maybe come up with um, definitions or concepts of knowledge that are more applicable in specific situations you know there's so this this is just i mean maybe this is just reasoning i don't know it, it seems like we're not just reasoning you know we're also concerned about certain empirical facts um but it looks like there are yeah just lots of differences between the methods of mathematics and philosophy um it just depends on like how abstractly you want to describe those methods you know if you just use a, a term like reasoning in fact i mean reasoning i mean they use reasoning in the sciences as well. I mean, everything involves reasoning. So uh, at least every area of inquiry involves reasoning. So do we just say, well, you know, like they have the same method. Every area of inquiry has the same method. Maybe in some really, really abstract sense. Um, okay. ARD51306. I would like to understand your thoughts on Jungian psychology and folks like Jordan Peterson. I'm not a psychologist. I have no thoughts on Jungian psychology. As for Peterson, um, I'm not really a fan of Jordan Peterson. Well, I, I mean, that's actually understating it. I'm simply not, I don't particularly like Peterson. Um, at the same time, I, <laughs> yeah, I don't really find Peterson like interesting enough as a topic to bother engaging in a debate about it with Peterson fans and I I mean I say that just to like I've been asked about Peterson in Ask Me Anything before um, this has come up before like more than once people frequently ask me about Peterson actually and I give my feelings about it you know um, and and then there's always somebody in the comments who's like well you know actually blah, blah, blah. and there's you know paragraphs in response to every line I say and it's like uh, I mean, seriously, like, I just, I think, I don't, nah, I'm not really keen on Peterson, but I don't really give a shit about him, so I'm not going to uh, talk about it in any real detail. But look, um, the reason why is Peterson may well have, you know, a lot of expertise in his own field. He may be a good psychologist. I don't think he has a very good grasp of the other th fields that he talks about, and he seems to talk about them very regularly, including philosophy. I don't think he has a very good understanding of the philosophy that he talks about. You know, he makes a lot of very um, sort of very confident claims and, and often quite controversial claims about fields that he doesn't have any expertise in, which is fine. You know, it's fine for people to <coughs> you know move beyond their own um, academic fields. There's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but it's just he screws it up a lot. You know, I know that he screws up philosophy. I'm pretty sure he screws up the history and economics and biology and so on. I mean, sometimes he, he seems to endorse some just really like absurd views, you know, the, the climate denial, the the meat diet, uh, you know. Um, I suppose actually, so just to give a, a bit more, like with, with respect to philosophy, I mean, it's, I, I don't know if I necessarily would even say that his views are incorrect. It's more like, I mean, there's nothing, actually, there's nothing wrong with holding incorrect views. There's loads of philosophers who hold views that are incorrect, but I think he doesn't, he seems to have a lot of misunderstandings. Um, and um, so that's that's one thing. And then the second thing is that with respect to philosophy, when you try to pin him down on philosophical claims, um, claims like, say, the existence of God, for instance, he seems to very often disguise his views with a lot of just pretentious and obscurantist language, um, which... For somebody like me who's, you know, in the analytic tradition, that's kind of a cardinal sin, you know, <laughs> that's that's just a really bad way of doing uh, doing philosophy. Uh, I I think like clarity of speech is important. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not sure, like maybe his actual position on God is a, a very sort of standard one. Like maybe he's he seems to, he seems to be attracted to you know christianity in some traditional sense but you know again like actually trying to get at well what do you mean by god what do you mean by truth etc it's just a you know labyrinth and so that's kind of annoying um and look i mean you know uh other stuff i'd like if people claim that his life advice stuff is useful then then yeah that's that's great good i mean then he's had a good impact but um i'm just not really interested in that um 
And I also wonder, like, is he really the best source for that kind of stuff? Because he seems like a total fuck up as a person. <laughs> like, he seems to have written these like books about like you know how to live your life. I mean, I don't know, man. I wouldn't be taking advice from him. But uh, yeah, that's yeah. Uh, so okay, this has been a bit of a ramble, but hopefully that's communicated something about why I'm not that keen on Peterson. But I don't. Like, dude, I don't fucking care if you if if other people like Peterson, fine, um, good. I'm not I'm not really interested in like getting into a debate about it. Um, Arka McHoty, um asks, why do philosophy of language courses put greater emphasis on the meaning of singular terms instead of common names slash predicates? I'm not actually sure how to answer this because I I'm not sure that philosophy of language courses do that. I mean, like, so n names and predicates seem to be kind of like quite important. I, I, I'm just not sure that. I, mean, I suppose it depends on the course, right? You might have to, <laughs> you might have to ask the person delivering the particular course. Um, and so, so I'm just not sure. Um, I'm not sure about that. Can linguistic thoughts, the ones expressed by utterances, be had non-linguistically? I think that. So I don't see why there would be a problem with this, but it's because I think, you know, most, so most linguistic thoughts are already just interpretations of, or, or like expressions of non-linguistic phenomena, right? So, um, you know, uh, 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 pretty much any description of anything that we give of, you know, of, of any description of anything in the world, right? Um, regardless of whether it's a mental phenomenon or not, is going to be a, it's going to sort of involve applying language to something that is non-linguistic. When I say the table is flat, well, I mean that. First of all, the table like isn't itself linguistic, right? Flatness isn't itself linguistic, um, and in saying the table is flat, that doesn't exactly capture the nature of the object that I see before me. Um, but you know, uh, presumably it, it sort of captures it well enough, right? I mean, unless we're going to endorse. Like, unless I think that you know this is all just a hallucination or something, unless unless we go in for that kind of radical skepticism, it looks like there are situations where you know we can state things about non-linguistic objects and uh, express truths about them. So you know, in the in the same way, I don't see why, like, you could. So why shouldn't you similarly have a non-linguistic mental phenomenon that you express linguistically? Um, okay, like, uh, what does a dog believe? Well, there's a way of expressing that linguistically. Um, like I can say that the dog believes that there is a cat in the tree, and you know this is a, this is an idealization. It doesn't capture exactly what's going on in the dog's head. Uh, obviously, the dog is not going to have the concept like cat. At least, certainly not. It's not going to be identical to my concept cat. It's not entirely obvious what is going on in the dog's head, but presumably it's non-linguistic because a dog doesn't have language and language makes a huge difference but we still take that um, to be a true description or at least true enough description of what's happening in the dog's head um, and I think you know yeah again you know this is going to be the case for pretty much any description of anything in the world right we uh, we're constantly confronted with non-linguistic phenomena that we describe linguistically um, so can linguistic thoughts be had non-linguistically uh, in in a sense, actually, I suppose the answer has to be trivially no, because a linguistic thought is linguistic. Uh, but what it is that is expressed by the linguistic utterance, or what it is that the linguistic utterance is trying to capture, or what it is that li the linguistic utterance corresponds to, um, yeah, I think that that, that can be had non-linguistically. Hopefully that made some sense. Uh, Arkady Petrosian, what are your thoughts about suicide? Is it rational? Is it morally acceptable? In which cases it is and it isn't. Um, yeah, I mean, I think if you want to stop living, then <laughs> then it's it's rational. I mean, I think that rationality, I don't really see, so like, in the case of rationality, it's just a matter of, you know, how best to achieve your goals. So if somebody has the goal of, uh, ceasing to exist, then suicide is a perfectly rational way of achieving that. Um, it's, it's like the, the simplest way of achieving that. Um, so uh, yeah, um, rational, 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 yeah. Uh, is it morally acceptable? Well, I, 
I don't think you morally owe anyone else your existence except those that are like there are going to be people that are dependent on you like if you have children so if you have you know a three-year-old child in the house and then you just commit suicide I would I'd have a problem with that because uh well then the, the, like nobody's looking after the kid who knows the kid might just die right like it's kind of neglectful to the kid but um I, I think that your obligations are much more limited than I suppose most people would. Because I suppose what a lot of people will say is that, you know, if, if I'm, well, like, like me, for instance, right? I don't have any kids. Nobody is, like, depending on me for their, exist for their like, continued life or safety or anything like that. Um, you know, I'm just a sort of relatively normal adult. But there are still people who, like, know and love me. And I think what a lot of people will say is that it's morally wrong to... Uh, to commit suicide. It would be morally wrong for me to commit suicide because of the effect it would have on like my brother and my dad and so on. I don't agree with that. Um, I don't think I, I owe them my existence. Uh, I don't think there's anybody actually that I, to whom I owe my existence. Um, so yeah, I, there are some circumstances where I, I would have a moral problem with it. But generally speaking, a lot of people, uh, in, in a lot of cases, I, I wouldn't see it as being morally wrong um so I, I suppose that's my my view on that armin razuli what do you think of i don't know how to pronounce this guy's name emil Cioran. i have no idea um what do you think of his view on su suicide um well I, I watched the video and uh his view seemed to be so just so if anybody else is watching this, just so you're aware, it was a link to a video and he expressed the view that suicide, the possibility of suicide was what allowed him to keep on living because it gave him, you know, the fact that he had the freedom, like a way out is what uh, allowed him to keep on living. Um, yeah, I mean, I, for me, it's just, that's just not an option. I, I don't see suicide as a viable alternative. So it doesn't give me any sense of freedom because the idea of committing suicide is just no that is not acceptable to me uh, i do not want to stop existing i i want to exist forever um i'm i'm deeply overwhelmingly uh, terrified of death so um that's that's going to be a no from me uh, but you know good for him it's nice that uh, the possibility of suicide brings comfort to some people um unfortunately it doesn't bring any comfort to me <clears throat> and what do you think were the effects or interconnections of nihilism in the prevalence of totalitarianism? I, I have no idea, um, none whatsoever. I've literally never uh, had, I, I've, I've never thought about that topic at all. Um, I would be surprised if there were any significant connections, to be honest, only because like, I can't, I don't know how you sort of, like, totalitarianism you know, like how are you sort of setting setting that up? It seems like you, it would be very difficult to kind of like either justify that from an, I mean, so certainly it would be very difficult to justify because you don't be justifying anything, right? If you're a nihilist, presumably you don't think there is any like moral justification. Um, but uh, also sort of difficult to get the masses worked up for it, you know, um, like because if you're establishing a totalitarian dictatorship or totalitarian government, then you've got to have the masses on your side in some respect. Um, I don't know, man. Like, I'm, I'm actually just rambling here. I have no idea. And so I should stop talking about this. Uh, this is a topic, I suppose, for, like, historians. Um, Arturo Solis, could you recommend a good intro book to political philosophy? Not, not really. I mean, I don't really know. I know that I, when I first started reading political philosophy, I think I read Kim Licker's, what's it called? Will Kim Licker. I think it's contemporary political philosophy, but I'm not actually sure if that's any good. I, I don't know how good that's considered. Um, I didn't do any courses on political philosophy when I was doing my degree or my master's or anything. I actually managed to avoid any courses specifically on political philosophy so um, I although I do have some interest in political philosophy it was something I just sort of came to on my own time um, and yeah I, I so I, I don't know it's kind of difficult to sort of to, to, to say anything about like the best introductions um, I mainly 
learned it through you know reading like articles and and books um like the the primary source material but yeah i i did read the kimlicker book which i thought was pretty good but i i don't know how good that's like considered by others um b amit i remember you don't put any goal for philosophy you think we should investigate the world through philosophy without any goal in mind i hope i got it right more or less um, I actually disagree with your characterization of that because my claim about philosophy not having a goal isn't prescriptive. It's not that I think we should investigate the world without any goal. It's I think that just like I'm not I'm not making a claim about what we should or shouldn't do. I'm just making a claim about what is in fact the case. Like I just think that as a matter of fact, it doesn't really make any sense to attribute a goal to philosophy. Um, in general, right? Like, I think that different philosophers have goals. Maybe there are different research teams that have goals. Like, maybe if we're really stretching it, we can say that traditions have goals. I mean, there was, in some sense, I suppose, a goal of, like, the logical positivist tradition. You know, one of the things the logical positivists wanted to do was to show that metaphysics was meaningless through the application of their particular semantic theory of verificationism, right? So, okay, that's a goal of that tradition. But when you talk about philosophy as a whole that's like such a massive field and there's all sorts of different competing traditions doing so many different things um i think to to, to view that as like having some general goal that that has to be confused i mean i mean like what could it be <laughs> like uh even if we say really abstractly things like truth or or wisdom you know or the good, like goodness. Well, already there, you know, I mean, in talking about like truth, there are going to be philosophers who just deny that that's a legitimate goal. Um, if we talk about goodness, there are philosophers who will deny that that's a goal because, you know, they're like anti-realists about goodness, uh, uh, etc. right? So I just, I, I don't think that this, that it makes sense descriptively to view philosophy, philosophy as having a goal. Um, Okay, right. Any, so now I'm going to continue uh, reading your question. Anyhow, I think you might agree that a byproduct of doing philosophy is reflecting on life events and decisions, conducting dialogues, and even having a few aha moments. So my question is, what are the most positively impactful ideas or areas of philosophy that you have encountered? I think philosophy hasn't really influenced uh, influenced my life. I mean. There are important ideas in philosophy that have influenced my other philosophical views. Um, but if you're talking about impact in a more general sense, like impact on my life, uh, that's kind of hard to say. I suppose the big one would be the, the problem of induction. Um, because for me, the problem of induction, it's not like just an abstract philosophical problem. You know, a lot of people, when they think about the problem of induction, Actually, I say the problem of induction. I suppose what I should say is problems of induction, because there's a whole there's a whole bunch of problems of induction, which I think um, collectively are uh, provide a pretty overwhelming case against the idea that there are any inductive rules, right? So I I don't think that there's from any particular set of evidence that we can kind of apply rules to you know ampliate to to sort of draw inferences about like what's coming in the future or, you know, whatever, right? So th there's there's no rules for uh, inductive, for making inductive inferences. And that's, um, this point I think is, uh, is quite powerful. Um, and I don't see it as a, an abstract philosophical problem as many people do. I think many people, when they think about this problem, um, you know, they recognize that like there's a, there's a the power of the points raised by people like Hume and Goodman, but then you know they're like, well, you know, in practice we just put this to one side, you know, like we we can see that there are these philosophical problems, but you know, in practice induction works, like science works, right? Like we just we just use this kind of inference. Um, so you know, yes, there's a philosophical question here, but it has no like practical consequences in our everyday life. I disagree with that completely. I think that the uh, the problem of induction is not is not merely a philosophical problem. I think it's the condition in which which all of us live, um, and 
where it sort of has an influence on me is when I'm thinking about what to do with my life. I'm always very skeptical of the idea that when I face a decision about where I want my life to go, you know, and what, what sort of path should I take, I'm always very skeptical of thinking of any particular path as being like the safe option or the secure option. There's always so many ways in which, you know, the world can just throw surprises at you. Sometimes those surprises are good, sometimes they're bad. Um, but you know, when, when you're like weighing up, okay, you know, so I don't know, like, should I move to another country? Um, or should I, maybe I'm at the moment, like I'm living in a situation where, you know, everything seems like safe and secure and I have like, I don't know, uh, enough of an income to support my rent and so on. And I'm like, oh, should I risk that? Um, and what a lot of people will think is they'll think I've got a safe option here versus a risky option because I'm not really sure what's going to happen. I am, as a result of thinking about the problem of induction, much more sceptical of the very notion that there are any safe options at all. Because I think, in fact, there are just so many ways in which, uh, in which you can end up being surprised and, you know, you can end up being like Russell's turkey. You know, Russell's turkey on the farm, right, every day it gets fed. Uh, it, it has some nice shelter, you know, you can imagine some other turkey coming to it and saying, hey, you know, we should get out of this farm, we should go and explore the world. And Russell's turkey is like, no, it's safe and secure here. And then, you know, the next day, it gets its head chopped off. Um, I think that we all could be in the position of uh, Russell's turkey. Um, so, I don't know, is this the sort of thing you're asking for? When you said, you know, impactful, I'm, I'm just trying to think about ways that philosophy has influenced my way of thinking about life. So maybe, that is, that's one example of that, right? Um, yeah. Uh, okay. Also, if we insist on n putting a goal for philosophy, not, uh, not in large, just individual goals, things we would like to achieve when studying philosophy, what should those be? What makes philosophy worthwhile for you? What makes you choose to do philosophy? I have no idea. I just have a drive to do it. I don't really think about it. I just like, I just have a desire to do philosophy and I seem to be good at it. So, why not, right? I mean, I know that I get more out of philosophy than doing most other things that I've tried to do in my life. Uh, and I, I sort of fail at philosophy far less often than I fail at other things. Uh, I mean, you know, what counts as failing at philosophy? I suppose I fail at philosophy when I like read something and I just fail to understand it. Or, you know, I try to write an article and it just like doesn't work. But that that's pretty rare, actually. Like, I don't fail at philosophy very often. Um, so, you know, I'm good at it. I have this drive. I don't really understand the drive to do philosophy. Um, it's not as though philosophy brings like a great deal of joy um, or even satisfaction, um, but I, I just do have a drive to do it. And um, I suppose that one has to do something with one's time. So that's what I end up doing. <clears throat> ben, 14p. Do you like slash agree with Hegel and his philosophy? I uh, I know nothing about Hegel, so I I neither like nor dislike, agree nor disagree. I just don't know. Bistful. What do you think of drugs? Have you tried any? And what do you think of the legal status of drugs? Should they be legal or illegal? Well, I've tried cannabis. Uh, was the first drug I tried. I tried smoking it and I tried baking it. Um, into things and uh, it sucked. I thought that was a complete waste of time. When I tried cannabis, the effect of it was to make me just, it sort of shut down my mind. Um, and maybe for some people that's the point, I, I'm not sure. I didn't like that. It, it was like my mind was forcibly shut down. I found myself sitting down and I was listening to music and I had the same song just on a loop. Uh, it was Pink Floyd's Any Colour You Like. I was just listening to this and I didn't want to be sitting down listening to it, but I just couldn't make myself do anything else. I remember sitting down, listening to this song on a loop, just looking at the wall and I couldn't, like, I, I couldn't think about anything else. I was just, you know, I, I had the sound of the song in my head and I remember like listening to each individual instrument. Each instrument broke apart. It wasn't like, the song wasn't unified, right? I couldn't hear the song as a whole. I could only, it's like I, my attention was only specifically on each individual instrument. 
And that was, I suppose, interesting for, you know, like a minute, but then it just got annoying, right? So I had this song in my head. Well, it wasn't in my head, it was playing. And I couldn't focus on the song as a whole. I could only focus on specific things in it. And that got annoying, but I couldn't change anything. I was just sort of stuck sitting down. Like I couldn't, I didn't have the will, even though I wanted to, to change and change my situation. I couldn't move, I couldn't change the song. So that really sucked. As for the alcohol, well, alcohol can certainly be fun. Um, you know, I've done drunk philosophy videos on the channel, so that's fun. Maybe I should have been doing this drunk. That might have been, uh, that might have been interesting. Um, no, I think that I won't do that, actually. That's, that's probably not a good idea, is it? Because I think drinking alcohol on your own, getting drunk on your own, is like, that's a step too far. Uh, so, um, so no. But yeah, it can be fun. I don't do it very often. Those are the only drugs I've done. I, uh, I, I am interested in other drugs, but the problem is I've had pretty serious anxiety problems um, in the past. And still today, you know, it's, they're not that disruptive, but I still have anxiety issues, you know, like I, I have panic attacks these days, but I can just control them. Like I, I know what they are, I know when they're happening and it's like, okay, this is uncomfortable, whatever, right? I, I can get through this. Um, but like because of that, I'm very nervous about taking other drugs. Uh, even though I'm fascinated, I'm particularly fascinated by the hallucinogenics. I would, I would love to do LSD and you know mushrooms and DMT and all that stuff. Uh, it would be fascinating, I'm sure. But it's just, uh, I, I, it concerns me that I, like, I feel like it could really go really wrong. You know, I don't want to have a bad trip. That's the big thing. Um, it's not like you can just switch it off, right? So that's a worry. As for the legal status, to me, this is just an easy question. Like, obviously, they should be legalized. Um, I don't, I mean, I, I don't even think there's like a sensible argument against it, at least not for many drugs. I mean, I guess if we're talking about stuff like heroin, crack and meth, stuff like that, I mean, OK, fine. Maybe there's some sort of argument to be had. Um, but yeah, with, you know, with cannabis, mushrooms, LSD. I, I genuinely, it's stunning to me that like, we're still today living in a world where like, you know what, just a couple of days ago, the British government has made some new proposal about how to deal with drugs. They've got this new drug policy. And I believe that they are saying things like people who are convicted of drug crimes will have their passports revoked and stuff like that. Right. So it's like, we, st we still today are living in a world where we're like going harder. We're going tougher on them. Like what the fuck? I mean, it's just like you, you, you are fucking like you are a fucking idiot if you think. I mean, you're either an idiot or you just like really kind of value maximizing shitty lives uh, or something like that. You just want to make people's lives worse. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that current drug policy is completely fucking stupid. And um, so that's my stance. Um, blah Caligula. What is the most convincing response to the Frege Geach embedding problem? And what do you think of universal prescriptivism? I don't really know what the most convincing is. I think there are a bunch of responses that seem fine to me. Blackburn and Gibbard have both given perfectly plausible accounts. Uh, now, do these accounts capture everything that we want to s sort of say about, you know, moral terms? Maybe not. Um, but, you know, I always saw non-cognitivism, even when I was a non-cognitivist, and maybe I still am a non-cognitivist, um, I always saw it as a kind of conceptual engineering. Um, so, you know, my, so like, okay, right. I think most of the literature on metaethics and probably philosophy in general rests on a kind of mistaken view of language. Um, the assumption is that there are determinate precise facts about the meanings of our terms or the references of our terms. Um, in my view, actual language use is vague, messy, incoherent, uh, references indeterminate. I have a video 
called referential pluralism, where I talk a little bit about the reasons for this. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm not, I won't go into that here, but I mean, I think that it's actually, it's actually quite, it's actually a very intuitive position, right? Like actual language use is just vague and messy, right? And so in philosophy, you know, we give these really precise semantic theories. What we're offering are like different precisifications of something that is, you know, very blurred, right? Like we have this blurred image and then there are lots of different ways of making it sharper. And so when philosophers give semantic theories, that's sort of what they're doing. They're offering different ways of sharpening the blurred image, the blurred image of language. So, you know, the like one of the goals of philosophy when we're giving an account of moral language um, is it's sort of up to us to choose which of these sharpenings we want. Um, and so giving a theory of meaning for moral statements is not going to capture everything about how we use those statements. It's not going to capture everything about moral discourse. But that's not a problem, right? Like that's actually that's actually a feature, not a bug. Um, because what we're doing is we're you know we're cleaning it up. We we're not just describing how moral concepts are actually used. We're precisifying them. Um, so if you look at non-cognitivism in that way, non-cognitivism as an explication of moral language, right, as, as like precisifying moral concepts, um, then I think that the, the frege Geach problem, it, it, it becomes less of an issue um, because, again, you don't have to capture like everything about how moral statements might be embedded in everyday discourse. Um, and, and I mean, there are things you, that we are going to want to capture, right? We're going to want to capture the use of moral concepts in arguments. So, you know, if such and such is wrong, then such and such is wrong, right? Like, so, you know, if torture is wrong, then getting Frank to perform torture is wrong. Torture is wrong. So getting Frank to perform torture is wrong, right? Like that kind of thing. We're going to want to capture that because people make moral arguments and we don't want to say that that's just meaningless. Um, and I think that there are ways of capturing that. As I say, like Blackburn and Gibbard both seem to have given perfectly plausible accounts of that to me. So I suppose I've never really seen the Frege Geach problem as being as being all that serious. I think it's somewhat overstated, and it seems that it seems to me that a lot of the literature on this rests on a mistaken view of language. Um, so yeah, I guess that would be my response to that. As for universal prescriptivism. It's it's a good idea. Um, it's a good idea, but it seems to have been superseded at this point. Um, the general motivation behind it, uh, as I understand it, is to sort of take moral statements as tools for guiding behaviour, um, rather than merely as like expressions of emotions, as the earlier non-cognitivists thought. That's a really useful development. Um, so I guess I. I, I like it, but it seems like there are probably more sophisticated accounts of non-cognitivism available now, um, which sort of build on that same idea. I think the, the, the notion of universalizability is hard to make precise. Um, like it's intuitively very appealing, but it's hard to make precise. It's hard to say what like counts as, you know, the same circumstances. So the idea that like in making a moral judgment, we're committed to saying that same judgment would apply to anybody in the same circumstances. It's really intuitively appealing, but it's very hard to make that precise. Um, and it's also hard to believe that any particular precisification is going to capture, uh, again, like describe perfectly the content of everyday moral claims. So, you know, again, there are, I think there are more sophisticated views available that build on the same sort of idea, but um, it was a good idea. Uh, I think that was, yeah, that was your question. So, um, blank name. What do you think of Karl Marx's historical materialism theory? Uh, I don't really think a lot of it uh, because I don't really know it that well. I mean, my my feeling is that it's going to be it, it's going to be pretty implausible um, when stated as a sort of universal claim. I mean, it strikes me as implausibly reductionistic. Um, I suppose it's it's like if, if it's proposed as a sort of idealization, then fine. I mean, we idealize all the time. But um, like societies just aren't, they don't operate in such a simple way in, in fact. Uh, so, 
you know, the superstructure is not going to be entirely determined by the base. Um, the superstructure has like a kind of autonomy and it, it inf it's going to influence, I think, the, the economic base. Um, there's going to be mutual influence there. Uh, again, though, I, I don't know, like maybe, I, I don't really know Marx very well and maybe this was always proposed as an idealization, which is fine. Um, so it's kind of hard for me to evaluate this. I'm just, I just don't have enough knowledge. But I think that, yeah, I mean, any claim that like, uh, I don't know, like the ideology of a society or, or whatever is, or like the institutions of a society, etc., are just determined by the like material economic conditions. Um, that, that, that has to be false, right? Like if it's being made as like, a universal claim um, that has to be false. Uh, societies just aren't that simple. Um, I'm probably missing something. Anyway, uh, what type of economic system do you lean towards? I I don't know. I don't know economics, man. I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't know. I mean, I I don't even want to say anything here. Like, people have asked me this question before, and I know that I've said stuff in the past, but I'm just increasingly unwilling to make any type of commitment because I I know nothing about economics. Um, is there a specific name for people like me who are agnostic? Me being you, being blank name. Is there a specific name for people like blank name who are agnostic, meaning we don't have access to that knowledge, on the question of scientific realism? Um, maybe scientific anti-realist? <laughs> uh, so, if you're agnostic about theories, if you have an agnostic, so if you like just don't know whether or not our best theories um, provide true descriptions of reality, uh, then you're, you're an anti-realist, right? Like, uh, so, so like if, if you take our best scientific theories and um, you just don't think that we have access to the knowledge, uh, I mean, anti-realists like myself, um, generally think that, you know, for all we know, uh, our best theories may well provide true descriptions. Um, like maybe there really are electrons and black holes and so on, right? So um, at least, you know, in, in those respects, they provide, they, they might provide true descriptions. Um, it, it may well be that the unobservable world really is structured in, in the sort of way that those theories describe. Um, but we're not convinced. Right. So it's I mean, I, I would say that I have an agnostic take, uh, an agnostic stance. Um, now, if what you're claiming is that you have no preference with respect to either realism or anti-realism. So, you know, you've thought about the philosophical arguments and you just haven't come down on a side. You don't know which is right. Um, well, there is. So there are th there are positions like Arthur Fine's natural ontological attitude, um, which sort of try to be kind of via media positions. I mean, so Fine says that the natural ontological attitude is the, the attitude that is shared between realists and anti-realists, right? Um, but it's not obvious to me that that's actually a coherent position. Um, you know, Fine says, so one of the things that Fine says is that like, there are electrons, right? And indeed, it is true that there are electrons. Uh, Fine thinks that that, that that can be shared between both realists and anti-realists. I don't think anti-realists would endorse the claim that it is true that there are electrons. Um, so yeah, that, that may not be a coherent option. Now, of course, in some philosophical debates, you know, it may just be the case that you just don't know. You just, like you've looked at the arguments and you, you have no particular opinion. Um, the thing is, there isn't really a specific name for that, right? <laughs> like that's not a that's not a position. That's just you don't know which position to adopt. So, if what you're saying is that you've looked at the arguments for realism and anti-realism, um, and you just have no idea, then I don't think there's a name for that position. You're not actually adopting a position. You just don't know yet. Um, if what you're saying is that you've looked at the arguments and you think maybe there's uh, some sort of uh, there's something you endorse that's maybe shared by them, then maybe you're, you'd be inclined to something like Arthur Fine's natural ontological attitude. But again, you know, maybe that's not coherent. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. It depends on what you mean when you say that you're agnostic. Um, 
So yeah. Um, CFHSCRHR. What's your opinion on process metaphysics and the analytic continental divide? Are you familiar with speculative realism? If so, what's your opinion on it? No, nope, don't know anything about speculative realism. Process metaphysics, I'm not really convinced that it's a substantive debate. Uh, this is one of those things that it, it, it feels like the debate between um, people who are uh, uh, like compositional nihilists and people who are compositional universalists. You know, you have some people saying that there's like there are no uh, composite objects, and then some people would claim everything is a composite object. Any two objects count as a further object. Um, that may just be terminological, right? Uh, th there are good reasons I think to see that debate as just being as just ultimately coming down to like differences in how you want to define a word like object and word like parts. Um, we can very easily sort of move from sort of one position to the other uh, and it feels almost like, you know, a Necker cube when, you know that, that cube, the Necker cube where it's like you can like make it flip between different, uh, different sort of images, you can see it with different faces depending on like how you interpret it in your mind. Um, so anyway, there are some metaphysical debates that are like that. And I've, I've sort of always seen, you know, process metaphysics versus, I guess, you know, thing metaphysics or substance metaphysics as, as being a bit like that. I, uh, like whether we take you know, things to be fundamental or processes to be fundamental, I'm not sure is substantive, but then maybe I just haven't really read enough about it. Um, that's, that's, that's usually the case, right? Usually I just haven't read enough about something. Um, but I mean, look, I'm <laughs> my own stance is kind of empiricist, right? So I tend to just be agnostic about broad metaphysical claims. Uh, having said that, you know, I do like engaging with metaphysics. Um, I just, it, it, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure what, what like substantive, di what the substantive difference is. So yeah, uh, as for analytic continental divide. Um, what's my opinion on it? Well, you know, I don't really know continental philosophy, but I can say something about analytic philosophy. I don't really see analytic philosophy as being a unified tradition, at least not anymore. I think it, it was once, right? There used to be, there used to be such a thing as analytic philosophy. <clears throat> and so you can kind of trace this tradition, which began with, um, with ideal language philosophy, where, <clears throat> You know, the the idea was that ordinary language <clears throat> ordinary language generates philosophical problems because ordinary language is vague, messy, misleading. Um, uh, but there is like an underlying logical form to our statements, right? And the underlying logical form is precise and truth functional. And you know, Russell's theory of descriptions is like the paradigm example of of ideal language philosophy. So the present king of France is bald. There's this like misleading surface grammatical form, but then we can kind of we can a we can analyze it. We can analyze it into its underlying logical form, um, and we can see that in fact, you know, in saying something like <coughs> the present king of France is bald, um, or whatever, we can see that the underlying logical commitments. <coughs> we can like evaluate that as being false uh, in terms of its underlying logical commitments, right, without ending up committing ourselves to like weird metaphysical entities like, you know, non-existent present kings of France or whatever. So anyway, the point is, right, you start off with this tradition where the idea is we're going to purify language. Um, and then once you've done that, you can construct uh, science on this basis, right? Once we have precise concepts that are stated in formal logic, that's going to give us a secure basis for empirical uh, study. Um, and so, you know, you have that, and then that sort of, then that then that split where you had ordinary language philosophy. Um, now, ordinary language philosophy was still focused on linguistic analysis. Uh, philosophical problems are like fundamentally to be resolved by linguistic analysis, but they had a very different view of the nature of this for the ordinary language philosophers. Um, 
language doesn't have any sort of underlying logical form. Um, uh, it, you know, uh, philosophical issues arise uh, very often from people attempting to find such an underlying logical form, and philosophical problems arise from the misuse of language. So, you know, you have this tradition with a significant split. I mean, there are significant differences between these, but we can still see there's this idea of philosophical problems arising from misuse of language, broadly speaking. Ideal language philosophers and ordinary language philosophers have very different ideas about what misuse of language is. Um, also, they're both very resistant to metaphysics. Um, again, for very different reasons. Um, but, right, since like, you know, the 50s and 60s, this is all just broken down completely and it's gone in all kinds of different directions. Um, so, you know, there is no longer an ideal, a, like a tradition of ideal language philosophy, nor is there a tradition of ordinary language philosophy. These traditions just no longer exist. I mean, there are philosophers like working in both modes, but there's not any sort of unified tradition. Um, moreover, uh, because of people like, you know, Quine and Kripke and so on, uh, you see the resurgence of metaphysics because of people like Kuhn, I guess. Um, there's, certainly within philosophy of science at least, there's a, a kind of more historical turn. Um, so, you know, like considerations of history come back in and I don't, and, and now like more recently, you know, there's been experimental philosophy. I mean, all, all of this is operating within what's called the analytic tradition, but it's very hard to see what that tradition actually is, right? Like, I mean, what is it that's that's really unifying uh, all of the work that's going on in analytic philosophy beyond the fact that it has a certain style, right? Like there's, and certain, yeah, there are certain tools, right? That analytic philosophers will, you know, use formal logic a bit more than most. But I mean, even that, like, not not really. I mean, there's loads of philosophy being done that's not being is not using formal tools. So um, yeah, I mean, I, there, there just doesn't seem to me to be uh, uh, such a thing as analytic philosophy uh, as a unified tradition. I think it's just a description of a particular like style. Um, and with that said, um, again, I don't really have an opinion on the analytic continental divide, but. Um, maybe that provides something in the way of an answer uh, because it tells you what I think of analytic philosophy. I, I can't really comment on continental philosophy. I do know that there is plenty of um, philosophers in analytic departments who are saying that we should, you know, be more open to uh, continental work. Um, so again, this is going to, um, I suppose, like, yeah, muddy the waters even further of what the hell analytic philosophy is supposed to be. Um, <clears throat> Chase Kanip, what is your employment status? Would you consider doing YouTube full time if we financially supported you? How much support would you need? My employment status is becoming desperate. Um, not desperate at the moment, I should say, but it's probably gonna be desperate quite soon. It's not good, it's not good. Um, <clears throat> looking for work is very much like looking for a date or looking for friendships in that nobody's interested. Nobody is interested at all. Um, of course, with dating and friendships and so on, uh, you know, if you fail to find anything, you just like become miserable. So that doesn't actually make a difference to anything. Life goes on, you just like feel bad about stuff. Whereas failing to get a job, that does make a difference. That's gonna cause some problems. Things can get really fucked up if you don't have a job. So um, yeah, I don't really know what to do about this. I'm not sure what's going to happen. I feel like I'm, you know, journeying into the void and uh, I, I, I don't know what the future holds, but um, I just try not to think about it, to be honest. I, uh, I, I, I continue to sort of put in applications to stuff and I, I, I just try not to try, try, try not to think about what's actually going to happen. Um, so my employment status is not good. Um, would I consider doing YouTube full time? Well, I don't think that there's enough, I, there'd be enough interest in it, to be honest. Um, <clears throat> I don't think I'd be able to. Uh, I, I just don't have a, a big enough channel for that. Um, so like it would be cool, I suppose, but 
I don't think I could. So um, that's not really something I'm thinking about at the moment. Who knows what will happen in the future? Maybe that maybe it will explode and you know I'll get like a million subscribers or something. Then I think about doing it full time. Um, Chitranash, first of all, how are you? I am tired, but I'm often tired because I I have a very poor sleep pattern. Um, what are your views on socialism versus capitalism? Uh, I, 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 I don't I don't know anymore. I, I just don't know. Uh, I, I can't I can't think about this. I don't know anything about economics. Okay, you know I like stuff. I read you know stuff in like the market anarchist tradition, and it's really cool. Like the book Markets Not Capitalism. It's really cool. I like it. I like the idea of it. Right, but um, I don't actually know anything about economics. So how can I evaluate these? these claims I can't right um, so I shouldn't say anything about them and therefore I should move on to the next question have you ever experienced one-sided love um, no I have not at least as far as I'm aware of course I can't see inside other people's heads maybe when I thought love was reciprocated it actually wasn't um, but if it wasn't I would say that the people who I was in who I so I would say the people that I love if they were not in fact reciprocating my love, they did a very good job of pretending to do so. And that's kind of good enough, isn't it? Um, what What is it massive? If, if, you, if you don't know the difference, then it's, it's fine, right? Um, you also asked me to make a video on the Sleeping Beauty problem. Um, I may do that at some point, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, so I, I'm not promising anything. Um, Crab King, what is your position on abstractor? Um, if you're a realist, what kind of realism would you consider yourself a nominalist? Yes, I would consider myself a nominalist. Um, I think that realism, the kinds of explanations that realism gives uh, in this context seem to me to just fail on their own terms. Uh, I, I don't think there's any utility in like postulating a realm of entities that have no kind of causal connection to us. I can't make sense of how we could have any understanding of them, right? Like the the explanations that realism gives, kind of give us a picture of the world that cut us off from the relevant facts. Um, I find that to be a serious problem with realism. I mean, that's a classic problem, right? It's a classic epistemological objection, but that is, uh, I, I think, convincing. Okay, Dal Su, what is your, Opinion on Graham Priest and dialetheism. Do you think there are alternative logics? Might they be useful? Uh, yeah, I like Graham Priest and dialetheism. In fact, yeah, I'd say Priest is one of my favourite philosophers. And um, um, yeah, I mean, dialetheism is a fascinating position. I might be a dialetheist. I think that if I'm if I am a dialetheist, I would see uh, contradiction as arising as I think J. C. Beale. Uh, uses the term like spandrels of language. So once you have a language with sufficient expressive power, contradictions just sort of inevitably arise um, in the same way as you get spandrels in architecture. Spandrels are like, um, if you have an arch and I think there's like something above the arch, you get, so like an arch is like that and then you get these bits in between, right? Those are spandrels. So, you know, in the same way, once once you have a language that has certain properties, right, two contradictions just arise inevitably. So in particular, if you have a language that has a truth predicate and the ability to make self-referential sentences, then you're just going to get contradictions with things like the liar sentence. Right? This sentence is false. Um, that kind of idea seems um, fairly compelling to me. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure that I... I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure that I am completely convinced, but you know, it it it, it seems perfectly plausible to me. Um, as for alternative logics, I mean, there's no question. I think that there are alternative logics. Uh, people have developed various alternative formal systems. I suppose the question here is which logic provides the correct account of reasoning. Um, so you know, we have, for instance, classical logic. We have relevance logic. We have other paraconsistent logics. Um, if we are dialetheists, if we think that there are true contradictions, then we had better adopt a paraconsistent logic for when we are modelling reasoning with contradictions. Um, 
because you know otherwise if you model reasoning with contradictions with uh, classical logic then um, you end up with the situation that you have to believe everything um, well I suppose you don't have to you wouldn't have to do anything but a contradiction entails everything in classical logic so um, there are alternative logics where that's not the case um, and so yeah I mean the question is just which logic provides the like correct account of reasoning um, my own line on this is that uh, I don't actually think that there are any universal rules of reasoning. So in that sense, I mean, th there's a sense, I think, in which I, I would say that there are just no laws of logic. Um, but I think that, you know, logical systems, formal systems are, uh, are very, uh, you know, useful idealizations. And, um, you know, there are, they, they hold, so like logical laws may not hold universally, but they sort of hold broadly enough. I mean, even classical logic, right? Like in most situations, we do not face contradictions. So we can model reasoning using classical logic. Uh, it's only when we're dealing with like rather bizarre semantic um, cases like the liar paradox that we have to start bringing in classical logics, um, bringing in, sorry, paraconsistent logics in other contexts, I don't know, like most reasoning in, you know, science, maybe classical logic is enough, is, is good enough. Um, okay, so yeah, uh, undoubtedly, um, alternative logics are useful. And um, I'm inclined to think that there isn't really like a one true logic. Um, I don't think that there are any universal rules of reasoning. So I would say that we do, in fact, have to appeal to alternative logics, even when modeling um, our reasoning practices. Okay, David Zuloff. How do you respond to Agrippa's trilemma? Foundationalism, inf infinitism, coherentism, skepticism. Please tell me why you reject the ones you do. Um, well, maybe some sort of coherentist, um, just in the sense that I think rational belief needs to be sort of consistent from the point of view of itself. I mean, consistency can, is a bit hard to uh, evaluate because I'm, uh, you know, I'm kind of, I, I'm very much open to like pluralism about logic and so on. Uh, so, you know, but, you know, from what, from the point of view of whatever logical system you're adopting, I, I think that, well, actually, no, maybe, maybe put it this way, like rational beliefs have to be, it has to be at least possible that um, those beliefs will turn out to be true, right? And so the problem with endorsing contradictory beliefs in most situations is that they're just not going to be able to turn out to be true. You know, if I believe that, um, both you know both that there is a car outside and that there is not a car outside well that's not gonna that's not something that can turn out to be true at least not both of them anyway um but i think that uh so i don't know whether i would say that co that i'm really a coherentist because my sort of take on this is that i don't think that justification I mean, this is about justification, right? Like the question is what justifies our beliefs? Um, I don't think justification is really required for rational belief, nor do I think it's required for making ampliative inferences on the basis of whatever beliefs we hold. I think you can have you know, rational beliefs just without justification at all. Um, and so this is, uh, this is known as voluntarist epistemology, and it's what I'm more inclined towards. Um, so I'm not sure, I'm not sure how that fits, right? Like, I think that, um, yeah, so I'm kind of, I, I, I would be inclined to sort of reject um, the very way that this debate is set up, right? I just, I don't think that rational belief actually requires justification. Rational beliefs, um, again, they need to be such that they could turn out to be true or could turn out to be vindicated. Um, and they need to be such that they support successful action. So, you know, there's there's a degree of luck involved in this um, because, you know, it may turn out like we can imagine different possible worlds where, you know, in one world, somebody has a set of beliefs which do support successful action. And in another world, um, maybe the world is just such that the same set of beliefs ends up failing them. Um, so those beliefs would not count as rational. Um, but, you know, as, as long as you are generally able to achieve your goals and your beliefs 
uh, are such that they could turn out to be true, um, that's all that's really required for rationality. Um, there doesn't need to be any justification or any further justification, at least. Um, so, yeah, I think that answers the question, I think. Um, <clears throat> Q0, how is dating going? Um, why do you have to remind me of that? I mean, you know, we had a nice discussion going here, right? We could we were talking about philosophy and, you know, I, I was in a good mood. Now you've reminded me of dating. My, how is dating going? It's not going. Um, that's it. It's, it's not going, right? Nothing, nothing. Um, dating... Uh, is not a th what is dating? I've actually forgotten what it is. Um, somebody will have to remind me because it's been so long since there's been any kind of progress or and that's the situation, right? It sucks. Um, so I'm just going to move on from this question, and I am not happy with the fact that you have you know reminded me of of this miserable situation. Uh, question one. This isn't question one. You've you've already asked me two questions, but for some reason you've. This is question question one. No, actually, yes, this is question one. Let's forget about that last question. Um, when you argue against scientific realism, you often bring up that Newton's theory was successful in all the ways our current theories are, but it was still wrong. But do you really think this historical fact is a strong argument against scientific realism, or do you feel like there are stronger arguments against scientific realism? If not, why is this argument? based on this historical fact, strong in your opinion? Um, it's probably not the strongest argument. Um, I mean, it's, it's not a very strong argument, but it's, it's a very useful one. So why do I appeal to Newtonian mechanics? Well, um, I mean, first of all, it's a simple example that most people can understand, right? Which, so, I mean, it's simple and most people can understand it because, you know, we, most people will have had some sort of, most people will have encountered Newtonian mechanics to some degree, right? Like you've done, if you've done physics at school, then you're going to have encountered this. So most people are going to have, like, at least a basic understanding of what, of what this example is. And also, of course, we, again, it's, it's just, I think, like the educated lay person will know that, you know, this was superseded by general relativity. Okay, so it's an example which is just well understood by lots of people and it's very useful for illustrating the problems with inferring from success to truth. Um, again, it's useful as an illustration, right? Now, if we want to make an argument, I think there's, there's a lot more that needs to be said, but as a kind of intuitive illustration, it's, it's very useful. And in particular, um, you know, Newtonian mechanics is still in use, right? Like we, we actually still, um, yeah, we, we, we still apply Newtonian mechanics for doing like really complex things like getting probes to Pluto. When we got the probe to Pluto, um, I'm pretty sure that like you, you work that out using Newtonian mechanics. The calculations are based on Newtonian mechanics. Um, I suppose if you want to get a probe to Mercury, uh, you'd have to use general, like, you know, you have to consider relativistic effects. But for getting a probe to Pluto, I don't think you have to. I'm, I'm pretty sure um, you can just calculate that. And, and, and it was calculated um, using Newtonian mechanics. So um, the point is that we all accept scientific theories in an instrumentalist sense, right? So in some cases, we can point to like successful theories of the past or more or less successful theories of the past that we no longer accept, like phlogiston. Um, but Newtonian mechanics is a great example because it's still actually applied in confronting the world. Um, so people who use it that way use it as instrumentalists. And that at least raises the question, you know, why not extend the same attitude to theories that are not currently superseded? Now, I mean, I don't think that in itself this is a good argument against scientific realism. I think it's a very good illustration of an alternative, let's say. Um, more generally, I, I mean, I don't really find the pessimistic induction to be a particularly convincing argument. Um, I, I think you can get... A, I, I, I'm much more persuaded if you want to use these kinds of examples by pointing out... So, the, so by pointing to the idealizations that are sort of prevalent through 
currently accepted theories. Um, I think that provides a much better case. But again, it's just more like, it's less intuitive. It's more difficult to explain. So that's why I frequently appeal to Newtonian mechanics. It's just like, for the purposes of talking to a broader audience, I think it's a better example. Um, what do you think about the sensitivity condition on knowledge for knowledge from Nozick? Do you like it? What are your problems with it? Um, um, I don't have like a lot of thoughts about it. Uh, it's not so. Uh, you know, it's it's a so first of all, it's a counterfactual condition. Um, so S's belief that P is sensitive if and only if if P were false. S would not believe that P. Now, I have a lot of problems with these sorts of counterfactual claims. Um, it usually, like, okay, well, I, I mean, my inclination would just be to say there's no fact of the matter, right? Uh, like, what, what would be the case if P were false, right? If P were false, S would not believe that P. I think there's usually just no facts of the matter about that, generally speaking, right? Like, the truth value of this counterfactual is just going to depend on what we choose to hold fixed. Um, so, you know, uh, I suppose to put it in terms of possible worlds, right? Well, what do we want to choose? Like, there isn't a fact of the matter about what the nearest possible world is. It just depends on what factors we want to choose. So, like, in the nearest possible world in which um, P is false, but my experiences are entirely identical, well, I would still believe that P. So in that case, it's not, my belief that P is not sensitive. Um, so like take for instance, I have hands. So if I have hands were false, I would not believe I have hands. Um, okay, well, we can imagine a world in which like my hands are chopped off, right? Um, and that and, and the, like my visual system works in the same way. Okay, in that world, um, you know, that's a, I suppose, a close possible world in which I don't have hands and I don't believe that I have hands, right? Because we're just assuming we're kind of fixing the same operation of my visual system and all of that. But, you know, we can imagine similarly a near, a, a, the closest possible world with respect to my experiences, right? If you hold my experiences fixed, well, then um, the nearest possible world in which I don't have hands is a world in which I do believe that I have hands because I'm having the same mental impressions. Um, like maybe my hands have been chopped off, but I'm hallucinating them. Or maybe, you know, I'm a brain in a vat and I have like just uh, yeah, exactly the same experiences. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I mean like as a sort of general um, constraint on knowledge, it's, I think that it's, it's very intuitive and it's getting at something important um, but, you know, I think a lot of philosophers kind of put more weight on this than it can bear because they are assuming that there are like non-contextual facts of the matter about the truth value of counterfactuals. And I have a lot of problems with the way that philosophers have traditionally thought about counterfactuals. So any sort of condition like this is going to inherit those problems. Any counterfactual condition is going to inherit the sort of problems that I have with counterfactuals. Because I think counterfactuals, the evaluation of counterfactuals is like thoroughly context dependent and it's it's up to us to decide what we want to hold fixed. There isn't a fact of the matter about, you know, what like would be the case if such and such were different. Um, or at least we can't say anything about what would be the case if such and such were different without saying what it is that we're choosing to hold fixed. Um, so yeah, um, I, I guess that um, hopefully explains it. Uh, explains my my thoughts on that. Okay, question four. Um, you discussed and seem to accept the first and second noble truths of Buddhism in your video on pessimism. Um, first is that life is suffering. Second is that the cause of suffering is desire. You also seem to accept the bundle theory of identity, um, which is identical to the way Buddha and Buddhists wrote about the self. Uh, lastly, you are interested in the challenge of skepticism, which is a big deal in Buddhism as well. Um, I was wondering if there are more positions developed by Buddhist philosophers you accept, or if there are positions that you reject. Why are you not a Buddhist? Um, I don't really know why I'm not a Buddhist. Uh, I mean, there are probably some commitments that Buddhists have that I don't. And anyway, I'm just not really that. I'm just not particularly 
like dogmatic about stuff, right? Like, like I, I mean, in order to count as a Buddhist, I suppose I'd have to accept certain. Like it's, a, I mean, it's a religion, right? I mean, maybe it doesn't involve belief in God, but presumably there are certain dogmas associated with it. Um, maybe not. I, I don't really know. Um, maybe I should be a Buddhist, but yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not. Now, as for um, the self, I mean, you said that bundle theory. I accept bundle theory. I would consider myself more of a kind of pragmatist or constructivist about the self, and really, this is just a product of my constructivism about objects in general, right? So, like, I think that there is a cup here. Mm. This is a cup. I think it's true that there is a cup, but I think that we construct the cup. Um, so, in fact, like, it's up to us to draw the boundaries between things. And obviously, once you, you know, zoom in on the cup, um, there isn't going to be, like, a clear boundary. There's just going to be this, like, mass of particles. Um, so, you know, I think that our like cognitive activity kind of imposes boundaries on the world and in the same way you know we impose boundaries around people uh, and minds and um, the way like the best way to do that is like governed by uh, just kind of pragmatic considerations so I mean I'm not sure that I would consider myself a bundle theorist really I mean like I think that I suppose that bundle theory is motivated by the idea that there's some sort of fact of the matter about what counts as an individual, um, and I don't think that there is. I mean, it's just it's it's up to us to draw those lines, and of course, in practice, we don't draw the lines in that kind of way, right? Like, it's there are very few people who you know conceive of themselves as just being bundles of. Well, I mean, actually, I say conceive of themselves, right? Like, they wouldn't. They wouldn't be conceiving of themselves in any way at all if you accept the bundle theory. They're just, so if you, if you think there just is no self, um, just a series of impressions, then um, yeah, you, you don't you don't have any like self conception at all. So you can already see it's very difficult to even talk in these ways, right? Like um, you you would have to completely overthrow the way that you use language. I mean, what actually happens, I suppose, is that people who endorse the bundle theory will presumably end up accepting something like the traditional account of personal identity or selfhood as a useful fiction or as like something that has pragmatic utility. Um, I get to the same route more directly, right? <laughs> I guess. Um, incidentally, I mean, when it comes to stuff like bundle theory, one of the problems is, is that um, there isn't, so in the same way that we construct selves and construct identity over time, right? We similarly have to construct the individual sensations. So like, if you endorse bundle theory, then, you know, you say, okay, there isn't a self, there's just this series of like mental impressions, mental sensations, um, thoughts, feelings, emotions, etc. But like specifying the individual thought, the individual emotion, that also is constructed. Um, so, you know, if like the same problem, so the same, for the same reason that there isn't a self, you can say that actually there isn't any thought, there isn't any emotion, there isn't any like pain or hope or feeling, etc. Because, you know, all of these are a product of like our particular way of conceptualizing things and our way of drawing boundaries around things. Um, so I guess that hopefully explains my uh, my, my stance there. I mean, in, maybe maybe I do count as some sort of bundle theorist, um, but yeah, I'd see myself more as a constructivist. Um, Dimitri Dujev, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. What theory of truth do you follow? What about J.C. Beale's constructive deflationism or maybe semantic deflationism? Um, I would say that I endorse a kind of correspondence theory insofar as, or at least I endorse the intuition behind correspondence theory, like I think that something is true if it matches what the world is like. Um, where I depart from most correspondence theorists is that I don't think that there is any objective matching relation. So most correspondence theorists, I believe, want to say that it's like, you know, there's something mind independent, like the world itself determines the match. 
So, you know, a proposition is true when it corresponds to what the world is like, or it corresponds to a state of affairs in the world, and the world itself determines the correspondence. There's a mind independent fact of the matter whether a proposition corresponds to the world. Um, I don't agree with that. Um, I think that truth is the property of propositions, um, that first of all, propositions are things that we have to construct, um, that secondly, we have to decide the standards for what counts as a relevant match between a proposition and the world. So, you know, when I say something like the table is flat, well, that's, that's true, but its truth can't be determined just by the world itself because it, it's dependent on the standards by which we're like evaluating the flatness. Um, if I'm placing objects on the table, well, you know, okay, it counts as flat because the objects don't wobble, they don't slide off. Uh, if I'm doing a precision physics experiment or something, then the table is not going to count as flat because it's like loads of bumps and ridges. I mean, in fact, I can see the bumps and ridges, but I would say the table is flat. I think it's true that this table in front of me is flat. Um, but clearly it's like, well, that can't be just determined by the world itself. The world itself isn't, isn't sort of imposing the correspondence there. Um, I am. I'm the one who's deciding the relevant standards. Um, and so then, the, and then the, the third point is, is that when we, when we sort of compare, when we kind of compare propositions with the world, well, the world itself is, is always just a further model, right? Like we can never get out of our heads and uh, look at, you know, the world itself, um, or, or rather, you know, any kind of claim, any conceptualization we make of the world involves like our constructive mental activity. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think truth is not going to be something that's independent in the way that traditional correspondence theorists have thought. Let me just go back to that further point because I think that was so. That the third point I said, the, you know, that the world itself is constructed. What I mean by that is that when I say, for instance, the table is flat, um, yeah, I'm, I'm like comparing a proposition with a model. That's that's the point. Um, and so its truth consists in its correspondence to some part of that model. Um, anyway, yeah, so truth isn't isn't going to be like independent or objective in the way that traditional correspondence theorists have thought, at least on my view. Um, and um, so so yeah, that's that's my uh, that's my theory of truth. Broadly speaking, uh, I, I guess. Um, <clears throat> oh, and with respect to dialetheism, I did say something about that in response to somebody else. Um, so if you look at my response to Dal Su uh, earlier, I said a little bit about dialetheism. Um, Edu Dam. What do you think could be the importance of post-structuralist thought to the way doctors speak to patients? I don't know a fucking thing about either of those things, so I, I have no thoughts at all about that. I, I know nothing about post-structuralism. Edwin Rue, what do you think of the criticism of the method of cases that has recently been raised by people like Edward Macquery and Anne Verbaz? Um, the respective points of criticism raised by Macri and Baz are very different from each other, and in turn somewhat different from the one voiced by Christopher Sula in why the method of cases won't work. So maybe say something about any argument that this method, against this method that you happen to be familiar with, if any. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I really, I mean, I can't comment on like these specific people because I just don't remember what exactly they said. If I ever read their articles and books in the first place, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, I think that there are, uh, so I, I tend to be pretty skeptical of the appeal to intuition that this method rests on. Um, intuitions are not, in many cases, they're not appropriately like hooked up to the world. You know, I can't see how it is the case that an intuition could deliver knowledge of the relevant facts of the world. Like if you're using intuition to try to get to the moral facts or using intuition to justify particular metaphysical theories, for instance, it's just not clear what the connection is between intuition and the domain of facts that it's supposedly giving us knowledge about. Um, I think that this method of appealing to intuitions in particular cases, I think it tends to be unreasonably conservative when, you know, there's like, 
for me, part of the point of philosophy is, you know, actually exploring like challenges to our common sense views, you know, like we, so in, so there's something kind of weird about the very idea that, you know, we're going to be defending philosophical ideas by appealing to what we find intuitive in particular cases. Um, it, that's, that's weird if you think the point of philosophy is, um, or at least one of the points of philosophy is to resist dogmatism and to, you know, challenge common sense. Um, I also think intuition just has a, you know, it's, it seems to have a fairly poor track record. It doesn't seem to be reliable. It doesn't seem to have, and, and the method of cases more generally, like doesn't seem to have actually delivered um, any kind of stable convergence on any particular views. So we can look at stuff like the application of the method of cases to decide between different moral theories or the use of method of cases to, you know, analyze the concept of knowledge. Um, just doesn't seem to work very well. It doesn't seem to actually lead to uh, uh, consensus or, or convergence. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm inclined to think that there are lots of concerns about this. Um, I don't know if that's exactly the arguments that y you were referring to there. Um, I mean, having said that, I, I think there are plenty of cases where this is probably okay. So, um, in some domains, if if we're, the goal is not to like track the truth anyway, then um, it doesn't really matter. Uh, like the fact that intuition isn't reliable or isn't truth tracking just doesn't matter. So, in the moral domain, um, it's hard to see like it's hard to see how to avoid the method of cases. Um, you know, how else are we going to judge different moral theories if not through like, you know, coming up with cases, seeing what those theories entail and then considering our moral intuitions and, I don't know, working with some sort of like reflective equilibrium. I mean, you know, I, like what's the alternative, right? Um, it's, it's hard to see how to evaluate different moral theories without appealing to moral intuitions at, on some level. Um, and it also doesn't matter if, like me, you are inclined towards moral anti-realism and you think that um, moral theories are like judged by their practical utility and, and so on, then, um, or rather not moral theory, I, I shouldn't say that, sorry, that was sloppy. What I mean is that morality, like it doesn't matter that morality isn't getting at the truth, right? It has a practical justification. So we can view morality as a kind of useful fiction. If you think that, then it's fine, right? It's fine to use intuitions. Um, the point isn't to um, get at what the moral facts are. So in that sort of situation, okay, fine, right? It's so perfectly, perfectly reasonable to uh, adopt that method. Um, but yeah, I mean, like more, more generally, um, I think my concerns about intuition, uh, that's one of the things that makes me more inclined towards conceptual engineering rather than conceptual analysis. Um, I also, I, I guess I also sort of think like, like who cares, right? I mean, who cares what the concept of knowledge is? Um, there's actually good reason, I think, to expect that concept to be defective. So like, why would we even care about like providing a correct analysis of this. I mean, that's not really that interesting. Um, really, the goal should be to come up with like new concepts, right, that, that do a better job, uh, that, that sort of perform the function better. Or it should be to take the concept of knowledge and precisify it so that it can um, perform the function better. It doesn't really matter if um, those analyses end up delivering counterintuitive results in bizarre scenarios. Um, so, 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 yeah. I, I, I think that I tend to be on the more skeptical side when it comes to intuition. It's, it's fine. Um, well, probably fine if we're not even trying to like track truths. But even then, um, I think there's probably more use to conceptual engineering than conceptual analysis. Um, Right, well, I, I guess that answers that question. So I will move on to the next one. Ilan42, what are your views on the pragmatist philosophy of C.S. Peirce? 
Well, I really haven't read much Peirce. I, when I did try to read Peirce, I, I, I don't like him as a writer. Um, I can say that my orientation is pragmatist in some ways, in fact, in some very significant ways. I think the really deep disagreement between myself and the pragmatists is that I want to draw a pretty strict distinction between success and truth, whereas pragmatists want to obscure this, right? Um, uh, or in some sense, they're going to say that like truth just amounts to success. So with Peirce, uh, that's expressed in the idea that truths are those that will be accepted at the end of inquiry. You know, what is it? The, 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 the opinion that is fated to be agreed upon by all those who investigate or something along those lines or like like once investigation is at its end right so um the the thought is that like there's certain types of success that are just constitutive of truth there's nothing more to say about truth um i yeah and i i mean i i think that this is just wrong i, I don't think this is a useful way of thinking about um truth i think you can have First of all, a universal consensus on a useful falsehood. Um, it seems at least in principle possible that, you know, yeah, we, we might have a theory of the world which is, um, which like delivers maybe the right results about all the observable phenomena and which is, right, simple and easy to apply, uh, you know, and it provides like unifications of lots of different phenomena and so on, but that is just wrong. Like, I think that's, that's conceivable and, <laughs> Uh, it seems to me perfectly reasonable uh, in that imagined situation for somebody to take uh, an agnostic view uh, of whether the theory does in fact correctly describe the world beyond the observable. So, you know, you can have like, like consensus, success uh, with respect to something that's false. Um, and I would even say furthermore that like I think that actually you can have truth without success because I think you can have beliefs that um, do not stand up to investigation, beliefs that would not be accepted at the end of inquiry, but that are true. Um, so to use an example which I've used earlier in this, in this AMA, um, I would say it's true that the table is flat. The table in front of me, the table is flat. I think that's true. Um, but of course I can investigate this and uh, the course of that investigation will reveal that in fact what I've said is an idealization um, and so it's not like it's not strictly speaking true of course when I say that it's true that the table is fat I'm not speaking strictly um, it's it's true enough it's an approximation um, but you know you can you can investigate this and find all sorts of bumps and ridges and you know it turns out okay um, like what what I said was you know it was it was either just true and imprecise or so it's it's like true that the table is flat, but it's imprecise. Or we can say that the statement was precise, but uh, it wasn't strictly speaking true. Um, but you know, either way, when I say the table is flat, I don't have a precise, true claim about the world, and yet um, it's still true. Um, so truth need not involve uh, kind of unassailability in all contexts imaginable, unassailability at the end of inquiry. Um, now, of course, I'm, I'm just talking about like Peirce's view of truth here. I'm aware that there are other pragmatists view of truth, but hopefully this like illustrates the point, right? Like I do want to draw a pretty strict distinction between success and truth in a way that I think a lot of pragmatists would, um, would resist. Um, and there are more specific problems with Peirce's definition. I mean, like the, the very idea of an end of inquiry, I think, is kind of nonsensical. Uh, uh, it's also like unclear in its motivation insofar as it, it's when you start talking about things like the end of inquiry, you remove any practical utility from the concept of truth. Um, we're no more able to identify what the end of inquiry is than we are able to identify correspondence with objective facts. In fact, I think we can um, identify correspondence with objective facts, whereas we certainly can't identify uh, the end of inquiry. So yeah, anyway, um, I'm, I guess, rambling now. The key point um, is, I think that there's, that where I disagree with pragmatists is in my uh, view on the relation between success and truth. On the other hand, I have spoken to pragmatists to other pragmatists who've told me that actually the pragmatist tradition um, 
does not differ from me in this respect, and that pragmatists uh, do draw s distinctions between success and truth. Um, so, who knows? Um, that's, that's my answer. El Torco, how open would you be to reconsidering the axioms of your life is bad argument, namely that living as a wage slave and or perpetual uni student in a first world country is not in fact a good life at all. The only reason we have to think that it is, is that it's a relatively high status life as compared with say a Peruvian wage slave or a Nigerian wage slave. Good examples of arguments for that position are at the beginning of Graeber and when grows the dawn of everything including that apparently people who live part of their lives in modern Western society and another part among traditional Native American societies tended to pick the latter, and that European societies at the time seemed to Native North Americans appallingly unfree and unhappy. Um, you seem to be assuming that I think that being a wage slave or being a perpetual uni student in a first world country is a good life, but I don't think that. I think it's terrible life. Um, I think my life totally sucks. So. <laughs> Like that was the point. That was that was one of the things I was saying in my video. I, I think I have an awful life. Um, so I'm not really sure uh, what it is I'm supposed to be reconsidering here. It seems like, you know, I mean, it seems like we we agree on this. Yeah, I mean, um, yes. I, the, the 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 reason why I make these points about um, like the material comforts is because I'm well aware that when I express pessimistic conclusions, you know, it can seem sort of insensitive, right? Like, because there are loads of people in the world who just don't have this stuff and like they have the same problems as me but they have a whole load of other problems as well right I mean like what what we th unless you think like I don't know being a wage slave working 16 hours a day in sulfur mines is better than than this I mean it's like I don't think that's that's really the case right like so there's there's a whole lot of people in the world who have it a hell of a lot worse. Um, that's that's all I'm pointing out here, right? Like, there are lots of good things about my life, but they don't make my life good. My life fucking sucks. I mean, it's really bad. Uh, at least in my view. At least that's the view I have when I engage in reflection about my life. Um, so uh, it, it's just that, yeah, I, I do think that most lives are worse. Now, I, perhaps there are societies in which people do not have generally bad lives. Um, I suspect that one of the reasons why my life is so bad is, I mean, like m maybe for instance, like community makes a difference. I mean, I don't really have any friends. Um, maybe if I did, that would that, that would change my evaluation. Um, I'm, 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 I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm open to the idea that like living in small scale societies um, as like say Native American societies, maybe it was just a hell of a lot better. Maybe there was some sense in which they had access to like happiness or some sense of freedom or autonomy that we don't have. On the other hand, I mean, like, I don't know, I don't want to be too rosy about this, right? I mean, like they, they, they had a lot of problems as well. Their lives were short, they often went hungry, there's a lot of hard work involved. Um, yeah, I, I, I do worry that like some some of the the uh, people who are inclined towards like primitivism and stuff tend to overstate. They, they tend to have a, a romanticized view of what hunter gatherer life was like. Well, I guess actually Native Americans weren't hunter gatherers, were they? But um, y you know, life in small scale societies, right? I mean, it can be a bit romanticized. Um, on the other hand, of course, people there's, you know, people can also be far too negative about it. It, it wasn't as bad as some people say, but I, I don't think it was as good as, as uh, some of the more romantic views make it out to be either. Um, but then, you know, with respect to material comforts, well, it doesn't seem like material comforts actually provide any happiness in any substantial sense, or at least they don't for me, right? <laughs> Like, because I, I have all of the material comforts, but I'm not, uh, I don't evaluate my life as being good. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, it may just be that there are completely different things that would make for a good life um, that would be m more accessible in, say, the sort of lifestyles that Native Americans had prior to uh, the European 
uh, conquest of the Americas. So um, I'm, I'm open to that. But I still would say that even if that's true, I'm pretty sure most lives on the planet today fucking suck because uh, most people live in, you know, industrial civilization. Um, and so even if life outside of industrial civilization is preferable, well, you know, maybe, but that's not available to most of us. So, you know, it still mostly sucks. Emerson, what are your thoughts on phenomenal conservatism? I'd love to see you in a conversation with humor. Yeah, I mean, I've thought about uh, contacting him. A few people have asked me to contact him. I'm just kind of like, I'm just kind of busy, you know, so I, I haven't got around to it yet. Um, and there are other people who like want to talk to me and etc. cetera. Um, as for phenomenal conservatism, I I don't really have a problem with it as like a general principle. I mean, I think that it's 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 like yeah, it's fine, right? People, I I have problems with the notion of justification. I don't think belief, I don't think rational belief really requires justification. But um, it is true that look, we come into the world with a certain body of opinion, and it's perfectly reasonable to just rely on that opinion, you know, to rely on whatever beliefs you happen to come into the world with. Um, in that sense, I think phenomenal conservatism is getting at something right. I mean, it's hard to see what you, like, how you could do otherwise. Um, I don't think phenomenal conservatism supports the sort of conclusions that humour draws from it. Um, I also think that one issue, like, there's, there's issues with the notion of things like seeming, um, you know, when humour makes claims about what seems to be the case with respect to, you know, moral judgments. I think that he's like packing much more in there than, you know, so like to say that, for instance, it seems to be the case that torturing babies is wrong. Um, yes, in a sense, but I don't think that sense really supports moral realism. Um, uh, seemings are very open to interpretation. So like, does it seem to me that I have hands? Well, yes. Does it seem to me that I'm not a brain in a vat? Well, no, right? Like, actually, that it doesn't seem to me. So, in a sense, like, seemings are sort of contradictory um, because, you know, one of those has to be false, right? Like, if I, if, if there's an external world and I have hands, then it's false that I'm a brain in a vat. But it just depends on what I consider. Um, I get both seemings. So, I think that, yeah, first of all, seemings don't usually support very substantive conclusions, because in many contexts, such as the case of sceptical arguments, um, we can just identify contradictory seemings that are like just as available to us. Um, so in the case of sceptical arguments, I can say, yes, it seems to be the case that I have hands, but it also, you know, like, it, it seems to be the case in just the same sense that I'm a brain in a vat. Um, I don't know, maybe other people don't have this, but like when I, like when I encounter things like those, when I encounter those skeptical hypotheses, um, my reaction to them is like, yeah, I mean, I have no way of identifying whether or not that's true or false. Um, that like the world would seem the same way regardless, right? So, um, so that's one issue, like seemings are contradictory. And then the other issue, as I, as I mentioned, is that, um, if you claim, for instance, uh, that it seems to be the case that torturing babies is wrong, well, I can accept that, but I don't think that's enough to get you to uh, moral realism. Um, it would have to seem to be the case that like, it is a fact that torturing babies is wrong, or it is true that torturing babies is wrong, and that doesn't seem to be the case to me. Um, so the sort of conclusions that humour draws from phenomenal conservatism, I just think are too strong. Um, uh, hopefully that made sense. I feel like that was a lot more kind of rambling and confused than it really needed to be. But, you know, that's what happens when people talk off the top of their head sometimes. Um, so, yeah, uh, you're just going to have to live with it. That's my answer. Etta Karine, have you encountered Friston's work on free energy principle? Um, no, I have not. And so uh, your other question, do I have any thoughts about it? I, I have no thoughts. I've never encountered it. What's your view on the ontological status of information? I have no thoughts whatsoever. I've read nothing about this. Um, so, sorry, uh, I lit I just can't comment. Um, I'll attire, is the word, is the world flat? I don't know. Is that a joke question? Um, I mean, if you're talking about contemporary flat earth theory, that is obviously nonsensical. 
but you know, I, I'm, I'll try to take this question seriously. Um, like, can we make sense of uh, some, can, can, is there some sense to the idea that, 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 that the world is flat? Um, again, you know, like, like flat earth theory is obvious nonsense, but look, um, we, all, we all engage in idealization, right? Um, so if I ask, what is the shape of the earth? Well, you might say a globe, uh, but that's false. Um, that's that's not that's not a like cor that's not a true precise description of the shape of the Earth. Um, in fact, you might say it's an oblate spheroid. Um, it kind of bulges at the equator. Uh, but again, strictly speaking, that's also false uh, because you know on that sphere there's like lots of like ups and downs and bumps and ridges well, mountains and valleys and so on that, again, like, so, you know, we have these models of the shape of the earth, every single one is an idealization. And there's lots of different idealizations we might use for different purposes. Sometimes, you know, we appeal to idealizations that aren't even attempting to, that, that, like not even attempting to be true. Like we're intentionally building falsehoods into them. So, you know, we can model the earth as a geoid where that is the, shape that the ocean would take under Earth's gravity alone. So I think, or rather like Earth's gravity and Earth's rotation alone, if you were to remove the wind and the tides and so on. So um, it's, it's like the way that the shape of, you know, water covering the surface um, just under the influence of gravity and the tides. Now in that case, we're not actually even attempting to describe the actual shape of the Earth, right? Um, the point of this is uh, it's tracking the distribution of mass within the Earth. So, you know, we this is an idealization that tells us something about the Earth, tells us something important about the Earth, um, and it tells us something about the shape of the Earth. Um, but you know, we're building falsehoods into the description. So many there are many models of the Earth that make all sorts of different idealizations for different purposes, um, and so even today when we talk about the shape of the Earth right like we we don't aim for like the perfect description and in fact there isn't any such thing as the perfect description now suppose that you are living in a small agrarian community where nobody ever moves far away there are, there's no long range navigation nobody has any need to consider uh, theoretical questions you know um when when people in this community talk of the earth and the world uh, they, they're just talking of like environments with which they are familiar. From that, from their point of view, um, it seems like in the same way that for us, you know, it's, it's true enough for us that the earth is a globe, right? Like in most situations when we talk about the earth, it's true enough to say that the earth is a sphere. Um, even though we know that that's an idealization, we know that that's strictly speaking false. It's true enough. In the same way in this, you know, small agrarian community, um, to say the world is flat, that looks like it's going to count as true enough. Um, uh, it's, it's true enough because flat is an idealized way of referring to a, of like representing a relevant property of the surface of the world. Um, so when you ask, is the world flat? Um, that is, that is how we might make sense uh, of, uh, that is how that might be a sensible claim to make. I mean, obviously, if you're talking about flat earth theory, I don't think that's something to be taken seriously. Um, but if we're talking in terms of, you know, idealizations for particular purposes, um, then, you know, maybe there is some sense to be had uh, of the idea that the world might be flat. Um, from certain perspectives in certain communities. Um, Philippe, what do you think about this allegation that science is one of the most successful philosophical projects? Well, this idea that science developed out of philosophy, I suppose that in some sense it's true, but I'm not sure that, I mean, like, you know, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a thing that, you, you know, people sometimes use to like needle the scientists with, but at the end of the day, I I, I don't think this uh, <laughs> I don't think this is really a very like substantive point. I mean, so yes, science developed from philosophy, but it doesn't follow that science is philosophy, right? Like I 
developed from a fetus, but I'm not a fetus. Um, the US developed from British colonies, but the US is not Britain. It's not part of Britain anymore. Um, so, you know, in the same way, just because like we can we can look in the past and see how science developed from philosophical inquiry, it doesn't mean that science just is philosophy. Um, and I would also say that even in the past, uh, there were still distinctions being drawn between different areas of inquiry. Of course, they didn't distinguish things in quite the way that we did. Uh, the term science didn't exist uh, until relatively recently. Um, but like even even back in the past, people would distinguish between like first philosophy and natural philosophy. And what they called natural philosophy looks a lot like what we call science. Uh, there were areas of inquiry that were more practical, more experimental. Like you can go back to even back in you know ancient Greece, right? So you had you know people talking about realms of platonic forms you had people talking about ethics etc and you also had people doing astronomy right constructing models of the motions of the planets right i mean so i i, I think that <laughs> like although they may not have had the term science back then we can still see them engaging in certain forms of inquiry that you know, we would say are perhaps closer to science and maybe modern science developed more out of those forms of inquiry. Like, so modern science probably has more in common with the ancient Greeks who were constructing models of the motions of the planets than it does with the ancient Greeks who were talking about, you know, the form of goodness, the platonic form of goodness, right? Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm not sure I, that that allegation is... is um, yeah, it's it's not that substantive, I, I don't think. Uh, Ferdia, how much bitches you be getting? Uh, well, how many how many bitches be I getting? How best to express the number? I mean, it's it's hard to express the number in a way that would be sort of intuitive to people. Um, so, have you ever seen the original cover of Hendrix's Electric Ladyland? Like, look, go and look that up, right? It's it's a cover with all the naked women, okay? Now, count the number of naked women on that cover, okay? Front and back, okay? Count the number of naked women, and then multiply that number by zero, and that will give you your golden number. Um, flaming Hell. In a few videos, you have talked about the topic of suicide and the fact that you think dying is worse than living, even though you are a pessimist, seems rather odd to me. My question, therefore, is what makes death so bad, and is it objectively bad or subjective? Well, I don't think anything is objectively bad. I'm a, I'm a really hardcore anti-realist when it comes to uh, values and morality and all that stuff, so I, I don't claim anything is objectively bad. Um, so why do I think dying is worse? Well, because, number one, um, and I, this is the big one, <laughs> Um, because I'm just scared of non-existence. It's as simple as that. I, 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 I just want to keep existing. Um, there isn't really any further reason for it. It's just a brute fact of my psychology. And I don't think it's particularly rare for that to be a like brute fact of people's psychology. There's, there's plenty of people um, <coughs> who, who are just scared of death. And it, it, I think that, you know, it makes perfect sense, right? Like, it, it, when you think about... Um, the evolutionary history of, uh, you know, like we, we, we are biological organisms. And I mean, I don't know if any piece of evolutionary psychology is plausible. It's surely plausible that <laughs> the fear of death would have some sort of evolutionary background, right? Like organisms that have a fear of death are more likely to survive and reproduce than the organisms that just don't give a shit about death. Right. Like if you just I mean, it's really easy to die. Right. Um, in order to stay alive, that takes a lot of work and it takes um, a lot of, you know, sometimes you've got to be careful. Right. Like it takes a lot of intelligence, takes a lot of work. And so if you just don't care, like if an organism just doesn't give a shit, if it has no like drive to avoid death, then um, things ain't going to work out too well for it, are they? I mean, imagine a human being who just doesn't care whether they live or die. Uh, you just... I don't know, you just like walk out of a window rather than take the stairs. Um, or you'd, you know, maybe like drive your car at like 150 miles an hour or whatever, if you genuinely just didn't care whether you live or die. Um, so you wouldn't last very long. So f with that in mind, then it's um, 
all I'm saying is, I think it's perfectly understandable why I just have a fear of death. Now, that may well, you might say in some sense that like, that's irrational or whatever, but like I still have it. Like even if it is irrational, it's still there. And I, I, I just see it as a kind of brute fact of my psychology. Just I just don't want to die. Um, that's one point. I mean, there are other reasons as well. So like I'm driven, and this is something I talked about in the video on pessimism, I'm driven to attempt to acquire positive things. Now, just because I evaluate that my life is bad, that doesn't take that drive away. I still have the drive to acquire positive things. Um, even though that usually fails and it usually turns out that they're not as positive as I expect them to be, I still have the drive. And if I commit suicide, then you know that would violate that, right? Like I would be acting against my desires. So, you know, that's that's why. That's why I don't commit suicide. Fountain of a philosopher. Assuming you have a greater interest in analytic philosophy, how would you explain that appeal? Would you and how would you if so justify the importance of clearer and formalised ideas rather than those that include allegory or are just notorious for being hard to pin down? Do you find it unfortunate that thinkers who also make literature, e.g. Camus, get more attention as thinkers than Hume or Frege? Uh, I don't really think about it. I don't really feel any need to justify the importance of the sort of philosophical topics that I'm engaged by. I mean, I just find analytic philosophy interesting in itself. Um, that's it. I just like it. I find it interesting. I don't, I don't know, I don't, I don't really care about justifying it. I suppose like if I had to say something, I could talk about how, you know, we, it helps to cultivate critical thinking skills. It helps to, you know, be able to like evaluate arguments to, to make precise so what, like when when say a politician is giving an argument well you know it's useful to be able to like figure out what exactly they're saying and then see what the argument maybe it's useful to do that um and maybe the sort of skills that you cultivate doing analytic philosophy help you to do that um i mean i feel that kind of thing is probably bullshit though i don't think we really need to get into any like technical philosophical debates in order to cultivate critical thinking skills. Um, and that also doesn't rule out doing other types of philosophy, right? So even if it's the case that a certain type of analytic philosophy helps to promote critical thinking skills, um, it, that's entirely compatible with doing other types of philosophy as well. So, you know, there really isn't... Um, yeah, I, I, I don't have a justification. Um, also, what are your thoughts on Arthur Pryor? I have, uh, I have no thoughts on Arthur Pryor. I'm really not that familiar with his work. Frog Choir. Do you think there is any value or modern use for ancient philosophy outside of history of philosophy, study and general interest? Um, probably not, but those are still important. Um, and, you, you know, we, we can use history, we can draw on history to inform our own positions and arguments. Um, but I mean, like, history of philosophy and general interest um, are good reasons to engage with uh, ancient philosophy. Um, so, I, I mean, I don't, I don't think it, it necessarily needs to have any further value. Um, but, yeah, but yeah, I mean, I, 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 does it, does it like, does it matter like outside of sort of specialists? Would it really matter for, <clears throat> I don't know, somebody who's a lay person who, who hasn't, who isn't deeply interested in philosophy to read like Aristotle, probably not. I mean, um, in the same way, you know, I don't need to sit down and read like Newton, even though Newton was very influential on the sciences and that has a lot of practical utility and it has practical applications in our daily life, right? We don't really need to have people sit down and read Newton. You can do that if you're interested in the history of ideas and history of science, but it's not that important, even for practicing scientists to, to like actually read Newton's work. Um, I think the same is the case for philosophy, right? Like if you're interested in it, have a read. But if not, I'm, I'm not sure what the uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what the value would be of encouraging uh, others to uh, 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 to read it. Gavagai, do people have any kind of first person authority over their gender self-identification? If they do, what is your opinion on the nature of this f first person authority? Um, I suppose in some ways, I, I sort of think the question is maybe framed in a, in a somewhat 
in what I would see as a somewhat misleading way, because it's kind of like it's, it's framed in, in like descriptive terms, right? Like, is it the case that people have first person authority over their gender self identification? Is that the case? Um, I mean, the answer to that is like in some communities, yes, and in some communities, no. And like, it depends on the context and the community. Maybe a better question is should they have that authority? Should they be granted that authority? And well, you know, like there are different practices available here because, like I say, you know, so so there are communities where it seems that people are granted something close to just first person authority over it, where you know you <clears throat> you sort of state your gender or you state the request that you know somebody use certain pronouns, and that's just accepted, right? Um, so the question then is, should we accept those practices? Um, so I'm inclined to say in most contexts, I will accept whatever people say about, uh, you know, about, about their gender. Um, uh, I mean, I guess the way I see it is that there's just lots of different ways of like classifying people. Um, so we can think of gender as being fixed by certain biological properties. Uh, we can think of it as being fixed by chromosomes or reproductive organs or the types of gametes that a person produces. Um, and like that's, those are legitimate distinctions, right? Like there is a distinction between people who have different chromosomes. There is a distinction between uh, reproductive organs, right? Like you can classify people in that way. Um, or we can think of gender as maybe more malleable, right? Something socially constructed. Uh, we can think of gender as a product of like certain, you know, roles and responsibilities. Um, and in that case, maybe gender can be changed, but it's not just up to the individual. You don't have first person authority over that. That would, you know, there's a fact of the matter whether a person, whether a particular person exhibits the right observable properties to count as a particular gender. Um, and they could be wrong in their self-assessment. So, you know, that's a sort of more constructivist view, but you, again, there's still gonna be a fact of the matter and it's not, you're not gonna have first person authority. Well, again, you know, this is a perfectly legitimate way of classifying people. Like we can, there are distinctions um, between people that can be drawn in terms of, you know, these social roles and expectations that are associated with particular observable properties. So, you know, there's all these different ways of, of classifying people. Um, you know, you can't really, I don't really see any way of like objecting to the distinction in itself. The question is just what we're talking about when we talk about gender. Um, or I think perhaps more practically, um, which of these distinctions govern pronoun usage, for example? Well, that's not a factual question. Um, and for me, I mean, it seems, I don't know, it seems pretty easy. Like, I, I think you should generally go with the pronouns people request. Um, at least if we're talking about, like, standard pronouns, right? So, he, he, him, she, her, right? Like, I just, you go with what people request. Um, there are contexts where it's harder, right? Like, so, in the case of sports, to take the, to take an example that I, I believe there's still a controversy about this, um, yeah, I probably can't allow self-identification there. Of course, I don't really give a shit about that. Um, but, you know, for people who care about sports, um, it would be problematic, I suppose, to just to just say, like, well, it's just up to it's just up to you to decide. Right. There's, it seems like there's going to have to be um, like some sort of external authority who has a say. Um, Again, I, I, I don't care about that. I think that in most everyday situations, um, I'm pretty happy to uh, just accept what people request about how they should be referred to. Um, and if you want to call that gender, well, I mean, you know, that, that is one way of using the term gender, right? So, um, but I mean, again, the point is, is like, yeah, there's, there's loads of different distinctions between people. Um, at the end of the day, if you insist that, um, well, gender, like just by definition, is you know fixed by chromosomes, or gender just by definition is like so is this kind of socially constructed thing that's fixed by this cluster of observable properties. Um, okay, whatever, fine. Then you know, um, gender is not what 
should govern pronoun usage. Right? Um, does that make sense? I don't know, man. I'm, I'm really tired and I've been talking for a while. Maybe I should take a break. I feel like that was just rambling nonsense, but hopefully it made some sense. Um, two, what are your current thought views on the pornography slash erotic art distinction? Is it a legitimate distinction? Um, you know, I, I like the idea that I, I suggested once quite a while back. I remember suggesting that, what did I say? I think that art is like, um, it's a term that functions like an excuse to describe something as art. Uh, you're saying that it isn't open to the sort of usual standards of evaluation, where when you, when we usually evaluate things, we evaluate things in terms of how well they perform particular functions. Um, and so we hold them to standards on that basis. Like if I build a car, it has to safely and efficiently travel from place to place. And, you know, I mean, and it has to be like, uh, I don't know, um, a particular, uh, particular model or particular make or whatever. Um, but certainly there are certain things that people want from cars and, you know, you're just going to say, well, that's a bad car uh, if it fails to perform particular functions. On the other hand, if I build something that looks like a car and it's art, then it doesn't have to perform any particular functions, right? Like it doesn't need to. Uh, I could have a, an, a car as a piece of art that doesn't travel from place to place, that, that has the engine removed, and that's not a problem. Um, or if I cook pasta as food, well, it needs to be edible and tasty. But if I cook pasta as art, it doesn't need to be those things. It could be those things, but it doesn't need to be. Um, so in general, when something is art, it doesn't need to be approached in any particular way. It doesn't need to be held to any particular standards. And I think that there is a use of the term art where it's used as like a term of excuse, right? It's like, just have this thing for its own sake, right? And don't look at it as being something that needs to serve any particular functions. I like that way of thinking about art. Um, and I, I remember actually when I proposed this, uh, there were there was a mountain of objections that were probably fatal, but even so, I still like this way of thinking about art. Anyway, um, if you accept this, then you have a way of drawing the distinction between pornography and erotic art, because pornography is evaluated just in terms of whether or not it's sexually arousing. At least, you know, it's pornography is going to be uh, aimed at a particular audience, right? Obviously. If it's like gay porn, that's not going to be arousing to me, but you know, it has an audience of gay men that it should be arousing to. So um, it, it sort of has a success condition. It needs to sexually arouse its audience. Art need not do that. So erotic art um, may be repulsive. Um, it may be uh, it may be just completely neutral. I mean, you know, like Kubrick's Eyes Wide Shut is maybe maybe that's erotic art, but a lot of people would say that Eyes Wide Shut is not remotely arousing. Um, so, you know, it's not thereby failing. So yeah, um, maybe that's maybe that's a way of drawing the distinction. Um, but I'm also not really that worried about uh, what exactly the distinction is between like art and other things. Whenever I approach anything, really, I mean, my question is just, well, do I like this thing? Um, that's really what matters. Uh, so who cares whether something counts as porn or erotic art, as long as it makes you feel good, or maybe maybe it doesn't make you feel good, maybe you just find it interesting or whatever, just in itself, um, that's good enough. Three, what are some philosophical virtues to you? In particular, do you think that seriousness, um, as in defending and arguing for a position, not just because it's eccentric or bizarre or provocative, but because we want to strive to maximum a sense of that position is a philosophical virtue, and that lack of seriousness constitutes a philosophical vice? Not really. I don't see w w why we would need seriousness. I don't think that I strive to maximum ascent to any of my positions. So I suppose I am not serious. I am not a serious philosopher. Um, I actually, uh, you know, I think there's value to um, exploring the, the bizarre and provocative positions. Um, and I do a little bit of that myself. Um, but, you know, like I would say that uh, David Lewis is on the plurality of worlds is <laughs> just, a, you know, he defends a completely crazy position. I think he's completely misguided, not just in terms of the actual content of the beliefs he ends up endorsing, but in terms of the very philosophical methods that he uses. I, I think it's a I think it's a crazy book, but it's one of my favorites. Um, so, uh, no, I'm I'm not somebody who is inclined to see lack of seriousness in that sense as a vice. Four, are you ever going to post music on your channel again? Uh, I don't know, who knows? Um, 
I have no current plans to do so. Gaza Umiyad, who is your favourite Islamic philosopher? Uh, I I genuinely have n no idea. Um, if I, I mean, I guess if I do have a favourite Islamic philosopher, it would be like I've not read any Islamic philosophy. Um, I if I, if I have a favourite Islamic philosopher, it would be somebody who just happens to be Islamic. Um, but who has like done work in other areas and I honestly just I have no idea I, I suppose I've read enough philosophers that it wouldn't be surprised I mean there's probably like you know a few of them that that would be Muslims um, but I I don't know which ones they are so as I say I've not engaged with Islamic philosophy Glaucon Wrongs have you ever listened to the album Bish Bosh by Scott Walker yes I have I'm a big fan of everything by Scott Walker from the album, uh, uh, oh, what the hell was the album called? Night Flights, it was called Night Flights. Yeah, um, I was a bit confused there because it's also the name of the song. But the the Walker Brothers album, Night Flights, has like four songs by Scott Walker. Everything from then onwards, um, I just, I love. And I, I also enjoy a lot of Walker's earlier stuff, but um, like, I like it, you know. But but once you get to Night Flights, it's like, ooh, you know, it's it's gone from just being like, oh yeah, this is nice to, Oh, now there's something really interesting going on here. And then it gets even more interesting, you know. <laughs> then, it, then, it, then you get to like Climate of Hunter and Tilt and you're like, oh, now this is really interesting. Um, I think my favourite Walker album is The Drift. Uh, there's just, it's got the right sort of, it, it's just, I love the atmosphere of that album. Um, I think that by the time, with Bish Bosh, again, I, I love the atmosphere to it, but it's, what would be the word for this? I think with the drift, you can sort of get lost in the atmosphere. Whereas with Bish Bosh, um, you're kind of like it's it's um, the, the it's it's musicality, as it were. Uh, maybe that's a strange word to use for an album like that. But um, kind of it, it's like artiness, like really imposes itself on you. Like it, you can re you really. Like, you know that you're listening to, like, something that is a piece of art, something that's, like, it's like the quality of sounds, um, there's a kind of complexity to them that impose themselves on you. In, in it. Whereas with The Drift, yeah, I, I, I'm more able to sort of, it, it kind of builds up an atmosphere and I kind of get lost in it a bit more. And it maybe just resonates more emotionally for that reason. Um, whereas, yeah, I, I, may, I don't know if this makes any fucking sense. Um, I need to take a little bit of a break, actually. So I'm, I'm going to do that right now. So I'm going to pause this just here. <clears throat> okay. Ha ha ha. Lol. Oh, one, oh, one, oh, one. I've been thinking about reduction and emergence lately. What do you think about reduction and how it relates to the unity of science? I think you might, I think you might reject the unity of science for other reasons. Yes, I do. Um, but I don't think I've heard you talk about this issue specifically. I mean, I don't talk about it that much because, um, I mean, there's different types, so there's, you know, different ways of thinking about reductionism. As a claim about the structure of science, it just seems obviously implausible at this point. Um, I think, there are, you know, there are contexts where reductionism works well, um, so lower level theories, as it were, tend to give us good information about how higher level uh, entities do what they do. Like, you know, you it, it, it tells us how it is that they perform the sorts of functions they perform. But they don't, so what the like lower level theories don't usually tell us is, they don't usually tell us what it is that those higher level entities do. They're not, so it's like, and this could just be an epistemic problem, right? Like it's just beyond our capacity to track uh, all of the, you know, facts uh, about the entities on the lower level. Um, certainly it's beyond our capacity to track all of the facts about fundamental particles. Um, and so, you know, you can't really use that to form predictions about what higher level entities are going to do over the long run, um, you know. So um, if, you, if you're just, you know, talking about relations between theories, relations between types of explanations and so on, I think there's good reason to think that reductionism <coughs> um, is not going to take place universally, generally. Um, because theories need to be applicable and intelligible. Um, so, and then, and then as a metaphysical claim, um, well, I'm just agnostic about it. Um, 
Actually, I, I suppose, you know, I say I'm just agnostic about it, but there's a sort of a deeper point here, and maybe I shouldn't say I'm agnostic. Um, I mean, I'm a constructivist about, like, about the the observable world. Uh, I think that, you know, there's plenty of objects in the in the observable world, plenty of properties, but, you know, we draw the boundaries, we construct those objects. Uh, if we take the world to be metaphysically constituted by, you know, fundamental particles, fermions and bosons, whatever, um, then in a sense that amounts to the elimination of ordinary objects and properties because those ordinary objects and properties are products of our cognitive activity they're products of like idealizing and simplifying um, and drawing boundaries and that's not something that's being done by the world itself on, on a fundamental level so maybe there is a, a Maybe there's a deeper objection to sort of metaphysical uh, uh, reductionism there. I'm not sure. I haven't thought about it that much. It just occurred to me. But maybe that's something to think about. Um, <clears throat> relatedly, there's an interesting issue about normativity in living systems because from the perspective of an organism, there are clearly things that are good or bad for it. Um, I was wondering about this and how it relates to the Azort gap. Okay. Um, so you say there are clearly things that are good or bad for it. Uh, really? Because, I mean, I think that's clearly false. Um, so I, 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 I disagree. I don't, think there's, I don't think there's like clearly... I mean, like, not if you're saying that there's like some facts of the matter. I mean, sure, when I... I mean, like, I, can, I can evaluate things as being good or bad, but... Um, I mean, I, I don't know, dude. I'm not, I'm not like a... I'm not inclined to sort of naturalism about value and I'm certainly not inclined to think that, that yeah there's like some fact of the matter about what's good or bad it's a bit so when you say like from the perspective of an organism I mean sure like different different people can adopt different stances with respect to values um, but yeah I, 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 I don't I'm not sure what you're getting at there to be honest um, hedonic minimalist I found your video on pessimism quite interesting and I like to make philosophy videos on that topic too. I have some questions regarding your views on the rationality of making plans to euthanize oneself if one is confronted with a major tragedy in their life like a serious non-lethal illness that would cause a ton of suffering in their life like AIDS for example. Um, in your past, I'm pretty sure AIDS is lethal, uh, isn't it? I mean, well it can be lethal. I mean AIDS is like, I mean HIV is non-lethal but once you get AIDS, aren't you kind of fucked at that point? Um, in your past videos, I believe you have mentioned that you find the idea of death to be terrifying and that makes you dislike the idea of suicide. Um, but I have another question about that. My question is, given that pessimism is true and that there is, well, pessimism isn't true. I mean, like, let's, whoa there, whoa there. Let's, let's not start committing ourselves to uh, realism about value. Let's not start supposing that there's actually truths about this. Um, Anyway, uh, my question is, given that pessimism is true and that there isn't an afterlife, wouldn't fear of death be as irrational as fear of a harmless spider? Wouldn't a person that refuses to euthanize themselves because they fear death be similar to a person that refuses to leave their house because a spider is sitting in front of their door? Well, <laughs> maybe. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> if it's irrational, like, who cares? I mean, I still fear death. I mean, it may be irrational, but so what? I still have the fear. I don't want to die. So that's that. Uh, I don't really care whether that's irrational or not. Um, but, you know, look, what do we mean when we say that something is irrational? Um, my goal is to continue living, okay? So life might be really shitty, but I want to carry on. Um, for one thing, there are loads of things that I want to achieve, things that I want to do, things I want to experience. Now, life may well be mostly negative, and it may well be the case that when I achieve the things I want, I don't get as much pleasure as I expect etc. That all can be true, but still there are some positive things in life and I still want to experience them. So, you know, I have goals, um, the achievement of which requires me to be alive, so death isn't harmless, right? Like it would prevent me from, you know, I'm, I want to continue living and I want to continue living in order to achieve certain goals, death would get in the way of that. It would prevent me from fulfilling um, various desires and getting things that I want. So, you know, I mean, I, I'm not sure. I don't really see that as being harmless. Um, so, you know, yeah, I, 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 I fear death. And I mean, so then the question is, it might be, well, 
maybe what's irrational here is the goals that I have. Like maybe I shouldn't have, maybe my goal should be death. Uh, given my pessimistic evaluation of the quality of life, maybe my goal should be death rather than having like goals that require me to keep on living. Um, but the thing is, I don't really see any particular goal as being irrational in itself. I mean, at least if, if the goal is, you know, consistent and achievable and so on, then I'm not sure I would say that that's irrational. Maybe it would be like if if my goal would be to I don't know like have more positive experiences than negative ones or something like that. Maybe that that would count as irrational given my commitment to pessimism. But that's not really what my goal is. Like my goals are much more like just they're much more simple in a way. You know, like I want you know certain food. I just want to eat certain food, or I want to have sex, or I want to read a book like that's those are the sort of goals that I have um, and I don't think that it, those goals in themselves can count as irrational so given that I have perfectly you know, rationally acceptable goals and given that death would get in the way of me achieving those goals um, seems perfectly rational to fear death um, you, you continue also given that death is inevitable could pessimists not could could pessimists justify not wanting to control how they die by doing research on euthanasia and training themselves to be ready when use it when needed i uh, given that death is inevitable could pessimists justify not wanting to control how they die i'm not sure what that that means when you say not wanting to control so we're imagining are we imagining pessimists who don't want to control the time of their death um I mean, I, like, well, either way, I mean, I don't know why you would need to justify either one, right? So if you want to, if you want to control how you die by doing research on euthanasia, that seems entirely rationally uh, acceptable. Um, I, I don't think there'd be any, I don't know, I, I don't see what justification would be required for that. Similarly, if you don't want to control it, if you just don't want to think about it, as is the case with me, actually, I mean, I, I just would prefer not to think about death. I don't really see what sort of justification would be required for that. Um, <laughs> you know you do what you want uh, it seems it seems seems fine either way whatever works for you um <clears throat> humane hancock uh, i have a thought experiment i would like to hear you answer let's say you have to choose between pressing two buttons if you press button a a random human will suffer with a very mild headache for 20 seconds if you press button b a random pig will experience the worst torture imaginable indefinitely which button would you press nobody else finds out which button you press and no other human is impacted by your decision um, nobody else finds out which button I press. Well, uh, they would find out, wouldn't they? Because you just asked me on a public AMA. So I'm going to I'm going to accept this thought experiment. I'm going to accept it and and work with it as you have presented it. Um, and and the way that you have presented it is that no one else finds out which button I've pressed. So um, I have answered the question in my head, um, but I'm not going to answer publicly because otherwise. I would be failing to engage with the thought expect with the hypothetical as it has been presented by you. I would say it shouldn't be too difficult to figure out what my stance here is. Um, well, actually, no, maybe it would be difficult because on the one hand, I don't give a shit about the pig. But on the other hand, I also don't really care that much about random humans. Um, so <laughs> and, you know, maybe uh, it would be quite amusing to give a random human a mild headache for 20 seconds. That doesn't seem Seem like a very big deal. I've had mild headaches for 20 seconds before. It's not really a problem. So um, I, I don't. I wouldn't feel too many, too many, too bad about doing that to somebody. It might give me a bit of amusement. Um, who knows? So who knows what I would do? But the 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 the, the point is, I'm I can't tell you given the way you set up the thought experiment. So uh, <laughs> thank you for um, giving me a nice hypothetical to consider inside my own head. Um, ignotium per Ignotius. Do you see professional academic philosophy as something continuing on past the end of this century? I, 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 like, I, I find it hard to imagine like what the world is going to look like at the end of this century. It, 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 seems, it seems like we're going in a pretty bad direction. Uh, but you know what, man? Philosophy has survived through a whole lot of bad shit, hasn't it? I mean, philosophy has been around for thousands of years. We had Black Death, we had famine, um, we we had all sorts of natural disasters, we had wars and revolutions, and people have been philosophizing through most of that. I mean, philosophy has survived through a lot of it. Uh, so 
I, I guess in some form or another, as long as you've got humans, you're probably going to have humans doing philosophy. Now, whether it will be professional academic philosophy is, is another matter entirely. That, that maybe, maybe not. I mean, honestly, I, by the end of this century, it's who knows what will happen. Uh, it would be cool if civilization continues. Well, maybe it would be cool. I don't know. I'm actually increasingly on the fence about that one. But um, <laughs> uh, it, it would be it would be bad if there's like just a massive societal collapse. Right. So uh, hopefully that won't happen, but maybe it will. And if that happens, I'm not sure uh, there'd be much use for professional academic philosophers or any real place for them to work. Um, so I I don't know. I don't have an opinion on whether it will continue. But as I say, philosophy has, as a, as a tradition, has survived through a lot of bad stuff. JC Benson, have you considered publishing in a zine? It's alarmingly fun, and there's nothing like having a well-edited uh, well fold of papers to hand out. Uh, I've never considered that. I don't really know how. I'm not sure what the point would be. Um, and the question, when will you dive into Eastern philosophy? I don't know. I mean, I did have a discussion with a dude who's into the Zen thing recently, but uh, I wouldn't hold your breath on this one because um, it takes an enormous amount of time. Like, I, I don't have time. There's like so much stuff out there and I don't have time to do 10% of it, right? There's so much wonderful philosophy or maybe it's not wonderful, but there's so much philosophy out there that I want to get into. I want to study. I want to make videos on. I want to write articles about and I just don't have time. So diving into Eastern philosophy, I don't know. I wouldn't hold your breath on that ever happening. Jamando Ondame, what do you think about Bernardo Castrop's arguments for idealism? I have no idea what those arguments are. What do you think about Arnold Zuboff's arguments for there being only one self? Again, I have no idea what those arguments are, but I am, uh, I can say that I'm a, um, a sort of pragmatist or constructivist about selves and personhood. Um, and I think that, you know, that sort of, <laughs> that would kind of have to be true under under one self views as well, right? Like, if you think that um, ultimately there's only one self, uh, that like all human beings are what, like aspects of the same person or something, um, well, th like from a practical point of view, um, we still have to distinguish between like different people and you know they have like different rights and and responsibilities and so on right so just practically speaking we sort of organize society in that way it's hard to see what the alternative is really i mean i don't know maybe there is an alternative but it's again it's, it's sort of hard to see it it's kind of like the idea of like distinct persons distinct selves is sort of baked into our language i mean even as i'm saying this right i use words like i and our and you and we and it's very hard to stop doing that um so you know there are distinctions that we're drawing there i see that i see those distinctions as being kind of purely driven by like whatever's pragmatic right whatever whatever works um i don't think there's like some deeper fact about what selves or persons are um so in and so in that sense i would reject one self views and then i would add that even if you do accept one self views it looks like you're going to have to give a pragmatic account of the language anyway. Um, so, uh, are distinctions truth apt? Well, maybe not the distinction itself, but a statement of a distinction. Uh, sure, um, I'm not. I'm not sure what the motivation would be for denying that. Um, when I say that there's a distinction between you know, men and women, or red and blue, or <laughs> like computers and cars, hands and feet, you know, I mean, like, okay, you can, what would be the motivation of saying that statements of those distinctions are not truth apt? Uh, because, I mean, there's, it seems like we're describing differences in the world. I mean, I suppose, like, conceptually, of course, you could, uh, you know, you could, you can just come up with a concept that you define any way you like. So, um, I suppose in that sense, like, definitions are not truth apt. Uh, right, like definitions are just, um, that's just a matter of how you want to use language. You can just stipulate a definition. Um, but if we're trying to describe a distinction in the world, then that seems truth apt. 
Would you ever ask for help or advice by someone in the server when making a video regarding political theory? Uh, maybe. I mean, I've never sort of, I don't know, I, I've, I've never really asked for help before, but it's not like I'm opposed to asking for help. Um, what makes life worth living, if not the willingness to live life itself? If there is something else, then someone justified in, if there is, if there is nothing else, isn't someone justified in committing suicide if they consider their life to not be worth living? Or can we be somehow right in expecting to live, people to live lives that aren't worth living? Uh, I'm, I mean, I, I don't know what makes life worth living. I'm not really sure my life is worth living. Um, some people maybe are just sort of constituted differently so that they get more pleasure out of stuff. Um, maybe their lives are worth living. Uh, as for suicide, I, mean, I, I don't have a, any general objection to suicide. I think suicide can be problematic in cases where somebody has um, significant responsibilities to others. Like if you have a kid that's, you know, three years old, that's... So this is just like a kind of an extreme case, right? Like you're living in a house, you're in the house with a kid that's three years old and you commit suicide and there's nobody else in the house. Well, that's obviously going to be a big problem because the kid might die. So that's, you know, you're neglecting your responsibilities to the kid. And so there are similar situations where, you know, I think people have responsibilities to others and so they shouldn't commit suicide. I, I would have a problem with them doing that. Um, but, uh, you know, for, for like in, in many cases, as long as there's not somebody who you know, requires you, you know, as long as there's not somebody you're responsible for who requires you to be there in order that they, you know, stay alive, like a three-year-old kid. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, like, I, I don't, I don't have a general objection to, um, to, to suicide. Um, so, yeah, I just, I don't, I don't object to that. So, um, I don't expect people to continue to live like to live lives that aren't worth living, uh, as it were, or even lives that are worth living. I mean, maybe you think your life is worth living, but you decide to commit suicide anyway. I mean, uh, you know, it doesn't matter. It's up to you. Um, Johannes Scholl, um, on your view, is it immoral to press the on button on a conscious, low, rational, infinite pain machine? Um, the moral framework you described in your Animals Don't Matter video seems not to care. No, I don't think that's immoral. Um, John Holmes, you say you don't believe in metaphysics as a discipline, and yet you take an anti-realist position on a number of topics. Is your anti-realism not itself a metaphysical position? Well, I'm using the term metaphysics. When I, when I talk about metaphysics, I'm usually using the term in a fairly specific way. So the problem with metaphysics, as I see it, and I think this is the case for m many people who have empiricist orientations, the problem with metaphysics is specifically explanation by postulation. So that is what philosophers will often do is they will explain a discourse by postulating a realm of entities beyond experience of which the discourse provides true descriptions. That kind of explanation by postulation, right? And, you know, there's like various objections to that that empiricists are going to have, but like that's the target, right? Now, it is true that anti-realist positions sometimes involve, broadly speaking, metaphysical commitments. So if I'm a moral non-cognitivist and I think that, you know, moral statements are just expressions of like values or attitudes or something like that or plans or whatever. OK, there are no objective moral facts. And then in saying there are no objective moral facts, that's a, that's a kind of metaphysics, isn't it? Um, you know, but here's the thing. When I say that there are no objective moral facts, well, first of all, that just sort of follows as, I mean, that's just a kind of very straightforward entailment from the, um, you know, from the account of the meaning of moral statements that I've been given. But more importantly, um, I'm not like explaining moral discourse by postulating this realm of entities beyond experience of which moral discourse provides true descriptions. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, and, and, and so I think there is an important distinction here, right? That, like you can call anti-realist positions metaphysical if you want, but there's still an important distinction here. And um, so when I say that, you know, I'm resistant to metaphysics or I'm agnostic about metaphysical hypotheses, etc., cetera, um, like I'm talking about that practice of explanation by postulation. Uh, uh, if you just happen to hold I mean, in principle, like you, you could, for instance, just be a moral realist because um, like you just that's just the belief that you happen to come into the world with. Right. And um, 
maybe you just haven't seen any good arguments against it or something like that or maybe it's uh i i don't know you find it intuitively appealing um i mean i don't know if i even would sort of see that as being problematic if you're not like as long as if if you're not sort of supposing that like the way of making sense of moral discourse is that it like s provides truths about some realm of moral facts um yeah that's not such a big deal um so hopefully that answers that question uh justice what's your position on ontological nihilism uh well yeah, I I am an empiricist. I don't really go in for this sort of metaphysics. I think that it's worth taking seriously if we're interested in metaphysics, though. I mean, what I can say actually about ontological nihilism is I, I do think that um, there are forms of ontological nihilism which provide very interesting sort of images of the world, um, images which are worth kind of exploring for their own sake, perhaps. Uh, so, you know, the ontic structural realists, who say that there are no objects, only structure, um, who appeal to the kind of arguments from like scientific realism debate and from physics, um, you know, that provides a, like a completely different sort of view of the world from the sort of metaphysical assumptions that are perhaps made by, you know, more, I guess, common sense theories, or like the idea that maybe there are no objects, only qualities, or the idea that uh, nothing has, so if you if you sort of take the view that there are no composite objects that nothing has parts and then you combine that with the view that there's no fundamental level to reality that um, maybe everything can be divided continuously uh, everything divides forever it seems like both of those could be true well then you know you end up with a, an ontology on which there are just no objects um, so all of these views I think they provide alternatives to object-oriented metaphysics, which I suppose I can appeal to uh, in defending an agnosticism about metaphysics, right? Like the, the very fact that, you know, we can construct these images which are perhaps, you know, coherent, coherent images, where there's no particular reason to favour these over the object-oriented metaphysics, and there's no particular reason to favour object-oriented metaphysics over, the, over these ones. Um, you know that 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 helps uh i guess to defend a sort of skeptical position so i suppose it's it's worth uh exploring these positions because if if you if again if you have a sort of coherent alternative metaphysical hypothesis then that's going to help defend skepticism with respect to metaphysics um but i i don't endorse ontological nihilism and yeah i mean in in general i tend to be fairly skeptical of these sorts of metaphysical claims. Okay, somebody with a Russian name says, what do you think about Aristotelian society? I'm not really sure what this refers to. Do you mean, do you mean like the Aristotelian society, the philosophy society in London, or are we talking about something in ancient Greece? Um, I mean, I, I guess the uh, Aristotelian society is pretty cool. Good philosophy goes on there. So yeah, I, I like them. I'm not sure about what else that might refer to. Kenneth Goetz, do you think the existence of causal closure is fatal to moral realism? No moral naturalism seems to work. Any non-natural moral properties would be unable to influence human action since they would be non-physical. Is it fatal? Well, I mean, probably not fatal because just in general, uh, there are no knockdown arguments in philosophy, or at least if there are, there are very, very few of them. Um, and I don't think that's one of them, uh, but uh, I find that to be a pretty serious problem, yeah. Um, I think the problem with moral non-naturalism, uh, one of the big problems with it is that it provides us with a view of the moral realm that cuts us off from the moral facts. So on the one hand, it's trying to explain the, like, the use of moral discourse by treating it as providing, you know, true descriptions of moral properties, but then it gives us a picture of moral properties which makes it very unclear how we could come to uh, have how we could come to like know what the truths about them are um that's a problem um you know like do moral realists need causal influence uh do they need moral properties to have a causal influence well probably not i mean the moral the moral facts are supposed to tell us you know what we ought and ought not to do they don't like make us do it 
um, at least not for many moral realists. Uh, you know, so so it's not like it's not like you you need causal influence, but it is a problem epistemically. You know, it creates an epistemic problem when you are postulating a realm of facts um, that just has no connection to uh, uh, our sort of the tools that we have to learn about those facts. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's a puzzle there. I don't, I wouldn't say it's fatal just because, uh, again, like th there are never any fatal arguments in philosophy, uh, but I think it's a pretty serious problem. Crichton SP, what is your favorite video game? I, I don't play video games, um, so I have none. Curly Q, do you have any knowledge or interest in philosophy of semiotics? Uh, n no, I've never done that. I know nothing about it. Lane, are you an epistemic anti-realist? I believe so, in brackets. And if so, how would you describe your view and your motivations for it? So, you know, I've sometimes endorsed epistemic anti-realism um, as a response to the Companions and Guilt argument. I mean, really, the only context in which I ever talk about epistemic anti-realism is when I'm defending moral, real moral anti-realism and somebody raises the Companions and Guilt arguments. Now, you know, look, so what I... What I say is, okay, right, moral judgments seem to involve this commitment to categorical reasons, right, reasons for action that are independent of our desires, but there are no categorical reasons for action. Um, so then the objection is always, well, you know, what about categorical reasons for belief, right? If you, if you reject categorical normativity, you are committed to epistemic anti-realism. Um, so I think that, like, I mean, look, I don't really know if I'm an epistemic anti-realist. I'm, I'm inclined to it. I think that all we really... So I, I'm inclined to it if we think that epistemic judgments involve a commitment to categorical normativity. If epistemic judgments involve a commitment to categorical normativity in the same way that moral judgments involve a, a commitment to categorical normativity, then fine, I'm an epistemic anti-realist in the same way that I'm a moral anti-realist. Um, but I think all we really need for, you know like the practice of epistemic judgments to be, you, you know, to be sort of justifiable, as it were, or to be vindicated. I think all we really need are desires with respect to belief formation and non-normative non evidential support relations. And I think we can have both of those things. And then, you know, with that in place, you can make various claims about what you ought and ought not to believe. Um, so uh, having said that, I also think that there are reasons to take seriously the notion of categorical reasons for belief that don't generalise to categorical reasons for action. So, I mean, I suppose my official position maybe is epistemic anti-realist, but I would say that the reasons to be a moral anti-realist, there, there are more reasons to be a moral anti-realist than there are to be an epistemic anti-realist. I think the case for moral anti-realism is better than the case for epistemic anti-realism. And if I was, you know, pushed towards epistemic realism, um, I don't think that would really change my evaluation uh, of moral anti-realism. I think I would still be a moral anti-realist and I'd pretty much still be just as strong in that position. So what I'm saying is, uh, you know, I, I kind of have two responses to the Companions and Guilt argument. First of all, the first response is, um, well, <laughs> yeah, they are Companions in Guilt because actually, right, there just is no categorical normativity, right? So there, the, the, there are no categorical reasons for belief either. Um, but also, um, moral norms and epistemic norms are not really on a par because we can make sense of categorical reasons for belief in a way that we can't make sense of categorical reasons for action. So. Here's, here's a, a couple of ideas for, uh, about how this might work. So in the case of, um, <clears throat> so, so the, the idea is right, categorical reasons are desire independent reasons. Now, in the case of belief, belief in some sense aims at truth, right? So this, may, this might be why uh, belief evolved, right? So it's like organisms need to represent their environments, uh, at least with a reasonable degree of accuracy in certain respects. Um, and so, you know, like we have this capacity for uh, representing the world, right? And like the, the point of that is to get at what's going on in the world, at least again, in, in certain respects. And I, I mean, furthermore, just like in practice, given the way that we you know, actually use terms like belief, it, it would make very little sense to say something like, um, 
x is true, but I don't believe x. Or I believe x, but x is not true. Right? Like that would just seem incoherent. Somebody who says that would sort of just not be making sense to us. It would be hard to understand what they really mean. You, 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 you would need to ask for further information on how on earth they're using these terms. Um, so, you know, to imagine somebody who um, like acknowledges acknowledges that the earth is not that it is true that the earth is a globe right but that who believes that the earth is flat because i don't know because they want to or because they don't care about truth that just seems bizarre right um so the point is that an argument to the effect that a proposition is true just is an argument for believing that proposition um and that's the case regardless of your desires. It's the case because of the way belief works. Um, so it's just like, the, just the nature of belief is such that an argument to the effect that a proposition is true just is an argument for believing the proposition. Um, again, regardless of what your desires are, it doesn't matter what you do, even if you don't care about truth, it's still the case that uh, an argument for the, so like if you don't care about truth, that, that would be, I suppose, a reason for just not holding beliefs at all. Um, but, it wouldn't make sense to say that a proposition is not true, but that you believe it. Um, now, consider categorical reasons for action, right? Reasons for action that obtain, regardless of your desires. We can't say the same sort of thing here because action doesn't aim at anything, right? So like in the case of belief, we can say, well, like there's, there's some sense in which belief aims at truth but action doesn't aim at anything actions can be you know other regarding or they can be entirely self-regarding um there's like nothing in the nature of action uh that makes it the case that actions you know aim to uh, uh be such that you know, aim to sort of satisfy the desires of others or aim to consider the welfare welfare of others or aim to be moral or anything like that you know people often uh, act in ways that they take to be immoral. People often act in ways that they take to be selfish uh, and so on. Um, so that may be one way of sort of capturing the notion of like categorical reasons for belief, right? Because belief aims at truth. So, you know, if you have an argument to the effect that the proposition is true, you have an argument for believing that proposition. But this kind of thing doesn't work with action because action just, well, you know, an action can aim at anything. So that's one idea. Um, another idea is that epistemic norms um, can be brought against the tribunal of experience in a way that it seems like moral norms can't. Um, so we judge, we judge theories and we judge the epistemic norms by which we judge theories right, by testing them empirically. And if there are certain norms epistemic norms that tend not to produce empirically successful theories, well, we change them. And I mean, this has in fact happened. Uh, in the past, uh, there was a requirement, like in, in the sort of early years of the scientific revolution, there was a requirement that um, theories had to give kind of mechanistically acceptable explanations. They had to provide explanations in terms of like pushing and pulling and, you know, atoms colliding and so on. And so, you know, Descartes' vortex theory of gravity, uh, which explained gravity in terms of like vortexes of particles, well, that was a kind of mechanistic explanation of gravity. That was, um, in that respect, better than Newtonian mechanics, but Newtonian mechanics triumphed empirically. And Newtonian mechanics, with all of its occult forces, well, we just gave up on the, uh, the, the norm of providing mechanistic explanation. So um, it seems like there's a, some sense in which uh, epistemic norms are kind of tested um, against experience in a way, again, it seems like moral norms maybe aren't. So <clears throat> yeah, I mean, the, the, the point of all of this is that um, I think that, we, that there's probably a better case to be had um, for uh, categorical normativity in the epistemic realm than there is in the moral realm. Um, again, I hope I hope that was clear. I mean, I'm I'm being I, again that was kind of brief. I want to do another video on this. I've I've sort of got uh, it half written. Um, another video on um, the the topic of like epistemic versus moral normativity. Um, but hopefully that made sense. Uh, Lilith Edge, there's a lot of talk about rational agents and rational self-reflection throughout philosophy. I find it hard to make heads nor tails of this concept. 
if it is simply about acting in accordance to one's first order goals, then surely every agent would be rational, since at any given moment they are acting in accordance with whatever goals they have at that moment. So is it about consistency over time? Does that mean people who change their minds are irrational? Is it about a second order reflection of one's first order goals? I'm not sure if there is a fact of the matter in that realm of self-reflection. Can two rational agents with the same values slash goals come to different conclusions slash actions? So my question is perhaps, what is your view of rationality slash rational self-reflection? Likewise, do you know of any introductory material on the subject? Um, the, the, well, <laughs> what is rationality? I mean, that's a huge question. It's like, that's, that's like all of epistemology and philosophy of action. I think this maybe is, is the problem. I mean, I might suggest that the way to, to deal with this, right, is like forget about this question and maybe focus on, on smaller questions. Um, so, you know, because like if, if, if you're talking about like ra rational belief and rational self-reflection and action and so on, like, again, this is just a huge field that covers a whole load of different things. Um, it feels like this is basically the whole field of epistemology. So with respect to introductory material, it's kind of hard to say. It's like, well, you know, it's, it's like epistemology, you know, that, that might be that might be where the where the problem is, maybe. I mean, maybe instead of thinking about like rationality, broadly speaking, you should think, OK, let's look at something more specific, such as, I don't know, say testimony, right? Under what circumstances are we justified in trusting the testimony of other people? And then maybe, you know, after going through a whole load of different topics, you know, you can kind of build up some sense of what like rationality in general is. Um, I mean, so, yeah, I, I think that that the problem here is that like this is already a topic of discussion, but it's split into subfields. So you've got rational belief, rational action, maybe rational emotion, rational goals. Um, and then if you just take one of those, so rational belief, well, um, within that field, you've got, OK, deductive inference, inductive inference, um, memory, testimony. Uh, yeah, there's like the. There are questions about when it's justified and like what counts as appropriate belief formation in all of these cases. Um, if you're talking about, I mean, so so yeah, I like it's it's very hard to talk about this in general, and I I wonder if maybe um, I mean I I don't think I can talk about it in general, and my advice maybe would be to um, <laughs> maybe not maybe not worry about this and focus on more specific topics. I suppose that. You know, consistency in some sense has to be a constraint. Um, it, it needs to be possible for your beliefs to turn out to be true. It needs to be possible for your goals to be achievable. And, you know, if it's inconsistent, right, if you hold inconsistent beliefs or you hold inconsistent goals or whatever, then you know from the outset that that's not going to be possible. Like, I can't have the goal of, I don't know, like, if I have, have the goal of uh, sort of both, what? both like driving a car and not driving a car then i am never going to achieve both of them at least you know like at the same time in the same place etc um so you know as for what the other constraints might be um again it's 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 a huge topic i tend to be uh like i, I tend to think people can rationally have whatever goals they like i'm not really convinced that there's anything irrational about um like there's lots of examples that philosophers use. Um, so, you know, there's the example of future Tuesday indifference where somebody um, will choose, uh, like they would, they would prefer to have, you know, an hour of extreme agony on a Tuesday over a very, very mild pain on a Monday. And a lot of philosophers think that's just irrational in itself. I'm not really convinced that, I, so I, 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 I I, I don't know though. I mean, again, it's, it's just hard to talk about this. It's it's such a big thing. So yeah, my, my general tendency is to think that people, there's nothing necessarily irrational about any goal. As long as your goals are consistent, you can have pretty much whatever goal you want. But then as, as you point out, you know, you can change your goals, right? So it's not like you need to have consistency over time. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I, I wish I could say more about this, but um, I just, I, I can't. Uh, uh, sorry, that wasn't a very good answer. 
I'm sort of tempted to stop this and re-record it, but um, I like I can't really be bothered. So sorry about that. I'm afraid you're just going to have to live with that kind of crap answer. Um, can I say? No, I'm just going to have to move on. I'm sorry. I I can't. And this is. It's just. It's like. It's like the whole field of epistemology. So I don't, I don't know what, like, yeah, it's, that's why it's hard to talk about. Okay, Luke Cronquist, do you see applications of higher logics outside of computing? Where, how do you see technical advances of philosophy being applied to life? Um, no, I do not. I do not see any, like, no. I mean, I, I can't see how you're going to apply, um, like, technical, formal logic to everyday life. That, that seems um, very implausible. Um, bonus question, what would a modern school of Athens look like? Um, this channel, right? Let's just take this channel and make it bigger. We can make this into a modern school of Athens. But of course, without the whole like pederasty thing that the ancient Greeks did. We, we, let's not do that. We'll put that to one side. But like everything else, we can, we, we can do it in this channel. So um, that's all you need. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I don't know, actually. I, I don't know. I don't even know what the older school of Athens look like. I don't really know ancient philosophy that well. So um, I'm not really sure how to uh, transfer that to the modern world. Uh, Luna asks, how do you know if something is true? Whew, that's, a, that's a big question, isn't it? I mean, it depends on the context. Uh, OK, how do I know that, say, there is a computer in front of me? I mean, the answer to that is going to be very different to how do I know that my brother enjoys rap music. And the answer to that is going to be different to how do I know that the Earth is a globe? Uh, that's very different to how do I know that gold melts at, uh, what is it, 1,000 and something degrees? Um, well, apparently I don't know that because I can't remember it. So, you know, but yeah, like how do I know that gold melts at such and such? How do I know that moral non-naturalism is false? I mean, there's not going to be um, a like general answer to this unless we say things. You know, we can say things like in very vague terms. You sort of, well, you use you know perceptual data and reasoning, and so broadly speaking, right? By applying these tools, um, that's how we figure out what's true. But uh, I mean, more specifically, um, I don't think anything substantive can be said. Uh, it really just depends on what the particular problem is. Um, I mean, it's interesting because I think even as a philosopher, you uh, you sort of quite, it, it's pretty rare that you really consider this in any detail, right? Like if I ask, how do I know that there's a computer in front of me? Um, I mean, it is just, well, you know, like, I can say a bit about what a computer is, right? Like I have a definition of computer and I can, you know, I have perceptual data uh, of the thing in front of me, and I can see that this like matches the definition. Um, I, I'm confident that my definition is the sort of common one because I've, I'm an English speaker and I've talked about computers with other people without any kind of misunderstanding. So, you know, like I assume that I'm using it in the standard sense, and yeah, I uh, I can just have like perceptual contact with this thing. Um, but even that is not a very detailed answer, right? Um, so yeah, uh, it's, I don't, I don't think there's like a general answer to this. Uh, Majesty of Reason, if you could make everyone interested in philosophy read one or two books in any field of philosophy, what would they be and why? It's pretty... It's pretty, uh, pretty authoritarian. I don't have those sorts of inclinations. I have no desire to make everybody read one or two, one or two books in any area of philosophy. Um, I'm not sure what would really be gained from doing that, to be honest. Um, what would I? What benefit would come from making everyone who's interested in philosophy read one or two books? Um, you know, I'm trying to think of like. I mean, it's not, what, what am I even aiming to achieve here? Um, am I trying to make people, like, change their views to be more in line with what I think the facts are? Um, I'm not sure that 
reading one or two books is is likely to do that. Uh, I mean, it might might have some effect, but philosophers can be very sort of you know philosophers have got great very critical attitudes, right? Like making if I if I take one or two books that I think are um, you know basically right, and I make every philosopher read them. Um, there's there's a good enough chance that that will actually end up pushing philosophers further away from the facts because you know because of the fact that we tend to be really critical of stuff they'll read those books and they'll like you know come up with objections to the views um, and so end up becoming like more resistant to those views. Um, um, but again, I'm not, I don't have the aim of making philosophers uh, all agree with each other. I, I I like the fact that there's you know a variety of ideas that I can engage with. So, I mean, that's not really my aim. Um, so the answer is, I, I just don't know. I don't think that, I don't think I can choose. I don't really like this because when people ask these sorts of questions, I do try to just answer the question. Like, I just try to take it at face value and just give an answer. Um, but like, I would literally just be choosing books completely randomly. Um, I really don't have any inclination um, about what the answer would be. What would your answer be and why? I mean, I'm, I'm asking you now. Uh, like, why, what, what books would you make every philosopher read? And like, what, what is it that motivates you to, why, why do you want every philosopher to read these one or two books? Um, I mean, I'm curious what the sort of, yeah, I'm curious about the motivation um, there. Uh, manner bros, some Nozick questions that have been bugging me. Number one, isn't his answer to the Locke Proviso problem of his justice and acquisition system blatantly consequentialist and accordingly quite contradictory to his anti-consequentialism? So, um, okay, I'm just trying to, I'm going by memory here because I couldn't be bothered to like look all of this up before, uh, <laughs> before like making a few notes about it. So, um, I could be wrong about this, but okay. What's the point of the Lockean proviso? The point is to ensure that we don't worsen the situation of others. And I, I take it that the issue there is that, you know, everybody kind of has, so before anybody acquires any sort of land or property, before anybody acquires natural resources, everybody has essentially like the rights to use them, right? So previously I was free to use the land as I wished. Um, and, and then the question, is how people come to acquire property rights, right? What is it that allows somebody the right to exclude others from the use of that land? What is it that allows somebody the right to exclude me from use of that land, where previously I was free to use the land? Um, so the idea is, well, it's okay as long as it doesn't make anyone else worse off. Now, or at least it doesn't make anyone else worse off relative to where they would be if nobody had acquired the land. Um, now obviously in answering that we're going to need to show that a like free market system will have a tendency to you know sort of level everybody up. Um, you know it will have the tendency to like the rising tide uh, raises up all the boats um, and of course that's going to seem like a consequentialist argument. Indeed that is that will appeal to cons like that will appeal essentially to consequentialist reasoning um, but I'm not sure if it's I'm not sure if it's contradictory. I mean, I tend to think that mor morality in general is sort of subject to a, an unresolvable tension between consequentialist and deontological thinking. So I'm, I'd be very pleased if it was uh, contradictory, but I'm, I'm not sure that it is. Does it? Because the question is again, like how people come to acquire property rights, and as long as, yeah. And then the issue is that I, uh, like individual, why am I doing this? I don't know the answer to this question. I don't know what the point is of me saying this stuff when I don't know. I mean, like, but I mean, I guess it's because I should know, right? Because I've read Nozick, I made a video on Nozick. So this is the kind of thing I should know, but I don't, I don't know. I don't know, maybe it is contradictory. Um, I feel like this is the kind of thing though, that it's like, if it was contradictory, he surely would have noticed that because it's kind of an obvious point, right? Like, I mean, it's not as though, it's not like this is something we really have to work hard to find out about the commitments of his views. Like he's very open about this, you know, it's, it's like explicitly stated in the Lockean proviso itself. So, um, 
yeah, I, I don't, like, it It would be surprising if that was just a blatant contradiction, right? If Nozick missed that, because Nozick wasn't stupid. I mean, he was kind of crazy, but he wasn't stupid. Number two, isn't the famous Wilt Chamberlain argument quite blatantly a fallacy of composition? I don't think so. So, um, so the... So I guess I guess the reason why it might be thought to be a fallacy of composition is you might say, well, you, what Nozick is doing is he's inferring that... So from the fact that uh, individual interactions just to the claim that the overall distribution of holdings is just. Um, and like, that's not a legitimate, you know, that's not a legitimate inference. But I don't think that's quite what Nozick is doing in the argument. So I think Nozick is... First of all, he's assuming that a distribution of holdings is unjust only if it results from the unjust interactions between individuals. Now, you might well disagree with that, right? I mean, you might, yeah. So yeah, you can you can disagree with that. But given that assumption, um, the Wilt Chamberlain argument seems to work perfectly fine, right? Like all hold all Nozick needs to do to get to his conclusion then is to show that um, the interactions between individuals are perfectly just. I mean, and in general, like Nozick cares about interactions between individuals. You know, that's what he thinks is like morally relevant. Um, enforcing a kind of pattern principle or end state principle will coerce individuals. Uh, as he says, you know, liberty destroys patterns. So like that's the point of the, the Wilt Chamberlain argument. So I don't think it's a fallacy of composition. Maria Martinez asks, favourite book? Um, either Hume's Treatise or Firebend's Against Method, um, depending on my mood. Um, Michael Haag, I have a very broad question concerning the freedom of will debate. Do you consider yourself a, an incompatibilist or compatibilist? If you happen to be familiar with Peter Strawson's Freedom and Resentment, I would enjoy hearing your opinion on his take. Yeah, I'm inclined to compatibilism. I'm, yeah, I'm inclined to compatibilism, um, but I'm also I'm also perfectly happy with um, incoherentism. I am. So the reason why I'm inclined to compatibilism is because, like, look, the question is, you know, what is it that actually matters to us? You know, there are various capacities that are important um, that distinguish us from other animals. You know, the capacity for rational reflection, the uh, capacity to like form and act on second order desires, um, the ability to kind of, you know, like I have certain attitudes to others, I can consider those attitudes to others. There's, there's all of these capacities. That seems to be what matters. Like as long as somebody has those capacities, um, why isn't that enough to say that they have free will? Now, if you want to insist that free will involves far deeper commitments, like uh, in order to be free, you have to be like a cause of yourself or something, then I'm just going to say that free will is incoherent. So, you know, there is like a coherent concept in the neighbourhood here, um, and that's a compatibilist concept. Um, like, there's a difference between, on the one hand, say, a scenario where my arm is zapped, causing it to move outward and hit you in the face, like, let's call that scenario A, and then scenario B, I hate you, I feel anger towards you, I form the intention to harm you, um, and then I endorse this intentional reflection, and so I move my arm out and hit you in the face, right? Like, there's a difference between those cases, an important difference, which, you know, is relevant, which, which we consider when we make moral evaluations, and that difference obtains regardless of whether or not determinism is true. Um, the metaphysical view we have of the like underlying nature of the world makes absolutely no difference to that distinction. Um, and it seems like it's that sort of difference that we are tracking when we say that some actions are performed freely. So, you know, the the zap, the, the electric zap on my arm making it, well, that's not performed freely, whereas, um, you know, in the other case it was. Of course, that's, you know, the distinction is vague, but... Um, you know, like, that's the distinction we're tracking. Um, so, yeah, I, I think the reason, so yeah, I mean, I think free will, presumably when we talk about actions being free, this is something that's supposed to matter to us. 
Um, I think it would be bizarre if like these abstruse metaphysical debates, you know, determinism, indeterminism really made a difference. Like that's just not something that matters on an everyday basis. Um, so yeah, I mean, as for, um, as for Strawson, um, I, I guess I, I have a similar sort of take. I think Strawson's conclusion, at least uh, as I recall it, is a bit too strong because Strawson, I believe, says that like we just can't give up reactive attitudes. Um, I disagree with that. I think it's entirely possible to view other people and ourselves as being just automata, you know. Um, where we just no longer engage in these like practices of praise and blame and admiration and, and so on. Uh, I think it's possible to do that. And not only is it possible, I think that it may well be entirely rational. I don't think there's anything necessarily problematic about that. I mean, there are, there are issues, I think, with these concepts of like freedom and responsibility, such that it's not, it's not just obvious that like, that they're the right choice. Um, so the concept of free will tends to be used in support of like retributivist approaches to justice, um, to, you know, tough on crime sort of attitudes, which I think are pretty fucking stupid. I mean, like, I, I just don't think that's a useful way of uh, approaching the like penal system, for instance. But like that tends to be, yeah, like that tends to be supported by like notions of desert and responsibility. Um, so there, there, there are problems with that. And, and, I, I, and yeah, I, I think that we, you, you know, that there's a serious question about the evaluation of like the utility of free will discourse, I guess. Um, I, I, and additionally, I mean, there are, there are even like reasons. So I, I think Strawson sort of overlooks that there are reasons even within our everyday practices for abandoning free will discourse. Um, because like, I, as I said, you know, there's, there's a distinction that we're trying to track, right? There's cases where like my arm is zapped and my arm comes out versus I form an intention to harm you, etc. cetera. Um, the point is that there are certain cases where we exempt people from responsibility. Um, so what might happen is that, you know, you initially blame somebody for committing a crime but then you find out more facts about them. And as a result of that, you exempt them from responsibility. Like if say a, I don't know, like a 10 year old kid beats somebody up or steals something from a shop, but then you find out the kid is from this you know, really abusive household where he's constantly being encouraged to, you know, steal and act violently and so on. Uh, well, in that case, you know, people initially may have blamed the kid, but then, um, you know, they, they give up that attitude, right? They, they maybe transfer the blame to the parents. So like you learn more about somebody's background, you learn more facts about a person and that causes you to give up the sort of reactive attitudes that you initially had. Um, and it seems like that could just, that could go, like the more that we learn, right? If we were omniscient, um, maybe we just would give up the reactive attitudes entirely. Um, certainly, it seems like the more information we get, the more inclined we are to uh, uh, kind of stop, uh, like, like not uh, uh, hold people responsible. Um, maybe. Uh, I, I mean, so, yeah, so, so, so yeah, I mean, m m maybe even within like our everyday common sense practice of holding people responsible, because it also includes the practice of like exempting from responsibility under certain circumstances. And then we see that as we gain more and more information, we uh, are more and more inclined to see people as not responsible. Um, maybe everybody is just exempted from responsibility. So again, like free will can be um, given up. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I don't know if that really answers the question. I'm still inclined to be a compatibilist. I'm still inclined to think it's probably useful to talk in terms of like free will and responsibility and so on. But, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm open to uh, alternatives. Um, mystical Andre, what do you think about the difference principle and rules as political philosophy in general? Um, 
I don't really think anything about the difference principle. I don't. It, it, I don't have any particular intuition in favour of it. Um, I suppose my my orientation was always more towards liberty rather than like equality, fairness. But yeah, I don't. I don't. I just don't have an opinion on it. As for rules more broadly, um, I would say so. You know, there's, there's some stuff I like. I like the idea of reflective equilibrium um, as a general way of approaching like moral and political philosophy. That seems to make a lot of sense. But I, I, there are lots of problems with the details of rules as ideas, I think. Uh, when it comes to stuff like the original position, um, I would just say that, you know, I find those sorts of scenarios kind of absurd. And I just don't think there's any facts of the matter. Like what, so like what ideally rational agents would choose from behind a veil of ignorance. I just don't think there's any facts to matter about that. You can tell pretty much what any, whatever story you like. Um, and furthermore, even if there were a fact to the matter, um, th there are like different ways of describing the hypothetical. Uh, so there are different things we can hold fixed in the hypothetical scenario. Now, Rawls, in his description of the original position, right, well, he specifies that there's agreement with respect to certain goods. He specifies the certain ways of weighing those goods. He specifies that the um, the contractors are all self-interested. I mean, not like, you know, mean or anything. That, so they're not supposed to be mean, but they're also not um, particularly, they don't have any particular beneficence, you know. They're, they're just uh, interested in maximising uh, their own, like, <clears throat> their own reward um, or their own welfare. Um, and then, and then they're behind a veil of ignorance where, like, we can specify exactly what it is they don't know. So, you know, like, even if we think that in that scenario there's some facts of the matter about what the agents would choose, what sort of society they would choose, the question is, well, why do we, like, who cares? Like, why choose Rawls's description of the original position? Um, we could choose an alternative description of the original position. Um, where the agents within that original position would come to a different conclusion, as I think people have done. I mean, like, there are people who've given similar scenarios, but where the agents end up choosing utilitarianism instead of, you know, rules as principles. Uh, so it's like, yeah, rules chooses that original position rather than, you know, the other one, because that one gets him the conclusions he wants. Um, so... I just, I, I, and again, I, I don't see like why we should care about that. Like, wh why, right? Why assume that the agents who are contracting? Why assume that they're self-interested? Why assume that they agree on certain goods? Right? I mean, like, it seems poorly motivated to me. Um, thoughts on free will and consequences for moral desert theory. Well, I've just spoken about free will in response to the previous uh, uh, person who asked a question. Um, what was his name? Uh, Michael Hag. So have a look on that for my thoughts on free will. Um, as for moral, like the idea of desert, yeah, you know, I'm I'm kind of cool with the idea of free will, right? Like I'm I'm happy to be a compatibilist. When it comes to ideas of desert, I'm I'm not. I, yeah, I'm not so. I, there are problems. There are further problems there, right? Because even if you have free will, there's a whole lot of stuff that you just can't choose. Um, you're not freely able to choose the circumstances of your birth. That's pure luck. Um, plus, there's just loads of stuff that will happen to you throughout your life that you have no control over. Um, so, you know, yeah, concepts of dessert I'm not um, so keen on. But I don't really have uh, many thoughts on this. It's I, it's not a topic I've really thought about that much. Um, but I can say that I don't really tend to think of people in terms of, like, what they deserve or don't deserve. Uh, I don't really care about that, so... <laughs> Uh, would you be willing to discuss the moral status of animals with cosmic skeptic? Yeah, somebody, uh, a few people actually have asked me to get to get in touch with cosmic skeptic, which I I have done. Um, I've contacted him a couple of times, um, but he has not responded, and uh, I feel like you know I don't really want to harass people. I mean, um, you know, it's it's fine. It's not like any yeah yeah. I mean. You know, people can talk to whoever they want. Um, so, um, I think I I'm inclined to to just leave that. You know, I, again, it, it seems like I'm not really sure what the uh, 
uh, what, what the sort of etiquette is. Because it's always possible when somebody has a big channel that they just like haven't seen the emails. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I know that I'm not really the best at keeping up with my emails, and I don't have a big channel, so I'm not even getting a lot of emails. Somebody who's getting a lot of emails, it's easy to just miss them, right? But uh, even so, you know, I, I just, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't, I don't want to end up like, be, you know, being kind of pushy because that's that's not that's not reasonable, you know? So I, I'm, I'm inclined to just, to just leave this. But yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm perfectly willing to have a chat with pretty much, pretty much anybody um, uh, about that topic or any other topic, really. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Mouthy Infidel, if you are familiar, what are your thoughts on non-realist cognitivism or non-metaphysical cognitivism as espoused by Parfit and Scanlon? Do you think it provides a plausible way of reconciling realist intuitions with a more modest, <coughs> more modest ontology. Um, no, no. <laughs> no is the simple answer to that one. Um, I find it a very, very difficult position to get my head around, actually, and um, it's it's one of those cases where I sort of think, should I, you know, should I talk about this, given that I'm not sure I really understand it. Um, so, my my understanding is this, right? So the claim is going to be that there are irreducibly normative truths. Um, they're irreducibly normative, so we can't identify them with natural properties, but we're also not going to be postulating an ontology of non-natural properties. So irreducibly normative truths, but they need, the irreducibly normative moral truths need not be made true by any particular part of reality, right? It seems like we're, so we're not committing ourselves to any claim about what the truth conditions are. Um, I, it's so I guess there's the sort of two issues here um, so first of all the first issue is that Parfit wants to make a whole load of claims about the nature of these truths so he's going to claim that or you know he does claim right that moral truths hold necessarily right that they are mind independent so there's some sense in which they're objective um, that they supervene on natural facts, um, or are in, maybe they don't supervene, but in some sense they're like determined in a non-causal way by natural facts. Um, but they're also irreducible to natural facts. Okay, now, so there's a whole bunch of, you know, quite substantive claims being made about the nature of these truths. <laughs> and it's very hard to see how you can do that, right? How you can hold these sorts of positions while also saying that you're not postulating any, that you're not postulating any like normative facts or normative properties in a robust sense. Um, you know, so, so like, you, you know, you, you, you want to make a whole bunch of controversial claims about the nature of these normative truths, but without committing yourself to any substantive normative facts in the world. And I mean, look, I mean, I, I understand like Parfit and others have, uh, technical answers to this, um, you know, Parfit draws distinctions between like different types of properties. What is it? Uh, description fitting versus something else. <laughs> Uh, you know, there's different types of properties. So, you know, but I, I mean, look, I, I just don't find these answers very convincing. Um, um, he also has like analogies to mathematics and modality, which seem to operate in which seem to to me to support the exact opposite conclusion from what he wants because actually when you when when you look at mathics, ma mathematics and morality like he wants to say oh well you know these are similarly right um you know we have truths about mathematics and did i say mathematics and morality i meant mathematics and modality right so he draws an analogy to mathematics and modality right um saying there are mathematical truths, there are modal truths, but they're not made true by like facts in the world or ontologically robust facts in the world. The problem is, is when you look at the literature in philosophy of mathematics or the literature in philosophy of modality, um, oh, it turns out there's like loads of debates about the metaphysics and epistemology and so on in just the same way as there is in the moral domain. Um, like, it's not at all clear that you get mathematical and modal truths like for free, uh, you know, without ontological implications. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I think that, that one 
<clears throat> that one issue is, and, and it makes it very difficult to kind of get my head around what is even being asserted by non-realist cognitivists, is that they want to make substantive claims about the nature of moral truths. Um, and, and like once you've done that, it's, it's hard to see how you can do that without um, committing yourself to uh, 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 to like robust properties. Um, I mean, it seems like like a lot of it also another. So I guess this is like a second worry, or maybe it's just a, a, a different way of expressing the first worry. I feel like a lot of it is going to just turn on what we say about like the theory of truth. I mean, like maybe a lot of this debate isn't really a debate within metaethics. It's a debate within you know truth theory. Um, so you know we need some way of distinguishing between the like true moral propositions and the false ones. And maybe we don't want to say that like the truth conditions of moral propositions are um, you know robust facts in the world. Um, but yeah, I mean there's still there's still some sort of distinction between true moral propositions and false ones if you adopt standard naturalism or standard non-naturalism, well, you can do that very straightforwardly. Um, but, you know, okay, how do we do this on non-realist cognitivism? Well, um, it looks like we're going to have to reject correspondence theory. Um, so to say that a proposition is true, uh, at least in the moral domain, right, is not to say that it like matches some state of affairs in the world or that it corresponds to some state of affairs in the world. Um, okay, so what theory of truth are we adopting? Um, maybe deflationism. Deflationism is pretty popular. It's the, I believe, like it, it and I, I think the Phil Papers survey um, confirms this, it's like the second most popular after correspondence theory. Or is it actually the most popular? I can't, I can't remember now. Anyway, so if you're a deflationist, then you're going to say that like X is true basically just means X, right? So to assert that X is true is just to like reassert X. Um, we're not really asserting anything more. Uh, the problem with this is that like I don't see why, you know, I don't see why like an error theorist couldn't just say the same thing. So in fact, there are many error theorists who are kind of conservationists, right? So um, they think that we should just carry on holding moral beliefs. So even though, right, there are no moral properties, no moral facts, even though, like, strictly speaking, all moral beliefs are false, um, we should just carry on holding these false beliefs anyway. Um, uh, they're false in virtue of the fact that there are no normative facts. Um, but what's, un so the underlying assumption of the claim, of their claim, that all moral beliefs are false is correspondence theory. So like if you're if you're an error theorist, right, and you think that people should just carry on holding these false beliefs, the reason why those beliefs are false in your view is in virtue, partly in virtue of the fact that you endorse something like correspondence theory, where you're saying that uh, these beliefs just do not correspond to any state of affairs in the world. Um, so, so then if the debate, if, if what the uh, non-realist cognitivist is bringing to the debate is a different theory of truth, well, what's really the difference between um, non-realist cognitivists and error theorists? So it seems like non-realist cognitivists and error theorists can completely agree about all of the first order moral claims. Uh, so, you know, they may well endorse exactly the same moral theories, right? Um, they completely agree on all metaphysical claims. Um, they <clears throat> neither of them think that there are like moral properties in the world. Okay, um, and they so they're similarly they're but they're both going to prescribe that first order moral claims should be maintained. Uh, so an error theorist will say, well, they're false, but you carry on believing them anyway. Um, the non-realist cognitivist says that they're true, but they're not true in virtue of corresponding to anything in the world. Um, and I mean, so like they even agree on like the semantics in the sense that, you know, moral concepts are not reducible to natural concepts. Moral statements are not true in virtue of correspondence with moral properties and so on. The only difference seems to be that right, whereas an error theorist will say, these claims are all false, the non-realist cognitivist will say they're true. Um, but 
the reason why the non-realist cognitivist will say they're true is because the non-realist cognitivist doesn't accept correspondence theory. If you remove correspondence theory from the error theory, then the error theorist can say that moral claims are true as well. Um, like if, you, if you're a deflationist about truth, then you can be an error theorist and say that moral claims are true. Um, <clears throat> um, so uh, uh, actually a, a kind of good analogy to this is, um, is like color properties, right? So it may well be the case that when I say that grass is green, there's an assumption that like greenness is an intrinsic property of the grass. Um, and that's presumably false, or at least there's a good argument that that's false. Um, so when I make claims about color, I treat color as intrinsic properties of mind independent objects. And maybe that's false um, because you know, well, we know that actually color is, you know, a product of the particular way that like light interacts with our visual system. Uh, so maybe we're error theorists about color, but we might still want to say that claims about color can be true. Um, and so the way that you might get to truth with respect to claims about color is by adopting some, some sort of deflationism about truth. Um, you know, so by analogy, right, you can just say the same thing about, about morality. Um, once you adopt some alternative theory of truth, the error theorist can say that actually there are moral truths. Um, so, my, so yeah, the, the point is that um, it's, it's not really clear that this is actually a different position, right? Because, so I feel like this has been a bit rambly. I'm, I, I'm, I'm just going to try to state explicitly what the issue is. It seems to me that what the non-realist cognitivist is bringing to the debate is really just a different truth theory. But if, like the so, if the error theorist accepts a different truth theory, right, then the error theorist can say that moral claims are true. And I don't think that truth theory is really, you know, like a key commitment of error theory anyway. Um, um, so, so yeah, uh, I, I don't find this. Uh, particularly convincing. I mean, I don't know. That that's just the case. You know, correspondence and deflationary theory. There are, of course, other theories of truth, but um, I don't think that many of them are all that popular. Um, so, so yeah. I mean, at least if we look at it in terms of correspondence or deflationary theory of truth, uh, I I don't see a substantive distinction between the non-realist cognitivist and the error theorist. Um, so. Yeah, I, I you know there are these like technical issues with with views like this, but I I always kind of wonder what the underlying motivation is. Um, with respect to anti-realism, uh, I guess the underlying motivation is going to be well, it depends on the anti-realist, but like what's what's the sort of intuitive motivation? Well, for me, I guess the intuitive motivation is that like moral judgments seem to come from inside, you know, like when I make moral judgments, I feel them uh, I, as, as emotions. And it seems to me that other people, other people do as well. Um, there are people who, who get like fired up, right? So it seems to be coming from inside. Um, for realists, the, the underlying motivation is, I suppose, the sense of objectivity, right? Like that there are moral facts, right? That allows me to be right and other people to be wrong. What on earth is the underlying motivation for uh, <laughs> for non-realist cognitivism? What's like, again, you know, forget the technical arguments, but like what's kind of giving it the oomph? I just don't see the attraction to this view. Um, <laughs> yeah. I don't, I, don't, I don't know. So I, anyway, um, I think that answers the question. Does it? Um, do you think it provides applause? Yeah, no, that, I think the answer is no. Um, and I hope that was clear. I feel like maybe I should take a break at this point. Mr. Mister, what theory of personal identity do you think is most plausible? What do you think about the no-self theory? I've already answered this in response to somebody else. So if you look at the list of uh, answers, you know, like do a control F and and uh, you'll find personal identity in there somewhere. Um, Neuroposter, you have said that most lives are bad. If so, are there any good lives, no matter how few? If this is the case, what makes the minority of good lives good? I'm not sure if most lives are bad. Uh, like, 
I, I, I mean, look, I feel like my life is pretty shit and also that my life is better than most other people's. So, I mean, then most lives are going to be bad, at least per the standards that I'm using to evaluate the you know relative value of lives. Um, but, you know, maybe not. I mean, I don't know. There are some things that like I just don't really have that might make a significant difference. So if you have a strong community, if you have like friends and and, and relationships, um, maybe that is like what you really need. Maybe that's what sort of pushes like, I mean, humans are social animals, right? Um, so maybe if you have that, then even if loads of other things are really shitty, maybe your life is ultimately good. Uh, maybe like your your experience of life is positive. Um, I, I don't have that and my attempts to acquire that have, have been universal failures, but um, so, you know, I don't know. On, on the other hand, I am also aware that every time I've achieved something that I've wanted, it's been like not as good as I've expected. So like I might want, say, you know, I might want to be uh, involved in like a stable community and I might think that that has benefits, but then when I achieve it, maybe I just wouldn't really feel like it's actually that good. Um, as for uh, what is it that makes the minority of good lives good? Well, look, I tend to be like, so the way I think of this is kind of experientialist. I think that what matters is how experiences feel from the inside. That's my standard for judging the worth of lives. Um, and now of course, you know, experiences alone, like, you know, we want rich experiences, right? So taking a drug that just produces pleasurable sensations is probably not a good life. Most people are going to have the have the aim for a richer variety of experiences than that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think if somebody has mostly positive experiences, their life is good. Uh, that's not the case for me. Um, but maybe other people are just constituted differently so that this so that things which, you know, I find problematic or negative, they might find good. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly skeptical, but like, I also don't want to sort of project my own uh, uh, sort of psychological features onto other people. Uh, so, yeah, I don't, I don't really know uh, if most lives are bad. Um, I guess I hope they aren't. Nick T S M I N W, would you enter the castle in Sard's Hundred and Twenty Days of Sodom as one of the libertines, or if not, then as one of the people who are there to report the goings on? Um, no, that that sounds completely unappealing to me. I can't see anything good about that. Um, Nicholas Hessler, not sure if you've already addressed this question in a previous video, but what is your preferred interpretation of quantum mechanics? Well, I'm an anti-realist. I take scientific theories to be instruments for systematizing, predicting, and controlling the observable phenomena. And um, beyond that, I'm generally speaking just sort of agnostic about you know, whether they provide correct descriptions of you know, the, the uh, underlying structures and uh, natures of reality. So um, with respect to the interpretations of quantum mechanics, I am completely agnostic. I have no preferred interpretation. Um, you know, for me, it'd just be a matter of, well, you know, which, which one is the, um, <laughs> which one is the easiest to use or, or whatever. I I'd evaluate it on purely pragmatic terms like that. Um, not another Michael. Thoughts on historicism as a general critique of realism. I wonder what are your views on Foucault's notion of biopower and biopolitics and your philosophy of biology in general. And romanticist philosophy of science, especially Schelling's natural philosophy. Also, thoughts on Richard Rorty's anti-foundationalism and post-analytic and speculative realist philosophy. Well, man, there's a lot of stuff there. You know, I don't know shit about any of it. I don't know anything about most of that. Um, some of the stuff I should know about. I mean, I should know about Richard Rorty because I've read Rorty. Uh, I've, read, I've read quite a lot. And, you know, I can't remember any of it. As for Foucault, I did uh, a course where we studied Foucault, um, at least for a couple of weeks. And again, I can't remember any of it. So there's some stuff there that I should know about, um, but I just don't. I don't know anything about most of what you said. So unfortunately, I can't give an answer. Now, as for historicism and realism, well, I do have some thoughts on that. Um, so historicism is a critique of realism. I've always seen this as being kind of a category error. Um, like, so historicism, the way I've seen historicism is that it is a kind of method, right? So, so it's like, um, you know, methodological relativism in a field like anthropology. Um, as anthropologists, when we go into 
other societies, we suspend our judgments um, with respect to the cultural norms of those societies. So we, um, you know, we, we just describe the practices and norms of the societies that we are investigating. And in doing so, we set aside our own normative commitments, right? Like we don't make any judgments about what, whether what they're doing is good or bad or anything like that. Um, so methodological relativism is, you know, it's like a useful tool when investigating these societies, but this doesn't in itself tell you anything about like whether or not their norms are right or wrong, whether or not, say, moral realism is true. You can, as an anthropologist, apply methodological relativism in your work and then in some other context, uh, maybe like as a philosopher, you might well argue that the practices you described in that work are morally wrong. Or you, you might argue that they are objectively morally wrong. You might argue that there are moral facts and, you know, that society um, is in violation of the moral facts. Um, so methodological relativism doesn't tell you anything. Now, historicism, as I've seen it, it's a kind of method. It's a way of like explaining how certain practices, so it's a way of approaching a, a topics. It's uh, a way of explaining how certain practices have developed. Um, and so that in itself isn't going to tell you anything about like metaphysical and uh, epistemological frameworks like realism. Um, of course, there are, there are connections, right? Like you, you so historicists emphasize the contingency of the sciences. Well, if the content of scientific theories is contingent on, um, you know, I, I don't know, certain social, historical or cultural circumstances, then, well, maybe you've got an argument for real, against realism there. Um, or if, if we're Kuhnians, um, if, if, the, if we think the historical process reveals radical paradigm shifts, uh, world views being overturned, um, if that's like fundamental to the process of science, well, maybe that supports a kind of pessimistic induction against present theories, which would support anti-realism about them. Um, you, you know, I mean, but but then on the other hand, I mean, one can like see how certain historical discoveries like um, might actually end up supporting realism. You know, if you if you see like cumulative change over time or whatever. So. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think so. So one thing is, is that like we, we can maybe draw arguments against realism from historicist studies, um, but I'm not sure that, that historicism itself in itself provides an argument. Also, I, I think that very often a lot of these historical accounts are kind of questionable, right? So like, um, I mean, I guess the, the sort of classic source for historicist objections to realism would be Kuhn. Um, but the Kuhnian picture is at best highly simplified. Um, the Kuhnian model of scientific change, I think, is is questionable. Um, I, I don't think there's any particular reason to expect future science to um, develop in the same kind of way, um, even if uh, past science developed in that kind of way, which again, I, I think is questionable if as, as a universal claim. Um, I suspect that in retrospect, uh, the sort of revolutions in like, you know, the early 20th century, quantum revolution and general relativity and that, that will probably, they will probably seem like very unusual events. Um, I don't think that's really like a good model of, of, of sort of normal scientific change. I, I, I suspect that's, that's well, I, I don't really have any, any I, I don't have a good justification for that, but uh, you know, that's just, that's just a, a suspicion that, uh, you know, look at when people in hundreds of years, if there are still people in hundreds of years, look back, um, you know, that, that will look like uh, an anomaly um, rather than the norm. Um, so uh, yeah, anyway, the, the, I mean, the important point, I, I guess, is that I think that although there may be connections, although we may be able to draw on historicist approaches to form arguments against realism, I would still want to keep those separate, right? Historicism as uh, as method, as a kind of methodological approach, and realism as a metaphysical or epistemological framework. Um, that's my inclination. So that's my answer to that. Nuclear glue. What YouTube channels would you recommend? Well, I mean, it's very hard to answer that question because you haven't asked what you're looking for. Um, there's so many things on YouTube. Uh, and now, I mean, maybe you mean philosophy channels. I should say that uh, I don't actually watch any philosophy on YouTube, um, so I really couldn't answer that. 
Um, if you were just asking about YouTube in general, well, again, I, I don't know what your tastes are, so I can't help. Um, Onion, <clears throat> is the Sleeping Beauty problem? Are you a halver or a one-thirder? Yeah, I haven't really read enough about this. Um, I can tell you that uh, my initial intuition is to be a thirder. Um, but on a little bit of further reflection about it, and again, I haven't done a lot of reflecting about this, uh, so I kind of think that both are right. Um, it just depends on the sort of kind of perspective from which you're evaluating the question. Um, uh, <coughs> I mean, <coughs> like the probability of a coin, of a fair coin landing heads, is one half, right? That just, yeah, it is one half. And that's the fact that you just accept the probability of a fair coin landing heads is one half. The probability that it landed heads from my point of view, you know, like waking up, okay, that's one third. Um, both can be true. I mean, it's like the, the the possibility spaces, right? So I guess the Harvard would say, well, you know, there's two outcomes, right? You know, you've got heads or tails. Whereas the thirder would say there's heads on Monday versus tails on Monday versus tails on Tuesday or something like that, right? So, you know, there's sort of two outcomes where tails is the case. Um, well, yes, I mean, both are true. It, I mean, like both the correct descriptions. Um, I feel like this is probably, there's probably some reason why this is just like completely implausible as a take on this problem. Like it doesn't make any sense to say that both are right. Um, but again, please forgive me because I haven't actually read much about this. So I, I really don't know. Um, I think this is a, a sort of a fascinating problem. I just haven't read enough to actually have an informed thing to say about it. So what I'm doing is I'm just giving you my initial intuition, because um, uh, that's all I can do. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I think that if you meant like, I guess, let me put it this way. If I woke up in that situation and you asked me to like, to bet on it, I would say a third, right? Probability of heads is a third. And I suppose what really what really moves it for me is the is to imagine the scenario where like um, okay if this was repeated over and over again so um, if I repeated this over and over again right um, then yeah like most of the time if I bet that it was if if I sort of I, I do better by betting on tails as it were you know um, rather than heads. Or if we imagine that instead of waking up twice, you're woken up a hundred times, and then you repeat that over and over and over again. Um, like it seems like, yeah, you do much better by betting on tails. So I think that's what, that's what moves me to, um, to a third. But obviously, if you, like, what's the probability of a fair coin landing heads? Well, it's a half. Um, <clears throat> Papez87, what is your opinion about the relation between consciousness and perception, do you think there can, do you think there are or can be cases, maybe in zombies, sleepwalkers, blind sight patients, robots, simple organisms, where genuine perception can or does take place without experience? If so, what role do you think consciousness plays in perception? I, I mean, I, did, I mean, is there any question that there are cases like blind sight? Um, yeah, uh, I thought that was pretty well established empirically. So. Um, I don't have any idea what role consciousness plays in perception. Uh, so, sorry, this this is just not something I have any clue about. But I mean, there are cases of blind sight, aren't there? Um, yeah, I I really don't r really know philosophy of mind that well. Not anymore. Um, Patrick Wilson, what are your thoughts on Wilfred Sellers and psychological nominalism? Now this question is is interesting. See, for a lot of these questions, um, you know, I've I've had nothing to say, um, and the reason why I've had nothing to say is because I I know I know nothing. I there is there are no thoughts because there is no knowledge. Um, this is an interesting question because it's I think the first case so far where I have I have no thoughts because I just. I just don't care about the, the, I mean, like with sellers, I just don't care. Um, I, I don't, I don't know what to say about him. Uh, 
I could talk about him, but I just have nothing that's like, there's nothing in Sellers that kind of makes me think like, oh yeah, or like, oh, I disagree with that. You know, it just doesn't elicit a strong reaction from me. Um, you know, he has a bunch of complex arguments about topics that are kind of tangential to my interest, or like maybe I end up kind of agreeing with him, but for completely different reasons, or, you know, um, in cases where I disagree, oh, so, you know, his critique of traditional empiricism, I mean, in some sense, you might think, okay, I disagree with that, um, insofar as I'm an empiricist, but then I'm not a traditional empiricist, you know, and I, I, I don't know, man, I just, I, I'm very tired, and I'm very sorry, because, like, I'm trying to give substantive answers to these questions, but I just can't bring myself to, like, talk about Wilfred Sellers, I, he just doesn't move me. Um, so I'm going to move on. Pessimistic inductions. In a hypothetical future world where the majority of people, where the majority of people were naturalist non-cognitivists about ethics, what do you think the norms concerning ethics would look like? How would the average person think about disagreements, how would lawmakers justify their legal practices? In a broad and open-ended sense, what do you think society's ethical life would be like if the average person had at least a half-baked belief that moral properties supervene on or emerge from natural properties and moral claims are truth apt? Um, so, I'm, so <clears throat> I mean, so, okay, um, if people are moral anti-realists, well, I, I don't. I think it would basically be the same. I don't think. I don't think anything would really change. I don't think anything would need to change. I mean, for me, you know, this is actually one of the key points I make in favour of anti-realism all the time, which is that we don't need realism. Um, it doesn't make any real difference. Um, an anti-realist can make basically the same arguments in basically the same ways. When an anti-realist defends, so like, okay, think about this, right? How does an anti-realist defend their position? Well. You know, there are certain tools available, right? One tool available is um, we can appeal to shared values. So uh, if we're both living in the same society, if we've both been sort of brought up in the same culture, then we probably share certain values. Um, and when we make arguments, we can appeal to those shared values. Uh, if people are arguing about the moral status of abortion, right, you find them appealing to things like, you know, the right to life or the right to bodily autonomy. And you don't need to justify these claims. I mean, like, so <clears throat> you will need to justify them, right? If you're claiming the fetus has a right to life, obviously you need to justify the attribution of a right to life to the fetus. But um, the, you know, the basic idea of like a right to life, that persons have a right to life, you don't need to justify that. That's just a shared value. The question is just, you know, the difficulty then is just showing that the fetus is a person, right? So we can appeal to shared values or shared commitments. Um, a second thing we can do when engaging in moral debate is appeal to consistency. We might be able to show that there is some sort of inconsistency in the position that our opponents are taking. Um, and so in, 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 like th in that case, you know, that's not going to sort of force them to accept any particular view, but it, it may well force them to change their view if they acknowledge the inconsistency. Um, a, a classic example of this would be like um, marginal cases arguments um, in the context of animal ethics. Uh, so, you know, we can we can say, well, you know, it seems like uh, you think, yeah, so if, if you believe, for instance, that um, babies have a right to not to be killed and eaten, uh, well, there's no morally relevant difference between babies and pigs, right? Pigs have the same sort of cognitive capacities or even, you know, more sophisticated cognitive capacities than babies do. So people who make this kind of argument are trying to show that there's like an inconsistency in the commitments of um, the meat eaters. Um, or we might, we might also appeal to people's self-interest. You know, we might argue that there are certain you know, rules and norms such that accepting those rules, if everybody acts in accordance with those rules, that is uh, going to be in your self-interest. Like it's in your self-interest to endorse certain rules. It's in your self-interest um, not to like just go out and smash stuff up. Because if, if you like go out, if you just go out and smash stuff up and loot the shops, well, you know, people are good, like, if that's what people choose to do, then your house can be broken into and looted. So like we all, again, because it's in your self-interest to have like 
a stable, peaceful society. So, you know, you should act in accordance with rules that will promote that. Like, so all of these sorts of arguments are available to anti-realists. Um, and what can realists add to this, right? Like, what can, a, what can a realist add to this other than sort of, you know, stamping their foot and being like, you know, but slavery is really wrong. Um, I mean, I can give various arguments, right? Appealing to shared values, appealing to the consistency of people's positions, appealing to self-interest. Why, uh, why not to have slavery, right? Why we should have laws against slavery. What can a realist add to that other than just being like, but it's really wrong, it's objectively wrong. Um, yeah, I think the way that moral debates actually work is already in line with anti-realism. I, I don't think we would lose anything um, by losing realism. I mean, people in general, right, when people make moral claims, it's true that there are like realist intuitions, but I don't think people have like substantive meta-ethical commitments, right? Moral realism as a meta-ethical theory, this is a like technical theory proposed by philosophers. It is not just like, a kind of common sense commitment. I mean, again, like, so it's important to bear, so what I'm saying is, yes, right, there, there are going to be people who have like more or less realist intuitions. There are people who like lean in that direction, but there are also plenty of people who like lean in anti-realist directions. I mean, that's one reason I think why um, anti-realism is actually a relatively popular position, um, even among lay persons, right? The, when people start engaging with meta-ethics, there are plenty of people who lean more towards anti-realism. Um, so uh, I, I don't think that moral discourse would really need to change that much because I don't think that moral realism is like this kind of inescapable commitment of it, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, uh, society's ethical life, I don't think it would change. Um, and I don't really think any, it, would, it would change how you know, we justify laws or how we think about disagreements or anything. <sighs> Political junkie, regarding the companions and guilt argument, you've said that moral anti-realists can hold that there are reasons for belief, but maintain that they are hypothetically prescriptive and not categorically prescriptive. Okay, first of all, I think moral anti-realists can hold that there are um, categorically ca there are categorical reasons for belief. Um, they they moral anti-realists need not hold that reasons for belief are merely hypothetical reasons. Um, they can hold that there are categorical reasons for belief and that there are relevant differences between epistemic norms and moral norms. Um, whenever I am presented with the companions and guilt argument, like I tend to just accept, like, I tend to just accept an epistemic anti-realism um, because I think that's, you know, I'm, I'm inclined to think that's probably the right position. Um, but I, I don't think moral anti-realists are committed to this. I certainly don't think they're committed to it. Um, it is an, an entirely reasonable position to be, uh, to, to think that there are like categorical norms in the epistemic domain, but to still be a moral anti-realist. Um, so with that said, I will continue reading the question. However, I've seen some moral realists argue that we can't treat epistemic reasons as merely being hypothetically prescriptive because then we face a regress problem. Their argument is that if you have some normative framework that is hypothetical, they can always ask why that framework as opposed to any other. And the answer would need to be some other framework. But then they could ask again, why that one, etc., etc. And either there comes a point where that regress stops, which would be a categorical norm, or some fundamentally random act which would decide the norm, such as flipping a coin. How would you respond to this objection? I mean, first of all, I'm not sure, like, why, why wouldn't that regress just apply to everybody? Because, I mean, you can always, I mean, even if you're a realist about stuff, you can ask why that framework? Um, so it's not entirely obvious to me why it's, it's anti-realists specifically who, who, uh, who face that regress. Um, I mean, so ultimately, okay, ultimately, right, like, if we're thinking of this, um, if we're thinking of these norms as being just hypothetical, um, then we're going to say that it's like grounded in desires, say, right? So if we desire true beliefs, then we ought to believe that X, right? So an, an argument is a reason for a belief given our desire for true beliefs. Um, but why shouldn't that desire just be like brute? 
I mean, there, there doesn't need to be any further reason for it. Why would that be a problem? I mean, so, I mean, I mean if there's no regress of desires, why would there be a regress of normative frameworks? Obviously, you might say that, like, analyzing this in terms of desires doesn't work, but then that's, you know, it's a different objection, right? Um, so you say that um, you come to a point where the regress stops, which would be a categorical norm. Okay, so let's say that hypothetical norms are grounded in desires. Um, the regress stops at our fundamental desires. That's it. I mean, and then I suppose maybe the case is going to be like, oh, well, you can always ask why hold those desires rather than others. But that, I mean, there isn't like a reason for that. You just, you just have the desires you have. That's it. Um, and what's the problem with that? I mean, like, I just, yeah, I, I, I really am, I'm, I'm struggling to see um, what the problem is here, to be honest. Um, so maybe that's not a very satisfying response because I'm not sure that I have properly understood the problem. Um, but uh, that is the response I'm inclined to make. You know, as I'm speaking this, I think, like I just said, what's wrong with just stopping at desires? I think that Enoch has something to say about this, about like the arbitrariness of desires. But it always struck me that that wasn't really a big deal. I don't think it matters. And anyway, I, I yeah, um, not a very good response, but that's the response you're getting. Okay, post-human. What if hypothetically humanity became interstellar civilization and lived for trillions of years conquering the universe for its resources? But at the end, but at the end, universe became uninhabitable because of high temperature, radiation, and absence of stars. Let's say even black holes disintegrated because of Hawking radiation. We have a choice for humanity to reproduce further and try to survive in these conditions, but live in misery while knowing that attempts at this are futile, or they can use all their resources to ensure the best life possible for all remaining humans, but in exchange make humanity go voluntarily extinct. Or well, the third option is to create artificial intelligence, which will not be influenced by dangerous conditions and will continue humanity's legacy without it. What will be your choice in this matter? Um, I just don't care at all. Uh, like, I don't give a shit what humans do when I die. I don't care. Um, as, I mean, if I was there, personally, I would choose life for myself. I'd rather live a longer life um, because I'm scared of death. Uh, but as for humanity, like humanity in general, I just have, n I have no preference. So, I mean, if it's, if it's like you're presented with, you know, you can live for, you know, hundreds of thousands of years in like relatively miserable conditions, or, you know, you'll only have like a hundred years, but a really high quality of life. Well, I'd choose the hundreds of thousands in miserable conditions. I, I want as much life as possible. Um, but if it's like, you know, what what should humanity do? Well, I don't care. It's up to them. I mean, you know, I don't. I I have no preference. <sighs> Prenuptials. Why are you a one boxer when it's so clearly wrong? I mean, I have um I have explained that. In, I did a video on Newcomb's problem, and um, it was, I think, one of, I mean, I didn't really hide my opinions in that one, right? Like, I uh, I think I gave the case for one boxing. Um, I, I mean, I don't know, is this a troll question? The more I think about two boxing, the more stupid it seems. I just don't get it at all. I, I, I feel like at this point, the best explanation for it is that most philosophers are just fucking with me. Um, like, you can't possibly be serious. Um, principleship colloid. What do you think about feminist patriarchy assertion, by which I mean men over there in the past or now and here build societies that benefit men at the expense of women? Well, you know, in many other countries and in the past, I think, yep, that's clearly true. Although it's not just men that do it. Um, patriarchies are going to be usually constructed and sustained by both genders. Um, as for as for like modern UK and Europe, um, I think it's a lot less plausible. Um, there are just yeah, I I don't know. Do I really want to get into this debate? I think that, I think that there are like a lot of there are just so many ways in which women um, at this point right seem to have just like outperformed men in 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 like so many in so many respects. 
um, that it seems increasingly implausible to me to suppose that that it's like there's some sort of you know systematic discrimination against women I mean there are the thing is is that there are specific contexts where there clearly are where there clearly is this kind of systematic discrimination and so and, and these contexts tend to be quite visible so like if you look at the sort of ruling classes the ruling class as it were the very like top of society um yeah it's mostly men right it's still the case isn't it that it's mostly men who are ceos for instance but i just i don't think you can generalize from that particular social class to society as a whole and if you look at you know if you look at the middle classes you look at the poor um i'm not like there are so many ways in which women seem to be performing better than men they seem to have it better yeah i mean just outright better than men um and and plenty of ways in which they don't have it better than men but it's it's sort of at the point where it's like you know weighing up who's got it worse overall is just quite difficult so um well that's that's how it seems to me anyway um also, would you give some YouTube dislike returned browser add-on like dislike stats if some popular add-on is created? I mean, if I can be bothered to like add the thing on my browser and look through the stats, it's not. it doesn't really seem that important. What I will tell you is this. If there is ever a video I upload that has a significant number of dislikes, let's say it has more than 10% you know, dislikes, then I'll, I'll put it in a comment, you know, I'll, I'll pin a comment to express the fact that people have, you know, that there's, there's a significant number of people disliking the video. And I'll, I'll give the stats on that. But for most of my videos, I mean, it's usually, it's usually like 95% likes. And so, yeah, I mean, as, but yeah, if it's mostly, if there's a significant number of dislikes, I will tell people about that. Um, Rationality rules. Do you believe in a necessary being? If so, why? And if not, why? Um, no, I don't, uh, because none of the arguments are even remotely convincing. Um, so, I mean, all, all of the arguments involve like making just a host of really questionable assumptions about, you know, the nature of causality or the nature of necessity and contingency or... Uh, the interpretation of physical theories, you know, so like the fine tuning argument, for instance, you know, that's appealing to physical theories, but it involves like, it, there's just so many kind of controversial, questionable um, assumptions involved. There's so many ways of, of like resisting these arguments, I think. None of them are anywhere in the ballpark of being uh, convincing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I just, I don't, I don't think there's good reason to believe in these, in, in this thing. And um, once you postulate a necessary being, it's also, you also end up kind of in, incurring a whole load of like explanatory problems. I mean, so like, if people believe in the existence of a god, um, then it's not clear how to understand the properties of god in a way that's coherent with, you know, other commitments of the world view. Um, so, you know, I mean, there's, these, these problems are a bit more specific, right? Like, it does depend on what exactly, on how exactly we're conceiving of this necessary being. But generally speaking, you know, people will sort of understand God as being, you know, omniscient, right? But then how do we make that compatible with commitments to free will? Um, or, you know, you attribute omnipotence. Um, but what exactly does it mean to say that, you know, something is all powerful there are logical problems there right and so there are ways of getting around this but they they always feel quite ad hoc um so so yeah i mean there's just no convincing argument for uh, the existence of god and there are good arguments against it i think um and I, I mean actually i suppose you know you say necessary being well i mean i suppose there might be other necessary beings maybe there's a Maybe numbers exist necessarily in a realm of platonic forms or something, but um, in that case, I would just similarly say I, I don't find any arguments for that convincing. Um, so I suppose that's kind of a... <laughs> that's not a very informative answer necessarily, um, but obviously there are so many arguments for and against <coughs> the, this kind of view, um, it's very difficult to say anything specific. <laughs> Um, like I just I just don't find the arguments convincing. So 
that's basically the reason why. Um, I, I mean, there is like a more specific problem with the idea of a necessary being. Um, so uh, when we use like modal language, when we talk about necessity and contingency and possibility and so on, I have a, pr a I would say a pretty pragmatic take on this. Like, I don't think that anything in the world, that there are the objects in the world are themselves necessary or contingent. Um, so like when we, when we say that something has this kind of property of metaphysical necessity, what exactly is that supposed to mean? Well, if, so if we talk about things as being, there's a few different ways of thinking about like necessity. Okay, so we can talk about this in terms of the constraints of physical laws. Um, so, you know, we have a theory, a physical theory, and this theory will include models which specify alternative states. Um, as a simple example, I might have like a model of a pendulum and the model will describe the relation between the length and the period of the pendulum. Uh, as you increase the length of the rod, the period of, the, of its swing increases as well. Um, and so we can think of necessity and contingency in these terms, okay? So maybe we never actually increase the length of the pendulum, but we could have done um, in that it's a state that is modeled within the theory. So the theory will like tell us like if the if the rod of the pendulum is such and such long, then the period will be, you know, such and such, right? So, um, like the the theory itself kind of specifies these alternative states, um, and so we can think of necessity and contingency as specified in those terms. Um, there's possible states of the pendulum, and then there are impossible states of the of the pendulum. Um, that kind of necessity is obviously not what philosophers have in mind when they talk about necessary beings, right? It's not constraints imposed by physical laws because the physical laws could have been different. So the physical laws are not metaphysically ne 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 the physical laws are not metaphysically necessary, right? We can imagine alternative possible worlds where, you know, objects exceed the speed of light, right? We can imagine alternative possible worlds where, you know, I like increase the the, the length of the pendulum and then that, like, I don't know, causes the uh, the swing to just stop, or it causes the swing to increase like a hundred times or something, you know. So we can imagine that the physical laws are different, so they're not metaphysically ne metaphysically necessary. Um, so okay, that's not what that's not what the necessity of the necessary being is supposed to be. Alternatively, there's logical necessity. Um, or like maybe conceptual necessity where it's there are so like this follows from the meanings of our terms um, or from the laws of logic you know it's it's impossible for both a and not a to be the case um, it's impossible for a bachelor to be married because bachelor just means unmarried man um, now okay in this case we're not really treating necessity as a property of things in the world uh, you know, and it, it we don't, um, you know, people wouldn't usually think of like God as a necessary being in that sense. Um, I mean, maybe there's some who would dispute this, but I mean, I mean, like logical necessity in this sense can be just fixed by like the meanings of our terms and concepts. And that doesn't in itself tell us anything about the world. Even if, even if the concept of God included the concept of existence, as some people may argue, um, it doesn't actually follow that anything exemplifies the concept. So, you know, in, in the same way I could define the concept, I don't know, schmunicorn, I could define schmunicorn um, to mean existing unicorn, right? Well, <laughs> it wouldn't follow that there are unicorns, um, merely from the fact that I have defined the concept schmunicorn to mean existing unicorn. What that, I mean, what we would say is that the concept has no application, nothing exemplifies the concept. So, you know, e e even if you have like a concept of God that entails the concept of existence, that doesn't entail that there is a God. Right, so, um, logical necessity, that's, that doesn't work either. Um, so there's this, there's this idea of metaphysical necessity, which is supposed to be stronger than 
physical necessity, um, right? But it's it's not it's not like it's not logical necessity. Um, the key point that I'm getting at here is I don't have a clear understanding of what this kind of necessity is. Now, maybe some people do have an understanding of it, but I don't. And um, um, <laughs> I, I, I worry that uh, maybe nobody else does either. Does that make sense? Um, maybe not, because, because that seemed like it might have been a bit rambly, but hopefully that communicates something of a, of a concern. Um, you know, there are certain things that are fixed by the definitions of our terms. That doesn't tell us anything about the way the world is. There are certain things that we can take as fixed by like certain empirical theories. Um, and I think that's as much as we have a clear understanding of. And so when people start talking about like metaphysical necessity, um, I become quite suspicious. Hopefully that was, um, that was clear. Uh, I have been talking for a while now and I worry that it might not have been but okay um, Richard Sear are you a physicalist and if so how do you define physical no I'm uh, an, an empiricist um, I think that I have I mean I, I guess that there are two issues with with physicalism so one is about the coherence of the definition right what exactly are we asserting when we claim that all things are physical that's that's not so clear, right? You know, we we don't want to. Um, I mean, in, in some sense, uh, the physicalist is taking their cue from the content of science, right? But we don't want to tie um, physical to present science because we recognise that science can change in the future. I mean, we we know that like current science is not yet complete, um, so. You might say, well, the physical is just that which will be described at like the end of science or by a completed science. But then, you know, what does that mean? Like, what's the content of that? And anyway, I mean, past science um, was, you know, provided different images of the world that were also physical. Uh, Descartes, Newton, Maxwell, Einstein, right? They gave us physical worlds. I mean, at least in their scientific theories, um, obviously. You know, Descartes and Newton and so on, right? They believed in non-physical entities as well, but in their physical theories, they they gave us right physical worlds, material worlds. So there's a plurality of things, right, that count as physical, including things that are no longer countenanced in our present theories. Um, and so it's not entirely obvious what the actual content of physicalism is. Um, I mean, really, what I, I suppose what's driving physicalism is the idea that our ontological commitments should be guided by science, right? So we endorse the content of our best theories, whatever they turn out to be. Um, and then additionally, our current best theories are approximately true, right? So we've, we've got it mostly right. Um, but then the, the problem is that I mean, it's not clear that scientific theories are actually like just giving us the metaphysics, right? So it doesn't really make any difference from the point of view of science, whether we are in the matrix or whether, you know, we're all objects in the mind of God or whether, I don't know, panpsychism is true or whatever, you know, like we, we can, we can have like science will operate the same way, no matter what sort of metaphysics you plug into it. Um, so I think there are problems with specifying what exactly the commitments of, of physicalism are. Um, that's one problem. And then the second problem is that even once we have a clear idea of what this metaphysical theory is, I mean, there's just a problem of justification. I, I just don't think there's a good argument for physicalism. Uh, it, it honestly seems like, it, it seems to me to be very poorly defended. I, I, I don't think there's anything, I mean, yeah, uh, th there are very, very few arguments for it. It seems more like a, just a kind of background assumption that a lot of philosophers make. Um, although maybe not a lot, actually. There are, I guess, in increasing objections to it. But um, yeah, that doesn't really seem to me to be a good argument for it as a metaphysical thesis. Um, OK, uh, Rody 39 have you ever read Being in Time or Being in Nothingness and what's your opinion on them? 
Um, I read like extracts from them when I had to do w when I was doing my philosophy degree, um, but I mean I don't remember them anymore. So um, you know I I don't really have an opinion on them. It's not the sort of style of philosophy that I tend to do. Uh, Sam Raki, Sam Raki, how many books did you read in your life? Can you approximate? I really couldn't. I, I really have no idea. And part of it is that a lot of what I read isn't books. I mean, it's articles. Um, so, like, I just, I don't know, you know, even if I think about, like, how much have I read in my life, I, I just wouldn't be able to give an estimate of that, it, or at least it would be really hard. Um, I can't really remember what counts as, what, which things I've read were books and which were articles. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it's probably it's probably quite a lot because I do read quite a lot. Um, but beyond that, I really can't say. Uh, Shivam Misra, um, your views on Eastern mysticism and quantum mysticism. Um, I mean, quantum mysticism just seems like just kind of pseudoscience to me. Um, as for Eastern mysticism, uh, you know, I had an interesting discussion with um, a fella who's very interested in Zen. I mean, uh, it, well, I say a discussion, it was more him just informing me about, about Zen, um, which I didn't have a lot to say because, like, I it was completely new to me. And, um, you know, but it was still very interesting. And, um, yeah, I, but I don't really have thoughts on it. I, I don't have views on it. Um, it just isn't part of it's not a field that I've really engaged with enough to have any views on do you believe in God or any other supernatural phenomena no um Spezzy can you elaborate on your obviously correct previous statement that Hume was the top dog of philosophy I don't know man I just like Hume I just like Hume that's it like um what, what more is there to say? Well, I guess there is more to say. I suppose there are different ways you can look at it. You could look at it in terms of influence, right? Just influence on philosophy. Um, there's that famous quote from, I think, Whitehead that philosophy is a series of footnotes to Plato. Well, modern philosophy is a series of footnotes to Hume. Um, like, like, look at the variety of philosophers who count as Humeans, you know? I mean, I would say that I'm a Humean in a significant sense. So was David Lewis, you know, David Lewis was a Humean, very strongly inspired by Hume in many ways. Now, in the analytic tradition, um, you know, is there anyone more like opposed to me than, than David Lewis, right? He has completely different commitments, completely different ways of approaching philosophy. Um, and yet, like, we are both, we're both Humeans. There are so many people who are Humeans. Um, you know, you can sort of trace the, that line from Hume through so many different views. Um, and, and like even people who hate Hume are, I think, very often operating in Hume's shadow or like responding to Humean ideas. Um, as for why, you know, so beyond that, like beyond the influence, why do I like Hume so much? I mean, because like, first of all, he's one of the very few philosophers who, who genuinely, right, like had the inclination to follow an argument where it leads. Um, so like Hume, you know, you look at sort of Hume's sceptical arguments, right? Hume was not intuitively sceptical. I, I, I certainly don't get the sense that he had any particular desire to draw these sorts of conclusions, right? He found himself pulled to these conclusions by the force of the arguments that he was coming up with. And I mean, indeed, he, you know, he, he actually said like, he, he you know, he drew sceptical conclusions when engaging in philosophical arguments, but then the minute he left his study, um, his like intuitive common sense beliefs would reassert themselves. So, you know, like he really was just following that argument where it led him. Um, and that's, that's quite wonderful, isn't it? Um, and, then, and then of course, having accepted these sceptical conclusions, he just kind of plowed ahead anyway and found like other ways of, of proceeding. Um, of course, many of the arguments were uh, ingenious, you know, um, that they would, they were just, yeah, like he came up with a whole bunch of, you know, very powerful, very challenging ideas. 
Um, I think people understate the power of these ideas in some ways. I spoke about this in response to an earlier question. Somebody asked me about the problem of induction and you know, a lot of people see the problem of induction as this kind of abstract philosophical problem that you know we might worry about in the philosophical sem in the philosophy seminar. But then, like we go out and do, you know, in, in everyday life, we can just kind of ignore it. You know, put it to one side. Um, you just proceed using induction. Um, I actually disagree with this. I think, I think there are no inductive rules, and that this is a like condition of that all humans exist in. Um, it's not merely philosophical. It's not something that we can just you know ignore. Or oh well, you know maybe we can ignore it, but. Um, you know, in fact, like uh, the, the the sort of threats, I, I don't know, the kind of threat of of inductive failure is sort of always there. Um, and that that is something that we should kind of live live with in our everyday lives even. Um, so, you know, Hume had these very challenging ideas. Um, he had an enormous influence on other philosophers. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, like, I think that Hume, Hume was really cool. Uh, <clears throat> I guess that, that, that elaborates, does that explain it? Um, uh, Synthwave Monkey, what is your opinion on Michael Humer's philosophy? Uh, which part? Um, I mean, I think he holds like a bunch of ridiculous positions. Obviously, I reject his moral realism uh, <clears throat> um, with respect to his politics. I guess we both have like libertarian inclinations, but I move in a much more sort of left wing direction. Um, I don't know. I don't really know what more to say about that. Um, Tejas Gupta, what are some practical ways to develop critical thinking skills, specifically to evaluate arguments better? Uh, it's kind of tough to give a simple answer to this. I mean, you sort of have to, uh, you know, read uh, about formal and informal logic, so you know the different types of arguments. So you know, you need to learn how to like evaluate arguments' validity. Um, a good, I guess, practice is like um, structuring arguments into premises and conclusions. So when you're faced with like a paragraph, when somebody gives an argument written in prose, try to identify exactly what the conclusion is and then, you know, identify what the premises are and formalize them. Um, you know, it's like, that's, that's useful. Um, I, I, I mean, there, there are loads of like introductions to, you know, formal and informal logic, which a lot of them available online. It's um, worth looking up that, I think. Uh, yeah, and like just gen I mean, there are, there are introductions to critical thinking available online, so it would be worth looking into that. Um, Terry, what is wrong or right with Jackson's knowledge argument against physicalism? Well, my official position, my official position is I don't really buy that the notion of physical facts or physical properties is really coherent. So, you know, for me, the thought experiment doesn't really get off the ground. Like, you know, because we have to imagine someone who knows all the physical facts. Yeah, but I'm like, well, you know, I mean, I don't think it. You know, that doesn't like I, 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 I don't know what the what what the physical facts are. So you know, like again, we, we the thought experiment doesn't get off the ground. But then, of course, neither does its target. So you know, because I'm not a physicalist, obviously. Um, so y y yeah, that's the official position. Um, now. Putting that aside, though, right, like, I mean, I don't think it's very, like, it's a very convincing argument against physicalism. I mean, I used to be a physicalist, and as a physicalist, my response was just to deny the intuition that Mary learns anything when she leaves the room. Um, it seems, so, like, if Mary knows all the physical facts, this is me, you know, speaking as a physicalist now, if Mary knows all the physical facts, then she knows what it's like to see red. Like, that's it. I mean... Um, that was always my reaction to this. I like, I don't know why a phys why any physicalist would like accept that. Oh yeah, Mary knows all the physical facts about color vision, etc. But she like doesn't know what it's like to see red. So when she leaves the room, she learns something. Like, wait, like what? Why the hell would you accept that? That that doesn't 
Like that's not even intuitively, that doesn't even seem intuitively right to me. Um, so yeah, she doesn't learn anything on leaving the room. She knows exactly what to expect. Um, I mean, there might be an interesting question about like why some people have the intuition that, you know, she doesn't have this knowledge, but I think that we can fairly easily explain that. I mean, so, because we're describing such a strange scenario here, right? Um, why would our intuitions be reliable in this kind of scenario? I mean, I, th I suppose part of the problem is, is that when we imagine uh, Mary knowing all of the physical facts, we're imagining somebody who has, you know, like our science, but better. That's what people are imagining, right? It's like sci the science that we have, but better. But, you know, we've got to imagine somebody who knows all the physical facts, right? Our science doesn't even attempt to describe like all the physical facts. Our science is idealized, simplified, abstracted, right? You know, we construct models that are like useful to us in our condition of, you know, like epic, like massive ignorance and like there's loads of, you know, kind of problems and, and so on. Um, where am I going with this sentence? Um, our science is, idealized, simplified, and abstracted. It's constructed so as to be usable for us, right? Um, yeah. Um, and, and also it only like captures the facts from a particular point of view, or there are, it's like our science provides, you know, like structural facts usually. Uh, you know, we, we sort of, it's things that can be measured, you know. I mean, so knowing all the physical facts, right, we're not dealing with anything like our science. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if we're just assuming that she knows all the physical facts, then I think we are assuming that she knows what it's like to see red. At least that seems to me to be what a physicalist should say. And it's not just what they should say, it's what they should, like, just intuitively think as well. That should just be the immediate reaction. Um, uh, your approach to philosophy of truth. I answered this earlier in response to um, Dmitry Dujav. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that name right. Um, question, do you think that logic is a normative in itself, I not merely in conjunction with other norms? Well, no, I'm not, I'm not sure what that really even means. I mean, there are various formal systems, right? And you can construct whatever formal system you like. Uh, so why would that be normative in itself? Like if I have, you know, classical logic, paraconsistent logic, uh, you know, fuzzy logic, right? Well, I got a bunch of formal systems. Why, why is that normative? I mean, what I can do, of course, is propose one of these formal systems as uh, a theory of correct reasoning. So I can say, well, correct reasoning is not classical, right? So I suppose I'm a dialetheist. If I'm a dialetheist, then I'm going to say that, um, you know, classical logic does not, at least it's not a, like universally correct as a, the as a theory of our reasoning, okay? Because there are certain domains um, where there are true contradictions. And if you, you know, if you model those domains using classical logic, then you end up committed to trivialism. Uh, so, you know, Maybe in that case, if we're like trying to model correct reasoning, um, we might be dealing with normativity. Although even even then, I'm inclined to think that that's not normative in itself, um, because instead of thinking of the formal system as a theory of correct reasoning, we can think of it like we can think of it as a theory of truth preservation or entailment relations. Um, so, you know, if classical logic is is right, then it's a fact that contradiction. It's a fact that a contradiction entails all other propositions. Um, now, is that in itself normative? Um, I mean, we might not care about entailment or preserving truth or whatever. Um, in itself, like the fact that contradiction entails all other propositions, that doesn't seem to be a normative claim. Um, it doesn't in itself tell us that we ought not to believe contradictions, for example, nor does it tell us that from a contradiction we ought to infer anything. So, so like the mere fact that a contradiction entails everything, right, that doesn't in itself tell us anything about what we ought to infer. Um, so it seems to me. So yeah, I'm, I'm not inclined to think that logic is normative in and of itself. 
Um, the illest of villains. What is your opinion on other philosophy YouTube channels, in particular the really big ones, i.e. philosophy tube, contrapoints, just for example? I have no particular opinion. I don't really watch um, philosophy on YouTube. I have seen uh, some of the videos of contrapoints, and I quite liked them. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's pretty good. Um, but I, I really generally don't, I don't really watch other philosophers on YouTube. Um, so I don't, I, I don't know. <sighs> um, I've watched your channel for years. I've often wondered what are the viewers' philosophical demographics and opinions? Could you make a video where you gauge the philosophical views of a channel through a survey similar to the fill papers or something like that? Yeah, I just, I don't know what the point would be. I doubt there'd be enough of a response to tell us anything interesting. I mean, I, I don't think, I imagine that like you'd only get like 50 people responding. I just, I'm not, I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure there would be any point to it designing that um yeah maybe though maybe i could how would i do that <laughs> like what just like ask people to respond in the youtube comments or something um i don't think they'd get i don't think there'd be much of a response and the reason why i say that is because i've already uploaded videos about the fill paper survey and if my if viewers were inclined to express their views on this i think they would have done that in those other in response to those other videos like there'd be there'd be a bunch of comments where people were you know saying what their answers to the fill papers survey were but you didn't see that um and there were a couple of people who gave their answers to the fill papers survey but not many of them so i think most of the most of my viewers are not really inclined to do that so it would be kind of pointless um trying to set up a survey like this the wib what is your opinion on derek parfit's account of personal identity um i just i <laughs> uh i just don't think i can do this question um um i uh, i've spoken about my view of personal identity earlier in this um AMA. Um, I'm not really sure how it relates to Derek Parfit's view. Uh, the identity doesn't matter view. I mean, yeah, I'd like, yeah, maybe he's right. I, I don't know. I, uh, yeah, man, I, um, I feel like I, uh, I just, I can't, I just, I can't, can't, I just can't, I'm just, I've been talking about stuff for a while, and, um, you know, I can't think about personal identity, man, I am just, I have a pure, like, my take on personal identity is just, who cares what my take is, you're asking about Derek Parfit, uh, you know what, I'm just going to move on, I, uh, sorry, I think I'm just going to move on to the next question. I just can't think. I, I can't deal with personal identity. It's not. It's like, like I my my view of personal identity is like like purely sort of pragmatic, right? I just think we we just like draw whatever lines happen to be useful, you know. Um, I don't really think there's like a fact of the matter about what counts as identity over time. Um, I don't know how that really relates to Parfit's like identity doesn't because if Parfit says identity doesn't matter then maybe there is a fact because Parfit thinks there is a fact of the matter about identity like so fission cases destroy identity and that's a fact it doesn't he think that I don't know I'm too tired whereas I don't think there is a fact but maybe maybe identity doesn't matter either way I there comes a point I suppose where like my failure to give anything even approaching a good answer maybe um, becomes almost like a piece of performance art, like it's avant-garde art, right? Maybe I can get away with, I'm going to upload this, right? But perhaps instead of looking at this as a, you know, philosophical, I don't even know what the term would be, but, you know, a contribution to philosophy, let's say, we we should we should look at it 
in another way as a sort of Andy Kaufman-esque, you know, performance. Um, I'm uh, going to move on to the next question now. What is the best response to the companions in guilt argument? For example, is being a realist about mathematics and an anti-realist about ethics coherent? Or is it best to bite the bullet and commit oneself to an anti-realist position in every non-natural domain? If so, what are, the, what are the best arguments for anti-realism in those other domains? Well, best in what sense? I mean, best as in the correct response? Because the correct response, I suspect, um, is usually just to embrace anti-realism. But I don't see that as bullet biting. I mean, I mean, if you're talking about mathematics, right? Well, mathematic, mathematical anti-realism is not biting the bullet. Platonism has a host of serious problems. Similarly for epistemic norms. Um, as long as you have aims that agents have with respect to belief formation, and as long as you have non-normative evidential support relations, I think you can make sense of epistemic norms. You don't need categorical normativity in that domain. Um, so, you know, being an anti-realist in these other domains, I don't really see it as that much of a problem. <clears throat> At least, so yeah, if we're talking about like what the, so if we're talking about what the correct response is, I personally am inclined towards um, anti-realism. Uh, but then there's a question of like, what's the most rhetorically effective? And it may be that anti-realism in these other domains is not particularly rhetorically effective as a response to companions in guilt, because there are a lot of people who think, well, mathematical anti-realism, that would be crazy, or epistemic anti-realism, that would be crazy. So they would, be, they would think, well, you know, if, if moral anti-realists are committed to anti-realism in these other domains, then moral anti-realism is just hopeless, right? Like, clearly we can't have that. Um, so it may be that a more effective response is to focus on the differences between uh, the moral domain and these other domains. Um, and I think there are, I think there are plenty of, of relevant differences um, that like, even if you have um, non-natural facts and even if you have categorical normativity and all of this, even with all of that established, I think there are a host of problems that are specific to moral norms. Merely establishing, <clears throat> you know, non-naturalism in some sense, or you know, normativity, irreducible normativity. Getting all of that stuff, that's not going to get you moral norms. I think that there's a host of problems that are specific to morality that will allow us to um, support anti-realism there. Um, would you ever consider doing a video on quasi-realism? I already am writing a video on quasi-realism, but I can't make any promises about when that will be done. Thomas Windham, why is suicide worse than being alive? Why is staying alive ugh, preferable to be better than death? I've answered this question in response to other people, so for a more detailed response, look at the list and, you know, <laughs> it'll be there. Um, but yeah, I mean, so first of all, it's just like fear of non-existence. <coughs> I... <coughs> I am just afraid of non-existence. <clears throat> of course, I can't speak for other people. If other people aren't, aren't afraid of non-existence, then, you know, maybe maybe death is better for them or preferable for them. But for me, I'm terrified of non-existence. Also, I'm just driven to certain experiences. Like, there are certain things I want. <coughs> like, I want to, you know, read certain philosophy books. I can't do that if I'm dead. Now, on reflection, it may well be that I come to the conclusion that these experiences are not worth the trouble. Maybe they're not worth the negativity um, of the rest of life. But, you know, most of the time I'm not reflecting. Most of the time I'm just pursuing certain things that I want. Um, you also ask, uh, what do I slash you slash we mean by death from a first person perspective? Will I slash you slash we die forever? Well, it seems a reasonable assumption. I mean, there's no particular reason to believe otherwise, even if the matter of our bodies is reconstituted elsewhere, uh, would that really be me? Um, that requires controversial assumptions about what's required for like the continuity of consciousness and so on. Um, I just tend to proceed on the assumption that like when I'm dead, I'm dead, you know, and that's, that's it. Um, uh, how much more do we have here? Quite, quite a bit. Okay. Um, uh, so, um, Tikozo PVP, is the problem of universals a genuine problem with a definite answer? 
If no, why? If yes, what position do you lean towards? Well, I, I lean towards nominalism. Um, in fact, well, I am a nominalist. Um, but, I'm, you know, when, so with respect to this question about, like, is it a genuine problem? I mean, I usually sort of, when evaluating whether or not something is a genuine problem, I don't know. I mean, I just look to the arguments for and against different positions. And, um, I mean, I do find it hard to understand the motivation for postulating universals. And because I find it hard to understand the motivation, it makes me wonder, maybe it's not a genuine problem. Like the, if I can understand the motivation for postulating things, then I'm, I think I'm more inclined to view it as a genuine problem. When I'm not even able to understand, like, what the point is, that makes me think maybe this isn't really genuine. Like, maybe we don't really disagree substantively, but just like using terms in different ways. So in the case of universals, you have things like the one over many argument, right? So, okay, we have a bunch of different red things. And then the question is, the question that the realist will ask is like, in virtue of what are they all the same, right? In virtue of what are they all red? Um, what makes all the red things red? Well, the answer then is that they're red in virtue of instantiating the universal redness. Um, but like, why? Why? <laughs> What, wait a minute, that, that, it, like what? I mean, I just can't see the, I just can't see how that answers anything or like how you're getting from the premises to the conclusion. If you say that two things like X and Y are both red and then you ask, you know, what is it that makes X and Y red? Well, it's that X is red and Y is red. That's it, right? You, you do, that's all you need. Um, uh, in virtue of what are all red things red? Well, it's because, you know, this red thing is red, this red thing is red, this red thing is red, etc. Now, we can sort of take a sort of step back and take one of those red things and say, in virtue of what is this thing red? Um, and then there are things we can explain in this context. So, like, if I have a shirt and you ask, why is the shirt red? Then I can explain its redness by appealing to the surface properties of the shirt and the way light interacts with it and then the way the light interacts with the human visual system and all of this. Like we have a theory of colour vision and external properties and that explains our colour categorizations. Um, and, and, and then you can tell a similar story for other red things. So what, what more is required? Like that's, that seems like you've explained everything there is to explain uh, about I, I, I just I just don't know what what more is is even needed, and so I find it sort of hard to understand the motivation, and so maybe there really isn't a genuine problem, um, or maybe I'm just misunderstanding something. I mean that's that's also possible. Uh, Togan Noriak, I'm a student in philosophy. Do you have? Uh, <laughs> uh, do you, do you have any pieces of advice in order to find a job when I will have finished my studies? <laughs> Good luck with that one. Um, that's my advice. Um, welcome to the club. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I, not really. I think I'm probably not the right person to ask. Um, but, um, you know, I wouldn't get your hopes up. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's... Uh, I'm not the right person to ask about this. I mean, I, I don't know. You say you live in Switzerland. I don't know the situation in Switzerland, so I couldn't give advice. Tolga Ozkurt. Does philosophical thinking ever tire you? If so, how often? If so, how do you deal with it? Well, not really. I mean, I suppose like doing philosophy can be frustrating at times. It can be boring at times. I mean, um, <laughs> you know, I suppose this sort of thing, you know, I've been doing this for a while now. Um, maybe that's a bit tiring, um, but like I, I like philosophy. I mean, I just feel driven to do it. I just have a drive to do it. I don't really think about it much. I, I mean, I know like if I if I fail to do philosophy, if like I go a, a day and I just haven't read anything, I haven't written anything, then I feel bad about that. Like I feel bad if I don't do philosophy. Um, but doing philosophy in itself. Um, you know, it, it can it can be tiring, and but I just I don't, I don't know. I mean, I just want to do it. 
um, and that's it. Um, T T T T G. What other interests do you have second to philosophy? Any other fields you like? Hobbies? Well, I listen to music. Um, you know, I like I like art. Um, I I watch a bit of TV. I I'm I'm a big fan of Doctor Who. Um, you know, those are some other things I like. Um, yeah. <sighs> Unknown knowns philosophy. Do you think James Ladyman is a dork? What do you think about the fact that he has a mullet made of dreadlocks? And then there's a bunch of questions about Ladyman's dreadlocks. I don't have a problem with dreadlocks. Um, I used to have dreadlocks myself. Um, so I have no objections to dreadlocks. Certainly, I don't really care whether James Ladyman is a dork. I don't really have anything to. Uh, God, I'm so like. Uh, I think I'm coming to the end of this, and I'm quite glad that I'm coming to the end. This has been this has been a long one. I'm so tired. Um. Anyway. God damn. Yeah, I don't have a problem with dreadlocks. Right, Van Van Gogh. What books would you recommend for a beginner in philosophy? Simon Blackburn has a book called Think, which is, I believe, considered a pretty good introduction. So that might be worth picking up. Um, Vinsari. Is academic peer review a useful practice? Should it be open or double blind? Oh man, I don't know. Like it serves a purpose. Uh, it's kind of like well, we, we don't want to get rid of it entirely, right? Like it's probably good reasons to have it. Probably, um, you know, I think within philosophy, I am very much in favour of kind of expanding what counts as like legitimate publication. Um, I think philosophers should probably uh, do more to directly engage the public, and uh, they should probably be rewarded for that. You know. Um, like at the moment, the way that it works is that the only way really to advance one's career is is journal publication. So public work like this channel, for instance, is is completely useless. In fact, it's it's kind of worse than useless because any time that is spent uh, on this channel could be time that is spent uh, writing articles for journal publication, and that's what would actually help my career. Um, if I were to have a philosophical career. Uh, and that seems a bit weird, right? Like it's, it's, there's something perhaps kind of pathological about this because, you know, we need to engage the public in philosophy. We need that if the discipline is going to flourish. Um, so, you know, the, the only way the discipline will flourish is, is to encourage public engagement. Um, and yet the kind of work that actually promotes public engagement is just not rewarded at all. Um, at least not in terms of getting a career in the field. Um, you know, I, I think that philosophers probably made a mistake in what we did is sort of, we kind of modeled our, the, the institutional structure of our discipline on the sciences, you know, like, so in science, right, all that's relevant to one's career is, again, like publishing, it's expanding the frontiers of the discipline. Uh, but the thing is that in science, public engagement sort of comes for free, because science has a whole load of <laughs> really useful practical applications that make a visible impact in people's daily lives. So you kind of get the publication for free. You don't get that in philosophy. We need to actively engage in more of this kind of work. Um, so, you know, I think that there's a case to be made for like expanding what counts as legitimate publication. But I mean, like doing away with uh, peer review entirely, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, that doesn't seem well, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm not at the moment inclined to think that that would achieve much. Will Godfrey, how do your philosophical beliefs manifest in your political outlook? How does egoism play into electoral politics? I don't know. I've always been fairly anti-authoritarian, but that was the case before I started studying philosophy. Uh, <laughs> Um, for a while, when I was younger, like I was, so I was libertarian in this kind of U.S. sense, and like no 
sticky in US sense when I was younger. And I, re I ended up rejecting that for philosophical reasons. You know, I ended up having philosophical objections to the like account of property rights and so on. So I, I guess that's a way in which philosophy is manifested in my political outlook. As for egoism and electoral politics, um, I don't think that. <sighs> oh god. Um, I mean, it depends on the kind of egoism. You mean like Sternerite, Sternerite egoism? Um, I, I don't. You know, I mean, if if one is committed to that, I, I don't think this sort of Sternerite egoist would really have. Uh, any particular interest in electoral politics. Um, uh, yeah. Yuri Arin. Do you think meanings are transparent in the sense that when I say something of the type, this is so and so, the meaning of the expression is completely accessible to me by virtue, by mere virtue of uttering, thinking it. If not, how do you engage with the possibility of philosophical discussions being mere notational variants of what is to all effects the same body of belief? In other words, you disagree with the moral realists, but your habits and behaviour is not so different from them. How do you know that when you apparently disagree about the status of moral statements, you are really disagreeing and not just picking a different symbolic system to so to speak to say the same thing well that's a possibility um i mean yeah like so how do i engage with the possibility of this i recognize that it's a possibility um i think that you probably just have to take it on a case by case basis and you pick you know the most plausible interpretation um based on you know like the arguments and discussion that you have with people uh so in my recent discussion with Carnades, uh this topic did come up like hang on you know do we really disagree substantively here or are we simply using terms in different ways um you know i'm prepared to apply the term belief more broadly than he does to a sort of more broad um, range of, of representational states than he is um, and maybe that's all the disagreement really amounts to like maybe it is just terminological like i use a term belief for a broader set of states than he does that came up um, now the thing is that doesn't ever come up when i talk to moral realists i mean so maybe some moral realists, like there are some forms of moral naturalism where that does kind of come up. But then in the case of moral naturalism, it's like quite explicitly terminological, right? Like it's explicitly a semantic claim. Um, so, you know, um, yeah, so any, anyway, but the point is, is that when I engage in debates with moral realists, uh, you know, there never really is the sense that it's merely terminological. Uh, so I think that you just have to look at the other commitments people have, at the arguments people give. Uh, at the end of the day, I can't access what people mean. It's, you know, at least, well, it's a matter of interpretation, right? Like, it's a process of interpretation. I can't be sure what's going on inside other people's heads. Um, so, I mean, there isn't a general answer to this, uh, but it seems pretty plausible to me on the basis of the discussions I've had with moral realists that there really is something substantive there. They seem to have a different picture of the world. Um, and a different picture of like what they're kind of committed to in making moral statements, etc. Zach Dalman, what do you think of speculative realism? I don't know any. I don't know it. Uh, does the nominalism versus realism debate make sense? Sure. I mean, I, there seem to be a substantive difference. It seems like realists are postulating, you know, realists about abstract objects, for instance, are postulating a, a more re robust ontology. Um, I mean. You know, like generally, I think. Um, so, I, I mean, like, why, why wouldn't it make sense? I mean, like, maybe we endorse something like that kind of Carnapian internal versus external questions sort of thing. Um, but generally speaking, I have to say, I think that the, the, the discussion of like external questions always that always strikes me as being perfectly coherent. Um, there are certainly certain you know, there are some domains where, like, we can say, okay internal to the domain 
right? We can state various, we can make various assertions, but then, you know, we can say that actually the assertions we're making are just false. So if we're talking about like fiction, for instance, I can talk about what's the case um, in Lord of the Rings or something. Um, and, you know, I, I, and then I, I, I can like, you know, ask questions internal to the fiction, but then I can also say, well, you know, that's just a fiction. It's something we've made up, so it's false. Um, I think we can do the same in other domains like, you know, mathematics and morality and so on. You can sort of step back and evaluate these um, <coughs> these from the external perspective. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, of course, actually, I mean, Carnap didn't object to evaluating things from an external perspective. But what I want to say is that, no, I think there's a fact of the matter. Um, uh, does science describe reality? Well, you know, most theories do seem to be straightforward descriptions, at least in some respects. Um, so when scientists talk about like electrons and mitochondria and black holes, looks like they're just that those theories are just offered up as descriptions of the world. Um, now there are some limits to this. So first of all, there are idealizations, right? Science is littered with idealizations. Some of these are outright falsehoods. When like I say that, you know, if, if you model a star as being composed of an ideal gas, well, we know that there are not actually any ideal gases and we know that stars are not actually composed of an ideal gas. Okay, so in that case, well, the theory isn't, isn't a straightforward description. Um, at least it's not a description of the way the world is. It's not offered in that way. Um, also, if I think, if you think about claims like, you know, I don't know, the boiling point of water is 100 degrees. Well, that again is a useful idealization. Uh, the boiling point of water is dependent on environmental conditions, which cannot be fixed perfectly. Um, and we never have uh, a pure sample of water, you know, like any sample of water is always going to have some impurities. So, um, like if we, so all of that, all of that makes a difference to the boiling point. Now you can kind of fix the boiling point. You can say, well, the, mo the melting point of like a pure sample of water under a certain pressure in a certain container, etc., right, is such and such, but that's never actually been instantiated in the real world. So, um, in that sense, when we talk about like the boiling point of water, it's kind of, it's, there's a degree of idealization going on there. Um, similarly, like scientific laws are similarly um, kind of ceteris paribus. So a law will be, it will tell you what will happen, other things being equal. The law of universal gravitation says two objects attract each other with a force directly proportional to the mass to their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance. Now, as stated, that's false because there are many other forces. There are always going to be other forces. The like, So the true law, as it were, the completely true law would say, well, if there are no forces other than gravitation at work between the two objects, then such and such. Um, again, that's not actually applicable to any real objects because there are always other forces. So in these sorts of senses, you, you know, you, the, the, with the use of idealizations and the use of laws, you might say, well, they're not like straightforward descriptions. Um, and that's kind of contained within the, the theory itself, right? Like um, this isn't a matter of like giving a philosophical gloss on scientific theory. It's just that's that's kind of there in the theories themselves. So. Um, they're not, so yeah, I mean, maybe that's not a, a, a straightforward description. You know, we're not just saying like, this is how things in reality are. Scientific theories need to do, they're doing other things. Um, uh, so I don't know, maybe that's an answer to that question. I'm not really sure, uh, but that's what I'm saying. Okay, what kind of music do you like? Oh, well, I can listen to pretty much everything, but I really like, I like free jazz, um, you know, Derek Bailey, Evan Parker, Sun Ra, um, Albert Eiler, you know, uh, I like a lot of modern classical. I'm a really big fan of John Cage. Uh, Cage is, I suppose, my sort of number one favorite uh, artist in general. Um, so, you know, he's been a big influence 
influence on me. Um, but like, yeah, I mean, kind of experimental modern classical in general, you know, Stockhausen, Xenakis, James Tenney, Brian Ferniehow. Um, but I also like, I mean, so, you know, I like a lot of music that just sounds like, you know, noise. But then I also listen to a lot of you know, rock, 80s pop. I like 80s pop. Um, so I have pretty broad tastes, I think. Uh, you also ask string theory or standard model. Going to have to ask a physicist on that one. I have no idea. It's not my field. Um, Zin H0. Have you ever heard of Hayekian Socialism by Theodore Berksack? What do you think of market socialism? Oh, I don't know, man. Never heard of Hayekian socialism. And um, look, no, I, I, I'm, I don't know anything about economics. OK, so I can't talk about I just I don't know. I can't I can't evaluate market socialism. I, know, I, I just know nothing about economics. So that is the end of that.